Star Wars Republic Commando Book 2 Triple Zero By Karen Travis Republic Commando Covert Insertion on Fest, a Trivis Sector, Outer Rim, 10 months after Geonosis. Private Journal of RC8015 Phi You have to see the funny side of things in the Army. I think they have a real sense of humor in defense procurement, too. So, I ask, How long ago did you put in a request for black stealth armor? Seven standard months, says Darman, staring out the gunship's crew bay onto an unbroken plain of snow. White snow. The freezing wind is whipping flurries of it into the open bay. When we got back from Kalura, and now they issue it to us? To do a raid on Fest? The whole planet's covered in snow from pole to pole. I can hear the gunship pilot laughing over the comlink circuit. He can't resist it. Want to borrow my armor? It's nice and white. Yes, they've deployed us in black Katarn armor. It'll take a direct hit from laser cannon to put a dent in us but it would be nice to have the comfort of camouflage when we hit the ground. Even Auden's laughing. But Niner, who tries to take the place of Sergeant Cal and reassure us it's all going to be okay, is not. He's worried that we've run out of luck for this mission. And so am I. Republic commando losses in the first year of the war are running at 50%. Today we have to infiltrate a separatist factory developing some new super metal called Frick whatever that is and carry out a little asset denial, known in the trade as blowing stuff up. It's not a complicated mission, avoid droids, get in, lay charges in the processing plant and the foundry, avoid droids, get out, and then press the detonator. One of Captain Ordo's no arc trooper brothers found this place, clone intelligence units, they call them. I must write to thank the D-cut sometime. So I try to keep the squad laughing, because it takes our minds off calculating the odds. Okay, I say. What do we all want most right now? Roba steak, says the pilot. White-clad camo, says Niner. A really thick slice of UJ cake, says Otten. Darman pauses for a moment. To see an old friend again. Me? I'd like to go back to Arca Company barracks on Coruscant. I want to see Coruscant before I die, and so far I've seen next to nothing of the place. Someone promised to buy me a beer there once. The pilot is skimming a couple of meters above the snow, taking us through a narrow pass to avoid detection. It's all mountains and ravines now. And snow. I've got visual on the factory, the pilot says. And you're not going to like it. Why? Niner asks. Because there are an awful lot of battle droids out there. Are they made of frick? I don't think so. No problem then, says Niner. Let's spoil their entire day. The gunship slows enough for us to jump clear, and we scramble through knee-deep snow to take up a position in the lee of an outcrop. There's nothing like a quick hello from a Plex rocket launcher to show droids who's boss. No, they're definitely not made from Frick. I reload the Plex and keep turning the droids into shrapnel while Darman and Aden make their way to higher ground to reach the factory. Yeah, a nice beer on Coruscant, on triple zero. Dreams like that keep you going. 1. Find Skirata. He's the only one who can talk these men down. And no, I'm not going to obliterate a whole barracks block just to neutralize six arcs. So get me Skirata. He can't have traveled very far. General I.R.I. Camus. Director of Special Forces To Coruscan Security Force From Siege Incident Control, Special Operations Brigade HQ Barracks, Coruscant, 
Five days after the Battle of Geonosis Topoca City, Kamino, eight years before Geonosis Kalskarata had committed the biggest mistake of his life, and he made some pretty big ones in his time. Kamino was damp. And damp didn't help his shattered ankle one little bit. No, it was more than damp. It was nothing but storm whip sea from pole to pole, and he wished that he'd worked that out before he responded to Django Fate's offer of a lucrative long-term deployment in a location that his old comrade hadn't exactly specified. But that was the least of his worries now. The air smelled more like a hospital than a military base. The place didn't look like barracks, either. Skirata leaned on the polished rail that was all that separated him from a 40-meter fall into a chamber large enough to swallow a battle cruiser and lose it. Above him, the vaulted illuminated ceiling stretched as far as the abyss did below. The prospect of the fall didn't worry him half as much as not understanding what he was now seeing. The cavern surgically clean, polished durasteel and permaglass was filled with structures that seemed almost like fractals. At first glance they looked like giant torads stacked on pillars. Then, as he stared, the torads resolved into smaller rings of permaglass containers, with containers within them, and inside those. No, this wasn't happening. Inside the transparent tubes there was fluid, and within it there was movement. It took him several minutes of staring and refocusing on one of the tubes to realize there was a body in there, and it was alive. In fact, there was a body in every tube, row upon row of tiny bodies, children's bodies. Babies. Fear effect, he said aloud. He thought he'd come to this force-forsaken hole to train commandos. Now he knew he'd stepped into a nightmare. He heard boots behind him on the walkway of the gantry, and turned sharply to see Django coming slowly toward him, chin lowered as if in reproach. If you're thinking of leaving, Cal, you knew the deal, said Django, and leaned on the rail beside him. You said Dash. I said you'd be training special forces troops, and you will be. They just happen to be growing them. What? Clones. How the fear effect did you ever get involved with that? A straight five million and a few extras for donating my genes. And don't look shocked. You'd have done the same. The pieces fell into place for Skarada and he let himself be shocked anyway. War was one thing. Weird science was another issue entirely. Well, I'm keeping my end of the deal? Skirata adjusted the 15-centimeter, three-sided blade that he always kept sheathed in his jacket sleeve. Two Kaminoan technicians walked serenely across the floor of the facility beneath him. Nobody had searched him and he felt better for having a few weapons located for easy use, including the small holdout blaster tucked in the cuff of his boot. And all those little kids in tanks. The Kaminoans disappeared from sight. What do those things want with an army anyway? They don't. And you don't need to know all this right now. Django beckoned him to follow. Besides, you're already dead, remember? Feels like it, said Skirata. He was the QE Valdar literally. Those who no longer exist. A hundred expert soldiers with a dozen specialties who'd answered Django's secret summons in exchange for a lot of credits as long as they were prepared to disappear from the galaxy completely. He trailed Django down corridors of unbroken white duraplast, passing the occasional Kaminoan with its long gray neck and snake-like head. He'd been here for four standard days now, staring out the window of his quarters onto the endless ocean and catching an occasional glimpse of the eye was soaring up out of the waves and flapping into the air. The thunder was totally silenced by the soundproofing, but the lightning had become an annoyingly irregular pulse in the corner of his eye. Skirata knew from day one that he wouldn't like Kaminoans. Their cold yellow eyes troubled him, and he didn't care for their arrogance, either. They stared at his limping gait and asked if he minded being defective. 
The window-lined corridor seemed to run the length of the city. Outside, it was hard to see where the horizon ended and the rain clouds began. Django looked back to see if he was keeping up. Don't worry, Cal. I'm told it's clear weather in the summer for a few days. Right. The dreariest planet in the galaxy, and he was stuck on it. And his ankle was playing up. He really should have invested in getting it fixed surgically. When if he got out of here, he'd have the assets to get the best surgeon that credits could buy. Django slowed down tactfully. So, Elippi threw you out? Yeah. His wife wasn't Mandalorian. He'd hoped she would embrace the culture, but she didn't. She always hated seeing her old man go off to someone else's war. The fights began when he wanted to take their two sons into battle with him. They were eight years old, old enough to start learning their trade, but she refused, and soon the Lippy and the boys and his daughter were no longer waiting when he returned from the latest war. The Lippy divorced him the Mando way, same as they'd married, on a brief, solemn, private vow. A contract was a contract, written or not. Just as well I've got another assignment to occupy me. You should have married a Mando girl. Aruitais don't understand a mercenary's life. Django paused as if waiting for argument, but Cal wasn't giving him one. Don't your sons talk to you any longer? Not often. So I failed as a father. Don't rub it in. Obviously they don't share the Mando outlook on life any more than their mother does. Well, they won't be speaking to you at all now. Not here. Ever. Nobody seemed to care if he had disappeared anyway. Yes, he was as good as dead. Django said nothing more, and they walked in silence until they reached a large circular lobby with rooms leading off it like the spokes of a wheel. Kosai said something wasn't quite right with the first test batch of clones, said Django ushering Skarada ahead of him into another room. They've tested them and they don't think these are going to make the grade. I told Orinwa that we'd give him the benefit of our military experience and take a look. Skarada was used to evaluating fighting men and women, come to that. He knew what it took to make a soldier. He was good at it. Soldiering was his life, as it was for all Mando, Ade, all sons and daughters of Mandalore. At least there'd be some familiarity to cling to in this ocean wilderness. It was just a matter of staying as far from the Kaminoans as he could. Gentlemen, said Orinwa in his soothing monotone. He welcomed them into his office with a graceful tilt of the head, and Skirata noted that he had a prominent bony fin running across the top of his skull from front to back. Maybe that meant Orinwa was older or dominant, or something. He didn't look like the other examples of Iowa bait that Skirata had seen so far. I always believe in being honest about setbacks in a program. We value the Jedi Council as a customer. I have nothing to do with the Jedi, said Django. I'm only a consultant on military matters. Oh, Skirata thought. Jedi. Great. I would still be happier if you confirm that the first batch of units is below the acceptable standard. Bring them in, then. Skirata shoved his hands in his jacket pockets and wondered what he was going to see. Poor marksmanship, poor endurance, lack of aggression. Not if these were Django's clones. He was curious to see how the Kaminoans could have fouled up producing fighting men based on that template. The storm raged against the transparent steel window, rain pounding in surges and then easing again. Orin was stood back with a graceful sweep of his arms like a dancer. And the doors opened. Six identical little boys four, maybe five years old walked into the room. Skirata was not a man who easily fell prey to sentimentality. But this did the job just fine. They were children. Not soldiers, not droids, and not units. Just little kids. 
They had curly black hair and were all dressed in identical dark blue tunics and pants. He was expecting grown men. And that would have been bad enough. He heard Django inhale sharply. The boys huddled together, and it ripped at Scarada's heart in a way he wasn't expecting. Two of the kids clutched each other, looking up at him with huge, dark, unblinking eyes. Another moved slowly to the front of the tight pack as if barring Oren Wa's path and shielding the others. Oh, he was. He was defending his brothers. Scarada was devastated. These units are defective, and I admit that we perhaps made an error in attempting to enhance the genetic template, Oren Wa said, utterly unmoved by their vulnerability. Skirata had worked out fast that Kaminoans despised everything that didn't fit their intolerant, arrogant society's ideal of perfection. So, they thought Django's genome wasn't the perfect model for a soldier without a little adjustment then. Maybe it was his solitary nature, he'd make a rotten infantry soldier. Django wasn't a team player. And maybe they didn't know that it was often imperfection that gave humans an edge. The kid's gaze darted between Skirata and Django, and the doorway, and all around the room, as if they were checking for an escape or appealing for help. Chief Scientist Ko Sai apologizes, as do I, said Oren Wa. Six units did not survive incubation, but these developed normally and appeared to meet specifications, so they have undergone some flash instruction and trials. Unfortunately, psychological testing indicates that they are simply too unreliable and fail to meet the personality profile required. Which is, said Django, that they can carry out orders. Oren Wa blinked rapidly. He seemed embarrassed by error. I can assure you that we will address these problems in the current alpha production run. These units will be reconditioned, of course. Is there anything you wish to ask? What the? Said. What do you mean by reconditioned? In this case, terminated. There was a long silence in the bland, peaceful, white-walled room. Evil was supposed to be black, jet black and it wasn't supposed to be soft-spoken. Then Skirata registered terminated and his instinct reacted before his brain. His clenched fist was pressed against Oren Wa's chest in a second and the vile, unfeeling thing jerked his head backward. You touch one of those kids, you gray freak, and I'll skin you alive and feed you to the Iwas Dash. Steady, Django said. He grabbed Skirata's arm. Oren Wa stood blinking at Skirata with those awful reptilian yellow eyes. This is uncalled for. We care only about our customers. Satisfaction. Skirata could hear his pulse pounding in his head and all he could care about was ripping Oren Wa apart. Killing someone in combat was one thing, but there was no honor in destroying unarmed kids. He yanked his arm out of Django's grip and stepped back in front of the children. They were utterly silent. He dared not look at them. He fixed on Oren Wa. Django gripped his shoulder and squeezed hard enough to hurt. Don't. Leave this to me. It was his warning gesture. But Skirata was too angry and disgusted to fear Django's wrath. We could do with a few wild cards, Django said carefully, moving between Skirata and the Kaminoan. It's good to have some surprises up your sleeve for the enemy. What are these kids really like? And how old are they? Nearly two standard years growth. Highly intelligent, deviant, disturbed and uncommandable. Could be ideal for intel work. It was pure bluff. Skirata could see the little twitch of muscle in Django's jaw. He was shocked, too. The bounty hunter couldn't hide that from his old associate. I say we keep. M? Two? The boys looked older. 
Skirata half turned to check on them, and their gazes were locked on him. It was almost an accusation. He glanced away, but took a step backward and put his hand discreetly behind him to place his palm on the head of the boy defending his brothers, just as a helpless gesture of comfort. But a small hand closed tightly around his fingers instead. Skirata swallowed hard. Two years old. I can train them, he said. What are their names? These units are numbered. And I must emphasize that they're unresponsive to command. Orin Wa persisted as if talking to a particularly stupid weak way. Our quality control designated them null class and wishes to start dash. No? As in no decutly use? Django took a discreet but audible breath. Leave this to me, Cal. No, they're not units. The little hand was grasping his for dear life. He reached back with his other hand and another boy pressed up against his leg, clinging to him. It was pitiful. And I can train them. Unwise, said Orinwa. The Kaminoan took a gliding step forward. They were such graceful creatures, but they were loathsome at a level that Skirata could simply not comprehend. And then the little lad grasping his leg suddenly snatched the holdout blaster from Skirata's boot. Before he could react the kid had tossed it to the one who'd been clinging to his hand in apparent terror. The boy caught it cleanly and aimed it two-handed at Orin Wa's chest. Fearfeck. Django sighed. Put it down, kid! But the lad wasn't about to stand down. He stood right in front of Skirata. Utterly calm, blaster raised at the perfect angle, fingers placed just so with the left hand steadying the right, totally focused. And deadly serious. Skirata felt his jaw drop a good centimeter. Django froze, then chuckled. I reckon that proves my point, he said, but he still had his eyes fixed on the tiny assassin. The kid clicked the safety catch. He seemed to be checking it was off. It's okay, son, Skirata said, as gently as he could. He didn't much care if the boy fried the Kaminoan, but he cared about the consequences for the kid. And he was instantly and totally proud of him of all of them. You don't need to shoot. I'm not going to let him touch any of you. Just give me back the blaster. The child didn't budge. The blaster didn't waver. He should have been more concerned about cuddly toys than a clean shot at this stage in his young life. Skirata squatted down slowly behind him, trying not to spook him into firing. But if the boy had his back to him, then he trusted him, didn't he? Come on. Just put it down, there's a good lad. Now give me the blaster. He kept his voice as soft and level as he could, when he was actually torn between cheering and doing the job himself. You're safe, I promise you. The boy paused, eyes and aim still both fixed on Orinwa. Yes, sir. Then he lowered the weapon to his side. Skirata put his hand on the boy's shoulder and pulled him back carefully. Good lad. Skirata took the blaster from his little fingers and scooped him up in his arms. He dropped his voice to a whisper. Nicely done, too. The Kaminoan showed no anger whatsoever, simply blinking, yellow, detached disappointment. If that does not demonstrate their instability, then dash. They're coming with me. This is not your decision. No, it's mine, Django interrupted and they've got the right stuff. Cal, get them out of here and I'll settle this with Orinwa. Skirata limped toward the door, still making sure he was between the Kaminoan and the kids. He was halfway down the corridor with his bizarre escort of tiny deviants before the boy he was carrying riddled uncomfortably in his arms. I can walk, sir, he said. He was perfectly articulate, fluent a little soldier way beyond his years. Okay, son. Skirata lowered him to the floor 
and the kids fell in behind him, oddly quiet and disciplined. They didn't strike him as dangerous or deviant, unless you counted stealing a weapon, pulling a feint, and almost shooting a Kaminoan as deviant. Skarada didn't. The kids were just trying to survive, like any soldier had a duty to do. And they looked four or five years old, but Orinwa had definitely said they were two. Skirada suddenly wanted to ask them how long they'd spent in those awful suffocating transparisteel vats, cold hard tanks that were nothing like the dark comfort of a womb. It must have been like drowning. Could they see each other as they floated? Had they understood what was happening to them? Skirada reached the doors of his stark quarters and ushered them in, trying not to dwell on those thoughts. The boys lined up against the wall automatically hands clasped behind their backs, and waited without being told to. I brought up two sons. How hard can it be to mine six kids for a few days? Skirata waited for them to react but they simply stared back at him as if expecting orders. He had none. Rain lashed the window that ran the whole width of the wall. Lightning flared. They all flinched but they still stood in silence. Tell you what, Skarada said, bewildered. He pointed to the couch. You sit down over there and I'll get you something to eat. Okay? They paused and then scrambled onto the couch, huddling together again. He found them so utterly disarming that he had to make a rapid exit to the kitchen area to gather his thoughts while he slapped UJ cake onto a plate and sliced it roughly into six pieces. If this was how it was going to be for four years. You're stuck, chum. You took the credits. And this is your whole world for the foreseeable future. And maybe forever. It never stopped raining. And he was holed up with a species he loathed on sight, and who thought it was okay to dispose of units who happened to be living, talking, walking children. He raked his fingers through his hair and despaired, eyes closed, until he was suddenly aware of someone staring up at him. Sir? The boy said. It was the courageous little marksman. He might have been identical to his brothers, but his mannerisms were distinctive. He had a habit of bawling one fist at his side while the other hand was relaxed. May we use the freshers? Skirata squatted down, face level with the kids. Course you can. It was quite pathetic. They were nothing like his own lively, boisterous sons had once been. And I'm not, sir. I'm not an officer. I'm a sergeant. You can call me sergeant if you like, or you can call me Cal. Everyone else does. Yes. Cal. It's over there. Can you manage on your own? Yes, Cal. I know you don't have a name, but I really think you should have one. I'm Null Eleven. And One One. How'd you like to be called Ordo? He was a Mandalorian warrior. Are we Mandalorian warriors? You bet. The kid was a natural fighter. In every sense of the word. I like that name. Little Ordo considered the white-tiled floor for a moment, as if assessing it for risk. What's Mandalorian? For some reason that hurt most of all. If these kids didn't know their culture and what made someone a Mando, then they had no purpose, no pride, and nothing to hold them and their clan together when home wasn't a piece of land. If you were a nomad, your nation traveled in your heart. And without the Mando heart, you had nothing not even your soul in whatever new conquest followed death. Skirata knew at that moment what he had to do. He had to stop these boys from being Darmanda, eternal dead men, men without a Mando soul. I can see I need to teach you a lot. Yes, this was his duty. I'm Mandalorian too. We're soldiers, nomads. You know what those words mean. Yes. Clever lad. 
Okay, you go and sort yourselves out in the freshers, and I want you all sitting back on the couch in ten minutes. Then we'll sort out names for everyone. Got it? Yes, Cal. So Cal Scarada mercenary. Assassin and failed father spent a stormy evening on Kamino sharing UJ cake with six dangerously clever small boys who could already handle firearms and talk like adults, teaching them that they came from a warrior tradition, and that they had a language and a culture, and much to be proud of. And he explained that there was no Mandalorian word for hero. It was only not being one that had its own word, Hutian. There were an awful lot of Hutian in the galaxy and Skirata certainly counted the Kaminoans among them. The kids now trying to get used to being Ordo, Aiden, Kamarke, Prudiai, Muriel, and Jane sat devouring both their newfound heritage and the sticky sweet cake, eyes fixed on Skirata as he recited lists of Mandalorian words and they repeated them back to him. He worked through the most common words, struggling. He had no idea how to teach a language to kids who could already speak fluent basic. So he simply listed everything he could recall that seemed useful, and the little null arcs listened, grim-faced, flinching in unison at every blaze of lightning. After an hour Skirata felt that he was simply confusing some very frightened, very lonely children. They just stared at him. Okay, time to recap, he said, exhausted by a bad day and the realization that there was an unknowable number of days like this stretching ahead. He pinched the bridge of his nose underscore in an effort to focus. Can you count from one to ten for me? Pretty I and five parted his lips to take a quick breath and suddenly all six spoke at once. Solus, Tad, N, Queer, Reshe, Resol, Etad, SHN, Shisiu, Taresh. Skirata's gut flipped briefly and he sat stunned. These kids. Absorbed information like a sponge. I only counted out the numbers for them once. Just once. Their recall was perfect and absolute. He decided to be careful what he said to them in the future. Now that's clever, he said. You're very special lads, aren't you? Oren Was said we couldn't be measured, Mariel said, totally without pride, and perched on the edge of the couch, swinging his legs almost like a normal four-year-old. They might have all looked identical, but their individual characters seemed distinct and Skirata wasn't sure how he managed it, but he could now look at them and see that they were different, distinguished by small variations in facial expressions, gestures, frowns, and even tone of voice. Appearance wasn't everything. You mean you scored too high for him to count? Mariel nodded gravely. Thunder slapped the platform city. Skirata felt it without hearing it. Mariel drew up his legs again and huddled tight up against his brothers in an instant. No, Skirata didn't need a Hatyunla Kaminoan to tell him that these were extraordinary children. They could already handle a blaster learn everything he threw at them, and understand the Kaminoans' intentions all too well. No wonder the Iwa bait was scared of them. And they would be truly phenomenal soldiers if only they could follow a few orders. He'd work on that. Want some more UJ? He said. They all nodded enthusiastically in unison. It was a relief. At least that gave him a few minutes respite from their unrelenting silent attention. They ate, still miniature adults. There was no chattering or high spirits. And they flinched at every bolt of lightning. Are you scared? asked Skirata. Yes, Cal, said Ordo. Is that wrong? No, son. Not at all. It was as good a time to teach them as any. No lesson would ever be wasted on them. Being afraid is okay. It's your body's way of getting you ready to defend yourself, 
and all you have to do is use it and not let it use you. Do you understand that? No, Ordo said. Okay, think about being scared. What's it like? Ordo defocused slightly as if he were looking at something on a HUD. He didn't have. Cold. Cold? Aiden and Kamake chimed in. And Spiky. Okay. Okay. Skirata tried to imagine what they meant. Ah. Uh, they were describing the feeling of adrenaline flooding their bodies. That's fine. You just have to remember that it's your alarm system, and you need to take notice of it. They were the same age as city kids on Coruscant who struggled to scrawl crude letters on Flimsi. And here he was, teaching them battle psychology. His mouth felt oddly dry. So you tell yourself, okay, I can handle this. My body's now ready to run faster and fight harder, and I'll be seeing and hearing only the most important things I need to know to stay alive. Ordo went from his wide-eyed dark stare to slight defocus again for a moment and nodded. Skirata glanced at the others. They had that same disturbing concentration. They had also stacked their plates neatly on the low side table. He hadn't even noticed them doing it. Try thinking about your fear next time there's lightning, Cal said. Use it. He went back to the kitchen area and rummaged through the cupboards for some other snack to keep them going, because they seemed ravenous. As he stepped back into the main room with a white tray of sliced food board that looked even less appetizing than the tray itself, someone buzzed at the door. The nulls immediately went into a defensive pattern. Ordo and Jane flanked the door, backs hard against the wall, and the other four took cover behind the sparse furniture. Skirata wondered for a second what flash learning program had taught them that or at least he hoped it was flash taught. He waved them away from the door. They hesitated for a moment until he took out his verpine shatter gun. Then they appeared satisfied that he had the situation under some sort of control. You scare me, Skirata said softly. Now stand back. If anyone's after you, they've got to come through me first and I'm not about to let that happen. Even so, their reaction prompted him to stand to one side as he hit the panel to open the doors. Django Fed was standing in the corridor outside, a small sleepy child in his arms. The boy's curly head rested on his shoulder. He looked younger than the Nels, but it was the same face, the same hair, the same little hand clutching the fabric of Django's tunic. Another one? Skarada said. Django glanced at the verp. You're getting edgy, aren't you? Kaminoans don't improve my mood. Want me to take him? He shoved the shatter gun in his belt and held out his arms to take the boy. Django frowned slightly. This is my son, Boba, he said. He pulled his head back to gaze fondly at the dozing child's face. This wasn't the Django that Skarata knew of old. He was pure paternal indulgence now. Just trying to settle him down. Are you sorted now? I've told Orinwa to stay away from you. We're fine, Skarata said. He wondered how he was going to ask the question, and decided blurting it out was probably as good a way as any. Boba looks just like them. He would. He's been cloned from me, too. Oh. Oh. He was my price. Worth more to me than the credits. Boba stirred, and Django carefully adjusted his hold on the kid. I'll be back in a month. Oren says he'll have some commando candidates ready for us to take a look at as well as the rest of the Alpha Batch. But he says he's made them a bit more. Reliable. Skarata had more questions than seemed prudent under the circumstances. It was natural for a Mando ad to want an heir above all else, and adoption was common, so cloning was. 
not that much different. But he had to ask one thing. Why do these kids look older? Django compressed his lips into a thin line of disapproval. They accelerate the aging process. Oh, Fearfeck. You'll have a company of 104 commandos eventually, and they should be less trouble than the nulls. Fine. Did he get help? Were there Kaminoan minders to tackle the routine jobs, like feeding them? And how would the non-Mandalorian training sergeants deal with them? His stomach churned. He put on a brave face. I can handle that. Yeah, and I'll be doing my bit too. I have to train a hundred. Django glanced at the nulls, now watching warily from the couch, and began walking away. I just hope they aren't like I was at that age. Skirata pushed the controls, and the door sighed shut. Okay, lads, bedtime, he said. He dragged the cushions off the couch and laid them out on the floor, covering them with an assortment of blankets. The boys gave him a hand, with a grim sense of adult purpose that he knew would haunt him for the rest of his days. We'll get you sorted out with decent quarters tomorrow, okay? Rio beds. He had the feeling they would have slept outside on the rain lash landing pad if he'd asked them to. They didn't seem at all unmanageable. He sat down in the chair and put his feet up on a stool. The Kaminoans had done their best to provide human-suitable furniture, something that struck him as a rare concession given their general xenophobic arrogance. He left the lights on, dimmed, to soothe the Null's fears. They settled down, pulling the blankets over their heads completely. Skirata watched until they appeared to be asleep, laid his verpine on the shelf beside the chair, and then closed his eyes to let the dreams overwhelm him. He woke with an explosive jerk of muscles a couple of times, a sure sign that he was past the point of tiredness and into exhaustion, and then he fell into an unending black well. He slept, or so he thought. A warm weight pressed against him. His eyes jerked open and he remembered he was stranded on a perpetually overcast planet that didn't even seem to be on the star charts where the local species thought killing human kids was merely quality control. Ordo's stricken little face looked up into his. Kel. You scared, son? Yes. Come on, then. Skirata shifted position and Ordo scrambled up onto his lap, burying his face in his tunic as if he had never been held or comforted before. He hadn't, of course. The storm was getting worse. The lightning can't hurt you here. I know, Cal. Ordo's voice was muffled. He wouldn't look up. But it's just like the bombs going off. Skirata was going to ask him what he meant, but he knew in an instant that it would make him angry enough to do something stupid if he heard the answer. He hugged Ordo to him and felt the boy's heart pounding in terror. Ordo was doing pretty well for a four-year-old soldier. They could learn to be heroes tomorrow. Tonight they needed to be children, reassured that the storm was not a battlefield, and so was nothing to fear. The lightning illuminated the room in brief, fierce white light. Ordo flinched again. Skirata laid his hand on the boy's head and ruffled his hair. It's okay, Ordike, he said softly. I'm here, son. I'm here. Eight years later, Special Forces So Brigade HQ Barracks, Coruscant, five days after the Battle of Geonosis Skirata had been detained by Coruscant Security Force officers and for once in his life he hadn't put up a fight. Technically, he'd been arrested. And now he was the most relieved man in the galaxy, as well as the happiest. He jumped out of the police patrol speeder and winced at the sharp pain in his ankle as he hit the ground. He'd get that sorted out sooner or later, but now wasn't the time. Wow, take a look at that, the pilot said. They're holding off special ops squads there. You sure there's only six of them? 
Yes, yeah, six is overkill, Skirata said, discreetly patting his pockets and sleeves to make sure the assorted tools of his trade were in place and ready for use. It was just habit. But they're probably scared. They're scared? The pilot snorted. Hey, you know Fett's dead? Winda topped him. I know, Skirata said, fighting the urge to ask if he also knew what had happened to little Boba. If the kid was still alive, he needed a dad. Let's hope the Jedi don't have a problem with all of us Mando. Ade. The pilot closed the hatch, and Skirata limped across the barracks landing pad. Jedi General I.R.I. Camus, hands on hips with his brown robes flapping in the breeze, watched in a way that Skirata could only describe as suspicious. Two clone troopers waited with him. Skirata thought the Jedi should get his long white hair cut. It wasn't practical or becoming for a soldier to wear his hair to his shoulders. Thank you for responding, Sergeant, Camus said. And I apologize for the manner of your return. I realize your contract is completed now, so you owe us nothing. Any time, Skirata said. He noted the blast-proof assault shields erected across the main entrance. Four squads of Republic commandos stood behind them, DC-17. Rifles ready. He glanced up at the roof, and there were two commando sniper teams spread out along the parapet as well. Yes, if a bunch of no-class advance recon commandos didn't want to cooperate, then it would take a lot of equally hard men to persuade them otherwise. And he knew that none of the commandos would be happy about being ordered in to do the persuading. They were brothers, even if the Arcs were rather different men at heart. Skirata shoved his hands in his jacket pockets and focused on the doors. So what started all this, then? Camus shook his head. They're scheduled to be chilled down now that they're back from Geonosis, because nobody can command them. I can. I know. Please get them to stand down. They're even more of a handful than the regular Alpha Batch arcs, aren't they? I know that, Sergeant. So you wanted the hardest troops you could buy to take on the enemy, and then you got cold feet when they turned out to be too hard. Sergeant Dash. I'm a civilian at the moment, actually. Camus took a silent breath. Can you get them to surrender? They've shut down the whole barracks. I can. Skirata wondered if the clone troopers were looking sideways at him, or in the direction they appeared to be facing. You can never tell with their helmets on. But I won't. I really don't want any casualties. Are you holding out for an increased fee? Skirata was a mercenary, but the suggestion insulted him. Camus couldn't be expected to know how he felt about his men, though. He made an effort not to be annoyed. Enlist me in the Grand Army of the Republic and give me back my lads. Then we'll see. What? They're terrified of chill down, that's all. You have to understand what happened to them as kids. Camus gave him an odd look. And don't even think about mind influence, General. Skirata didn't give a Mott's backside about pay. Eight years spent on Kamino training special forces for the Republic's clone army had made him wealthy, and if they wanted to press more credits on him, that was fine. He'd have a good use for them. But what he wanted most right then, and what had made him happy to return with the CSF officers instead of showing them just how handy he was with a fighting knife, was not being safe in a soft civilian life when his men were fighting a desperate, bloody war. And he needed to be back with them. He hadn't even had the chance to say goodbye when they suddenly shipped out to Geonosis. He'd lasted five miserable days without them, days without purpose, days without family. Very well, Camus said. Special advisor status. I can authorize that, I suppose. Skirata couldn't see the commandos' faces behind their visors, but he knew they'd be watching him carefully.
He recognized some of the paint schemes on their Katarn armor, Jez from Iowa 3 Squad, and Stoker from Gamma, and Ram from Bravo up on the roof. Incomplete squads, high casualties on Geonosis, then. His heart sank. He began walking forward. He got to the blaster shields, and Jez touched his glove to his helmet. Nice to see you back so soon, Sarge. Couldn't stay away, Skarada said. You okay? It's a laugh a minute, this job. Camus called out. Sergeant? Sergeant. What if they open fire, Dash? Then they open fire. Skirata reached the doors and turned his back on them for a few moments, unafraid. Do we have a deal? Or do you want me hold up in there with them? Because I won't be coming out unless you guarantee them no disciplinary action. It struck Skirata that Camus might be the one to fire on him right then. He wondered if his commandos would obey that order if it were given. He wouldn't have minded if they had. He taught them to do their job, regardless of their own feelings. You have my word, Camus said. Consider yourself in the Grand Army. We'll discuss how we're going to deploy you and your men later. But first let's get everyone back to normal, shall we, please? I'll hold you to every last word, General. He waited at the doors for a few moments. The two sheets of reinforced durasteel parted slowly. He walked in, relieved, and home again at last. No, Camus really needed to understand what had happened to these men as young boys. He had to, if he was going to cope with the war that had now been unleashed. It wouldn't just be fought on someone else's planet. It would be fought in every corner of the galaxy, in every city, in every home. It was a war not just of territories, but of ideologies. And it was wholly outside Skirata's Mandalorian philosophy, but it was his war regardless, because his men were its instrument whether they liked it or not. One day, he would give them back something the Kaminoans and the Republic had stolen from them. He swore it. Ordai K.A. He called. Ordo? You've been a naughty boy again, haven't you? Come here. Two. Yes, I know I should be directing the battle from the ship. Yes, I know we could reduce the surface of Dinlo to molten slag from orbit. But we can extract more than a thousand men, and that's worth doing. I asked for volunteers and I got the whole ship's crew and every man in Improco Company, and not from blind obedience. Let me try. General Termukin, in a signal to General IRI Camus, Battle Group Command, Coruscant, copy to General Vaz G. A., Commanding Officer, Sarlacc Battalions. 41st Elite Infantry, Dinlo. Republic Assault Ship Fearless, approaching Dinlo, Expansion Bothan Border, 367 days after Geonosis. General Atain Termukin watched the H&E news feed with mixed feelings. On one hand the events at home saddened her, on the other, they reminded her what the war was about. Fifteen soldiers and twelve civilian support staff are reported dead after today's second bomb blast. This time at a GR logistics base no group has yet claimed responsibility for the attack, but a security forces spokesman said today that the proximity to tomorrow's first anniversary of the Battle of Geonosis was significant. It brings the total number of deaths in apparent separatist terror attacks this year to 3,040. The Senate has pledged to smash their networks. Clone Commander gets stood at her side, hands clasped behind his back as they waited on the repulsor platform that shunted ammo boxes from the magazine to the hangar deck. No way to die, he said. Attain turned to look at the troops around them. Neither is this. They were set to go. Fearless was half an hour out from Dinlo and the gunship pilots were making their way down the passage from the flight briefing to carry out their pre-sortie checks, yellow-trimmed helmets tucked under one arm. 
They all held the helmets exactly the same way, no doubt the result of thorough drill. General Atain Termukin noted that. She stood back from the hatch to let them through and got a salute from each as he passed. One glanced at the somewhat unconventional weapon slung across her shoulder and grinned. He indicated the huge LJ-50. Concussion rifle that almost dwarfed her. Does that thing light up blue, General? Only if you're on the receiving end, trooper, she said, and gave him her most reassuring smile. She knew they were afraid, because a commando called Darman had taught her that only idiots didn't fear combat. Fear was an asset, an incentive, a tool. She knew how to use it now, even if she didn't embrace it. Today, she needed to tell Impraco Company that. They knew it already, but this was her first mission with them, and she had learned that a little openness with the troops went a long way. And she wanted them to know that she saw them for the human beings they were. Meeting Republic commandos on Kalura for the first time had been a painful revelation for her. Are you okay with that, General? Get seemed to be able to guess what she was thinking almost all the time, and she wondered briefly if telepathy was in their genetic mix. Then she reminded herself that men who all looked the same learned to be very, very sensitive to tiny behavioral cues. We've got a DC-15 if you prefer. Nice piece of kit. The LJ-50 was exhaustingly heavy. She'd developed her arm muscles in the last year, but it still took some handling. Some very competent gentlemen taught me to use a CONC rifle, she said. They persuaded me to keep my lightsaber for close combat. Besides, the LJs got a 4-meter spread at a 30-meter range. I'm a great believer in efficiency over style. Get smiled. He knew the stories about the Kalura mission. They all did, it seemed. Gossip traveled at light speed in a closed community, and it had had months to make the rounds. I understand Omega are okay and on tie-ops in the outer rim right now. It's kind of you to check for me, Commander. She had to ask. What's tie-ops? Captain Ordo makes a point of giving your signals priority. He lowered his voice. Traffic interdiction operations. Boarding the bad guys' vessels. Thank you. I've never met Ordo, but he does seem to take care of me very well. One of Cal Scarada's null arcs. Oh, Cal again. You've never met him, have you? No, but I hope I do. I feel as if he's been walking behind me for a long time. She looked around the hangar and noted there was one platoon still missing. She'd wait. She needed them all to hear this. I envy his ability to inspire people. Get said nothing. Tact, perhaps, or merely nothing to add, Etienne feared that she still projected her own doubts onto others. She was a Jedi Knight now. She had passed her trials on Kalura with Master Arligan Zay, working under deep cover with him to mobilize the colonists against the remnants of the Nymoidian and Trandishan occupation. It was silent, grim, secret work, and even though a Republic garrison had now been established on the planet, she still felt that the dwindling population of native Gerlinans and the human farmers were set on a collision course. The Republic had promised the Gerlinans that they would remove the human colony from their world. So far, they hadn't. It would have been a simple case of broken promises like many others in the galaxy's history had the Gerlinans not been a race of shape-shifting predators, working as spies for the Republic. This was their bargain. They would provide their unique espionage skills if the farmers stopped driving away the prey on which Gerlinans depended. As far as the Gerlinans were concerned, that meant the removal of the human settlements on Kalura. Attain new Gerlinans made bad enemies. They were more than capable of killing farmers, as they proved when they exacted revenge on informers on Kalura. But the war came first, and diplomacy had to take a back seat. 
All present and correct now, General, Get said. He flicked the controls of the repulsor platform and it lifted them about a meter above the deck, so that the assembled company of 144 clone troopers could see and hear her clearly. There was no noise apart from the occasional clack of armor plates as one soldier brushed too close to another, or the quiet clearing of throats. They didn't chat. Get still defaulted to drill. Company A. 10. Shun. The chunk of armor and rifles being slapped hard against chest plates was one synchronous noise. Atain waited a few moments and concentrated on projecting her voice across the cavern of the hangar. She hadn't been trained as an officer. It didn't come naturally. They needed her to be one, though, just as Darman had when he had expected all Jedi to be competent commanders. She inhaled slowly and felt her voice lift from her stomach through her chest. Stand easy, she said. And buckets off. The clack and hiss of helmets being removed was a little more ragged than the snap to attention. They weren't expecting that. She stared down into identical faces, reaching out into the force to get some sense of who they might be in their state of mind, much as she had with Omega. It was a complex tapestry, and yes, there was fear. There was an intense sense of belonging and focus, too. And there was not a trace of the hopeful child that had once so confused her when she felt Darman long before she saw him for the first time. Clones grew fast and learned even faster. A year at war real war, not just fatally realistic training had made them a lot more worldly wise and less idealistic. We have two battalions pinned down on Dinlo, she said. You've seen the op order. We open up that exit route for them by cutting through droid lines so they can reach the extraction point. You'll have air support, but we'll be relying predominantly on your infantry skills. She paused. They listened politely. Whatever focus they had appeared to come not from her but from something inside them. I'm not going to shoot you any line about glory, because this is about survival. That's my first rule as a Jedi, you know that? Survive. And so should it be yours. I don't want any wild sacrifices. I want to come out of this with as many of you and the 41st alive as possible not because your assets we need to use again, but because I don't want you to die. She felt the silence change not in quality, but in the realization that shivered almost imperceptibly through the Force. This wasn't how they were used to seeing themselves. We weren't exactly queuing up for it ourselves, ma'am, said a pilot, one boot on the step to his cockpit. There was a ripple of laughter, and Atain laughed, too. I'll try to keep my arc of fire under control, then, said Atain, and patted the stalker. She glanced at Git's forearm. He tilted it so that she could see his chrono readout. Ramps down in twenty-four minutes. Dismissed. The men broke up, replacing their helmets and falling into platoons and squads to make an orderly path to their assigned craft. The squadron of LAT-C gunships had been stripped out to create troop space on their cargo decks. Gid inspected the interior of his helmet, holding it in both gloved hands. Aren't you supposed to wish that the Force be with them, General? Attain like Git. He didn't treat her as an omniscient military genius but as just another being stuck in a hard place without a lot of choices. She could hear a faint sound coming from his helmet's audio feed. When she concentrated, she could hear singing, and so held out her hand for the helmet. She tried on Otten's once and been stunned by the welter of data it flung at the wearer. Helmet held close to her head, she could make out strong male voices, a choir of them, singing an anthem she had heard snatches of but rarely had the chance to listen to. Voden. They were singing, in the privacy of their own helmet comlinks, retreating into their world, like Omega Squad did from time to time. She could hear nothing outside the helmets, of course, and she felt oddly excluded. 
But they were not her brothers all. However much she wished to be part of something greater than herself, even more than the Jedi Order. They were gearing up for battle. Bal Kote, Derajum Kote, Jorso ran Kando at home. It sounded less martial and more of a lament to her ears right then. She'd have to ask General Juzik for a translation. He was very much the Mandoa speaker these days. She handed Git his helmet back and gave him a nod of thanks. It's not just the force we need with us today, Commander, she said. It's reliable kit and accurate intel. Always is, General, he said. Always is. He slipped his helmet back on and sealed the collar. She knew without asking that he had started singing, completely silent to her, but one voice with his brothers. Special Operations Brigade HQ, Coruscant, 20 minutes after the explosion at Depot Bravo 5, 367 days after Geonosis Captain Ordo needed General Bard and Juzik, and he needed him fast. He wasn't answering his comm link. That irked Ordo because an officer was supposed to be contactable at all times. And this was precisely the kind of emergency that proved the point. Ordo settled the two-seater Aerotech speeder bike outside the main doors far enough to one side not to obstruct them, as safety precautions dictated and strode down the main passage that led to the briefing and ops rooms. Location for General Juzik, please. He said to the admin droid that was operating the comm link relays in the lobby area. Meeting with General Arligan Zay and ARC Trooper Captain Mays in the CO's office, sir. Discussing the incontinent ordnance situation dash. Thank you, said Ordo. Just say bomb, will you? That's why I'm here, too. You can't dash. But he could, and he did. Noted. The red light above the office doors told Ordo that the general didn't want to be interrupted. He expected the Jedi's force sensitivity to detect him coming and open those doors, but they remained closed, so Ordo simply made use of the list of 5,000 security codes that he had memorized for an eventuality like this. He would never trust them to a data pad alone. Skirata had taught him that sometimes you could only take your own brain and body into battle. Ordo took off his helmet first, a courtesy Skirata had also taught him, and tapped in the code on the side panel. The doors parted and he walked up to the meeting table, a pool of dark blue polished stone where Zay, Juzik, and Zay's frankly surprised arc captain sat staring at him. Morning, sir, said Ordo. My apologies for interrupting, but I need General Juzik now. Juzik's thin pale face with its straggly blonde beard was the picture of horrified embarrassment. Ordo thought all Jedi could sense him coming, but that never seemed to buffer their surprise when he arrived on urgent business. Juzik didn't move fast enough. Ordo made a gesture toward the door. Captain, it's not customary to interrupt emergency meetings, Zay said carefully. General Juzik is our ordnance specialist and dash. That's why I need him now, sir. Sergeant Skirata sends his compliments, but he would like the general to join him at the incident scene, seeing as he's the explosives expert and his skills would be best spent on practical matters rather than discussion. I think your sergeant should be leaving all that to Coruscant security, said Captain Mays who clearly didn't understand the situation well enough. Typical ordinary arc. Typical stubborn arc. No, Ordo said. Not possible. If I could hurry you a little, General Juzik, I have a speeder right outside. And please remember to leave your comm link active in the future. You must be contactable at all times. Maze looked at Zay and Zay shook his head discreetly. Ordo caught Juzik by his elbow and hurried him down the passage. Sorry about reprimanding you in front of Zay, sir, Ordo said, scattering droids and the occasional clone trooper as they hurried back up the passageway. But Sergeant Skirata is livid. 
I know, I should have left it on dash. Like to pilot, sir? I know you enjoy it. Yes, please, dash. It was the rapid thud of boots behind him that made Ordo stop and turn just as Captain Mays put his hand out to tap him on the shoulder. He deflected the arc's arm and brushed it aside. Mays squared up. Look, no, I don't know who your sergeant thinks he is, but you obey a general when he dash. I don't have time for this. Ordo brought his fist up hard and without warning right under Mays's chin, knocking him against the wall. The man swore and didn't go down, so Ordo hit him again, this time in the nose always demoralizing enough to stop someone dead, but nothing seriously damaging, nothing to cause lasting pain. He would never harm a brother if he could help it. And I only take orders from Cal Scarada. Juzik and Ordo sprinted the rest of the way to the speeder to make up lost time. Ordo. Yes? Ordo, you just flattened an ARC trooper. He was delaying us. But you hit him. Twice. No permanent harm done, Ordo said, lifting his comma to slide over the pillion seat behind Juzik. He sealed his helmet. You can't convince Alpha Arcs of anything by rational argument. They're every bit as obtuse and impulsive as Fett, believe me. Juzik looked perplexed as he started up the drive. He took the speeder bike into a straight vertical lift and spun it around at the top of the climb. His hair, tied back in a bunch, whipped across Ordo's visor on the slipstream, and the arc brushed it aside in irritated silence. It was high time the boy braided it or got it cut short. Where to, Ordo? Manarai. Brief me, Juzik said. CSF is struggling with this. If you get in right now and use the force while the incident scene is fresh, we might get a break. Juzik banked right to avoid a slim spire and chewed his lower lip. He seemed to be able to fly without thinking. I've been over the data six or seven times and I can't see any consistent pattern in any of the devices. Not the materials, not the method of construction, nothing. Just that they're all very complex devices and hard to set. Ordo blinked to switch his helmet audio to filter out the wind noise. Next time, he'd commandeer an airspeeder with a canopy. Always explosives. Say again? Ordo adjusted his volume. I said always explosives. Chemical and biological ordnance has limited use on a planet with more than a thousand different species. Things that go bang, though, are guaranteed to hurt every race. I'd buy that if these devices were being used randomly. They're not. It's all Grand Army targets. Humans. Are you sure it's me you need for this? Juzik asked. I'm not as adept with the living force as others. You want to go back and have a nice meeting? No. Juzik looked back over his shoulder with a big grin. Ordo had learned not to tell him to keep his eyes straight ahead, but it was still unnerving to watch a Jedi navigate a craft by his force senses alone. I've never seen anyone walk over Zay like that. I simply had to get the job done, sir. No offense. Do you mind my asking you something, Ordo? Go ahead. Why do you tolerate me? You don't take the slightest notice of Zay. Or Camus. Or anyone else, for that matter. Skarada respects you. I trust his judgment. Oh. Juzik didn't seem to be expecting that answer. I have a very great regard for our sergeant, too. Ordo noted the word R. And that was what made Juzik different. As far as Calbert, Papa Cal, was concerned, he had thrown in his lot with his men. But, as Calbert said privately, you could stick a weak-way officer in front of the clone army, and they would still fight well. 
An army of three million men with very few Jedi officers had to be self-directing. Ordo was well used to directing himself. Juzik never asked if Ordo thought of him as his commanding officer, though. He probably knew, and didn't need to be reminded that Ordo answered only to the one man who had stepped physically between him and death once, twice, more times than was decent to count, Cal Skirata. And while Ordo knew intellectually that a detached, unsentimental officer was the kind who won wars and saved the most lives, his heart said that a sergeant who was ready to die to protect his men got the very last drop of sweat and blood from them, and given gladly. I think you might really be in trouble with Zay this time, Ordo. And what do you think he's going to do about it? Aren't you afraid? Not since Kamino. If Juzik understood that, it didn't show. Is it true that your brother Muriel hijacked a transport to Kamino? It's known as hardening targets, General. Challenging security to improve it. We do that. It was a lie, but not entirely. The Nulls tried not to remove GR. Assets from the battlefield unless it was absolutely necessary. But in this case, Calbear had said it was. The Jedi Command turned a blind eye to the irregularities if they detected them because the Null Squad produced unparalleled results. No, Zay wouldn't touch him. If he was foolish enough to try, he would learn a hard lesson. General, do you remember being taken from your parents? Juzik glanced to his left and a few moments later a CSF patrol appeared on their flank, dipped a wing in acknowledgement, and dropped away below them again. They're just pinging us to be sure we are who they think we are. The Jedi said, evading the question. Can't trust anything to be what it seems these days. Indeed. I hope CSF aren't offended by our intervention. Ordo tightened his grip. It's not their fault they can't handle this. They're very competent. They're competent at defense. They're not used to attacking. We can think like an enemy better than they can. You can. I fear I never will. I was trained to kill and destroy by any means possible. I suspect you were trained to obey some rules. I do actually. What? Obey rules? No, I remember being taken from my family. Just being taken. Not my family, though. And what makes you so attached to us? Ordo chose his words precisely, knowing what attachment meant to a Jedi. He knew the answer anyway. And doesn't that worry you? Juzik paused for a moment, and then turned with an anxious smile. Jedi weren't supposed to feel powerful emotions like vengeance or love or hate. Ordo could now see that conflict on the boy's face daily. And Juzik was a boy. Ordo was the same physical age as the General 22 but he felt a generation older, despite being born only 11 years ago. And the Jedi drew strength from the things that tore up his heart, just as Cal Skirata did. He and Juzik were opposites in so many ways and yet so very similar in others. You have such a passionate sense of belonging. Juzik said at last. And you never complain about the way you're used. Save your sympathy for the troopers, Bordo said. Nobody uses us. And a clear sense of purpose is a strength. The southern side of the logistics depot was a wasteland of shattered metal and rubble. From the air, it looked like an abandoned construction site with a brightly colored perimeter fence. As Juzik dropped lower, the perimeter resolved into crowds held back by a CSF. Cordon The GR supplies base was right on the boundary of a civilian area, separated only by a strip of landing platforms, with levels of warehousing operated by droids below it. It had obviously been a big device. Had the same bomb exploded in the civilian heart of Coruscant, the casualties would have run to thousands. Whatever do they find to look at? Juzik asked. 
He had trouble finding a space to sit down and had to land outside the security cordon. He was clearly offended by the sightseers and didn't wait for Ordo to clear a path through the crowd for him. For a quietly spoken man, Juzik could certainly make himself heard. Citizens, unless you have contributions to make here, can I suggest you clear the area in case there's a second device still set to detonate? Ordo was impressed at the speed with which most of the crowd melted away. The resistantly curious hung around in small groups. You don't want to see this, Juzik said. They paused and then walked away. A CSF incident support vessel skimmed across the strip and hovered for a moment beside Juzik. The pilot leaned a little way out of the hatch. Never seen mind influence in action before, sir. Thank you. I wasn't using the force, Juzik said. Ordo found a new reason to like this Jedi every day. He took the war as personally as Calbert did. A thick-set man in gray tunic waved to them from the inner cordon, where a large group of civilians and hovercams waited. Captain Jailer Obram wasn't wearing his Senate Guard finery any longer. Ordo knew him well, since they'd worked together with Omega Squad on the spaceport siege. Obram's time had been increasingly taken up with counterterrorism duties. He was seconded to CSF now, but they still didn't seem able to persuade him to wear the blue uniform. Can you influence the media to go away, General? Ordo said. Or shall I do it manually? The CSF forensics investigation team was still picking a slow and careful path through the debris of the entrance to Bravo 8 when Ordo and Juzik reached the cordon. Set back ten meters from the inner cordon was a screen of white plastoid sheet with the CSF badge repeated across its surface. The worst debris had been screened from the cams and prying eyes. It was grim work for civilian police. Ordo knew that they had neither the expertise nor the numbers to handle what was happening lately. And how did they cope with the things they saw if they hadn't been trained to deal with them from childhood, as he had? For a moment he felt pity. But there was work to do. Ordo flicked on the voice projection of his helmet with a quick eye movement. Mind your backs, please. An HNE crew and a dozen other media representatives somewhat's, as Skirata called organic life forms, some tinnies, or droids formed a cautious audience for the grisly aftermath of the explosion. They parted instantly, even before they looked around and saw Ordo striding toward them. Then they gave him an even wider berth. An ARC trooper cut an imposing figure, and a captain marked in the brilliant scarlet that subconsciously said danger to many humanoid species cleared a big path. Obrim deactivated a section of the cordon to let Juzik and Ordo pass. This is General Bard and Juzik, Ordo said. He's one of us. Can he wander around and assess the site? Obram looked Juzik up and down with the air of a man who believed more in hard data than the Force. Of course he can. Mind the evidence markers, sir. I'll be cautious, Juzik said, meshing his fingers in front of him to do that little Jedi bow that Ordo found fascinating. Sometimes Juzik was one of the boys, and sometimes he was ancient, wisely sober, another creature entirely. I won't contaminate evidence. Obrim waited for him to walk away and turned to Ordo. Not that it'd matter. The forensic is getting us nowhere. Maybe we need the mystic mob to give us a break. How are you anyway? Focused. Very focused. Yes, your boss is pretty focused too. He can curse the slime off a hut, that man. He takes all casualties personally, I'm afraid. I know what you mean. I'm sorry about your boys, by the way. They catch it coming and going, don't they? Skirata was bent deep in conversation with a CSF officer, their heads almost touching, talking in low and agitated voices. He swung around as Ordo approached. His face was gray with suppressed anger. 
15 dead. Skirata clearly didn't care about civilian casualties, traffic disruption, or structural damage. He gestured toward a large fragment of white leg armor in the rubble of what had been a security post. I'm going to rip some Chikar's guts out for this. When we find them, I'll make sure you're first in line, Bobram said. There wasn't a lot any of them could do at that moment except to allow the largely Celestin scenes of crime team to do their work. Skirata, chewing vigorously on that bittersweet rook root that he'd recently taken a liking to, stood with his fists in his jacket pockets, watching Juzik stepping delicately between chunks of debris. The Jedi occasionally stopped to close his eyes and stand completely motionless. Skirata's expression was one of cold appraisal. He's a good kid. Ordo nodded. Do you want me to look after him? Yes, but not at the expense of your own safety. After a few minutes, Juzik made his way back to the cordon, arms folded. You didn't pick up anything? Skirata said, as if he expected Juzik to bay like a hunting strill latching on to a scent. A great deal. Juzik shut his eyes for a second. I can still feel the disturbance in the Force. I can sense the destruction and pain and fear. Like a battlefield, in fact. So? It's what I can't sense that bothers me. Which is? Malevolence. The enemy is absent. The enemy was never here, in fact. Republic Fleet Protection Group Traffic Interdiction Vessel, TIV, Z590-1, standing off Corellian Perlemian Hyperspace Intersection, 367. Days after Geonosis. Phi really didn't like zero geops. He took off his helmet with slow care and put one hand on the webbing restraints that stopped him from drifting away from the bulkhead of the anonymous utility vessel that had been customized for armed boarding parties. If he moved a little too quickly, he drifted. Drifting made him. Queasy. Darman, Niner, and Aden didn't seem bothered by it at all, either did the pilot, who, for reasons Phi hadn't yet worked out, was called Sicko. Sicko had shut down the drives. The unmilitary, unmarked, apparently unimpressive little TIVA, plain wrapper, as the pilots tagged it hung with drives idling near an exit point of the hyperspace route. Cockpit panels flickering with a dozen weapons displays. Externally, it looked like a battered utility shuttle. Under the rust, though, it was a compact assault platform that could muscle its way onto any vessel. Phi thought that traffic interdiction operations was a lovely euphemism for heavy duty military hijack. I do like a non compliant boarding to start the day, Sicko said. You okay, Phi? I'm sorted, Phi lied. You're not going to throw up, are you? I just cleaned this crate. If I can keep field rations down, I can handle anything. Tell you what, chum, put your bucket back on and keep it to yourself. I can aim straight. Phi had learned the skills of maneuvering in zero-g late in like just before he turned eight and sixteen not all that long before Geonosis and it didn't come as naturally to him as those troopers trained specifically for deep space duties. He wondered why the others had come through the same training with more tolerance of it. Niner, apparently impervious to every hardship except seeing his squad improperly dressed, stared at the palm of his glove as if willing the wrist-mounted hollowlink from HQ to activate. The squad now wore the matte black stealth version of the Katarn armor that made them even more visibly different from the rest of the Republic commando squads. Niner said it was sensible, even if it made them pretty conspicuous targets on snow-covered fest. Fi suspected he liked it better because it also made them look seriously menacing. Droids didn't care, but it certainly put the wind-up wet's organic targets when they saw it. If they saw it, of course. They usually didn't get the chance. An occasional click of his teeth indicated Niner was annoyed. It was Skirata's habit, too. 
Odo's always on time, Fai said, trying to take his mind off his churning stomach. Don't fret, Sarge. Your buddy. Darman teased. Rather have him for a friend than an enemy. Ooh, he likes you. Hobnobbing with ARC officers from the bunker squad. Eh? We have an understanding, Fai said. I don't laugh at his skirt, and he doesn't rip my head off. Yes, Ordo had taken a shine to him. Fai hadn't fully understood it until Skarada had taken him to one side and explained just what had happened to Ordo and his batch on Kamino as kids. So when Fai had thrown himself on a grenade during an anti-terrorist stop to smother the detonation, Ordo had marked him out as someone who'd take an awfully big risk to save comrades. No arcs were psychotic bonkers, as Skarada put it but they were unshakably loyal when the mood struck them. And when the mood failed to strike them, they were instant death on legs. Fai suspected that Ordo was bored out of his brain, stuck in HQ on Karuskin for most of the last year with nothing to so Fai stared at Niner's glove, too, willing his stomach to stay put. At precisely 0900 hours triple zero time, right on cue, Niner's palm burst into blue light. RC-1309 receiving, sir, Niner said. The encrypted link was crystal clear. Ordo shimmered in a blue hull image, apparently sitting in the cockpit of a police vessel, helmet beside him on the adjoining seat. But he didn't look bored. He was clenching and unclenching one fist. Sukui Omega. How's it going? Ready to roll, sir. Sergeant, latest intel we have is that the suspect vessel left Kulerin bound for Denon and is headed for your position. The bad news is that it appears to be traveling with a couple of legit vessels as a smokescreen. Commercial freight is getting very edgy about piracy so they're forming up into convos now. We can read out the target, said Niner. It would be very awkward if you decompressed a civilian freighter at the moment. It'll be the Gizzer L6. Understood. And we need the DQ to live. No slotting, no disintegration, no accidents. Not even a good slap? Asked Fi. Use the PEP laser and keep it non-lethal if you can. Somebody's very keen to have a frank chat with them. Ordo paused, head tilted down for a second. Vav's back. Fai couldn't stop himself from glancing at Aten and noted that Darman had done the same. Aten had his chin tucked into the padded rim of his chest plate and was idly scratching the scar that ran from just under his right eye and across his mouth to the left side of his jaw. It was a thin white line now, a faint memory of the raw red welt it had been when Fai first saw him, and Fai suddenly realized something he hadn't worked out before. I think I know how he got that. Aden was from Sergeant Wallen Vav's training company, not Skiratas. And over the months, as casualties mounted and more partial squads were regrouped with men from other companies, they all swapped stories. The Vav stories didn't get a laugh at all. You okay, Naviodi? Fine, Aden said. He looked up, jaw set. So how many bandits are we going to not slot? disintegrate, or speak harshly to then, Captain. Five, best intel says, said Ordo. We'll assume ten then, said Niner. Ordo paused for a moment, as if he thought Niner might be resorting to sarcasm. Fi could see it in the way his shoulders braced. He was a knife-edge kind of man, Ordo. But Niner was simply in literal mode as he tended to be when things were getting intense. He always wanted to err on the side of caution. Ordo obviously knew that he didn't bite. By the way, General Termukin is operating around the Bahan sector, and appears to be coping, according to Commander Get, he said. And she's still packing the cone rifle, so your lesson wasn't wasted. Beats swinging the shiny stick, Fai said, winking at Darman. 
It'd be fun to see her again, eh, Dar? Darman smiled enigmatically. Otten was staring in slight defocus at the bulkhead, jaw clenched. If I thought it was high time the bad guys dropped out of hyperspace and took their minds off the individual things that were troubling them, which included his stomach. Ordo out, the blue hollow said, and Niner's glove held nothing but air again. Darman prepped his helmet, resetting the HUD with a prod of his finger. Poor Ordai K.A. He called him by the affectionate nickname Skirata used in private, a kid's name, Little Ordo. In public, it was strictly captain and sergeant. And you could call your brother VODK in the Mandalorian way, but nobody else could, and never in front of strangers. Who'd want to be doing the filing when the rest of your batch are off saving the galaxy? Well, I hear Kamarke is out at Utapal, and Jang's canonied up and gone hiking with extreme prejudice in the Bakura sector, said Fi. Fearfeck. Knowing him, he's doing it for the fun of it. And as for Mariel. Well, why has Kel sent him out to Kamino? Niner clicked irritably again. Anyone else you want to discuss classified intel with, Fi? Sorry, Sarge. The cabin was silent once more. Fi slid his helmet back on, sealed the collar and concentrated on the artificial horizon of his HUD to convince his stomach which way was up. The Mark III Katarn armor now had more enhancements and was rated blaster-resistant up to light cannon rounds. Every op was full of new surprises from GR procurement like a birthday, according to Skirata, although Fi, like all his brothers, had never celebrated one. Now they even had a non-lethal pulsed energy projectile, or PEP, for the DC-17 that didn't exactly kill the targets, but certainly made their eyes water. It was police riot control kit, a deuterium fluoride laser. It would probably just annoy a Wookiee, but it sorted out humanoids in short order. Phi focused on the icons in the frame of his HUD and blinked one into action, sending chill there across his face. That soothed his nausea. Then he isolated his audio channel and accessed the articularly thumping piece of glimmick music. Niner cut in on the calm channel override. Now what are you listening to? Mon Kel Opera, Vi said. I'm improving my mind. Liar. I can see you nodding to the beat. Relax, Sarge. Please. Want to listen in? I'm psyched up enough, thanks, Niner said. Darman shook his head. Aden looked up. Later, Fi. Sicko glanced over his shoulder, excluded from the squad's conversation by their secure helmet-to-helmet comm link. But he could obviously see the body language that indicated they were chatting. Fi flicked to his frequency with a couple of blinks directed at the sensor inside his visor. How about you, Naviodi? Want some music? No thanks. Sicko had much the same neutral accent as most of the infantry trooper clones. They'd learned basic from flash instruction and had rarely been exposed to outsiders with interesting accents. But it's decent of you to offer. Commandos owed their lives to the guts of these pilots Omega had been extracted under heavy fire by their astonishing skill a number of times and the TIV pilots were the most daring of the lot. Any gulfs among clone trooper, specialists, and the elite commando units had now been swept away by shared hardship and they were in vogue now all brothers. Fi was happy to indulge them. He killed the music feed and switched over to the open squad comm link again. The waiting was eating at him now. If. Got trade, said Sicko. They should be jumping out of hyperspace any time now. Three contacts. He flicked the tracking display from his console into a hollow projection so they could see the pulses of color that represented the ship's no outlines or shapes, just a flickering array of numbers and codes to one side, 
awaiting a ship to tag. Intercept in two minutes. They should all be less than a minute apart. Bring us in starboard side too, please, said Niner. There you go. The L6 is coming out first. Sicko pressed a pad on the console and Fi heard the grapple arms extend and retract like an athlete flexing muscles before an event. The display picked up the ship, then another. But the second profile looks like an L6 too. Intel said Dash. Intel has occasionally been known to be less than 100% accurate, apparently. Aden sighed a fifth of contempt. You reckon? Fi could see that he was checking ship's configuration data via his HUD. I'm glad I'm shockproofed. But we like Intel, said Fi. No, not again. Let it be right this time. Sergeant Cal never read us bedtime stories, so Intel satisfies our innate boyish need for heroic fantasy. Is he always like this? Sicko asked. No, he's pretty quiet today. Darman clutched a magnetic frame charge to his chest plate his hatch persuader, as he liked to call it. So are we going to jump the first crate or what? Play it by ear, said Niner, who always seemed to resort to Skirata's voice under pressure. He hit the release on his restraints. Let's see how it reacts when we approach. Pressure up helmets, gentlemen, and we're in business. Coming about, said Sicko. And if I can't disable its drive, blow the navigation power conduit. The access ought to be outside the engineering compartment, but it's sometimes inside the port side bulkhead, three meters from the hatch. So knock the rotten thing out, will you? Or they'll bolt and drag us across ten star systems. Then the pilot punched the TIV into a 90-degree roll and the apparently fixed constellations Phi had been watching tilted before his eyes. He understood instantly why they called the man sicko. Phi grabbed a restraint instinctively and his backpack hit the bulkhead. Oh, fear effect dash. Whoa! Ah. Uh. Phi could see through the cockpit screen as he steadied himself alongside the hatch. A box-like freighter, yes. A Gizzer L6 loomed out of black nothing. Interdict that, Niner said. Fi reached for his jetpack controls, hanging right beside Darman in free fall. Sicko powered the TIV into a slow head-on approach and corkscrewed slowly to line it up and bring the deck head hatch against the port side of the freighter, landing lights on. The freighter slowed, too. Darman stood ready, fingers flexing over the jetpack controls on his belt. He'd be first out, blowing the hatch controls when the blast-proof combing sealed against the target's hull, pulling aside to let the other storm in. As the TIV moved sedately along the freighter's flank, the landing lights picked out the bright orange livery of Vashan containers. Oops, said Sicko. Looks like the legit one. Back off then, Niner said. If the other ship sees this, we've lost Dash. A flash caught Fi's eye at the same time it did everyone else's. The second vessel was heading their way. Another L6, Sicko said. Please don't let there be three of them. The first L6 suddenly altered course with a rapid burn. It had probably picked up the wrong idea about a scruffy little ship in an area of space that was frequently populated by pirates. One of its spars wheeled 90 degrees almost instantly, looming in the TIV's view screen on collision course. Abort, abort, abort! Sicko yelled. Brace, 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 dash. He was cut short by a screech of tearing alloy that shuddered through the TIV and suddenly it wasn't the tight gut exhilaration of aborting but the desperate scramble to survive. The impact spun the TIV off, and the last thing Fi saw as he somersaulted involuntarily was Sicko pulling on the yoke and punching a stabilizing burn to stop the spin. 
There was nothing Phi or the squad could do. It was all down to the pilot. Phi hated that moment of helpless realization every time. The display in his HUD shuddered like a cheap bootleg halvid as he hit the bulkhead harder than he thought possible in zero-g. Incoming! Returning fire. And then there was light, brilliant blue-white light. The instant hot rain of fragments peppered and pecked on the hull. Sicko had neutralized the incoming missile. The second L-6 powered up and punched back into hyperspace in a flare of light. Chew on that, Sicko said, and slapped his fist hard on the console. Phone deployed. Hull breach secure. What's that? Phi said, suddenly ice cold and focused, and not nauseous at all. BRB. What? Big red button. Emergency hull seal. The remains of the freighter's missile cartwheeled slowly into the distance, trailing vapor. It was the kind of self-defense many freighters felt the need to carry these days. Wars created useful opportunity for the criminal community. Niner sighed. Oh, Fearfeck, everyone knows we're here now. Anyone get his license number? Fi said. Maniac. Yeah, and more maniacs along shortly, too. Sicko turned his head toward the scanner readout. Next one's due in 60 seconds. And the next one two minutes later, I reckon. I hope he doesn't call for assistance, or we're going to have to bang out of here really fast. Tell me they're not going to notice that little fracas. They're not going to notice that little fracas. Vori, brother. You're welcome. The pilot didn't take his eyes off the scanner. Happy to lie to a comrade any time. If it makes him feel better, there you go. The next freighter fell out of hyperspace 1,500 meters from their port bow, and its pilot definitely noticed. Fine knew that because the immediate bright arc of laser cannon shaved the Ellen mass mounted on the TIV's nose just as Sicko let loose a sustained volley into the freighter's underslung drive. It was still showering debris as Sicko brought the TIV about and swung back under the freighter to loop over its casing from its starboard quarter and bring the TIV, totally inverted, to rest hatch to hatch with the target. And there was nothing the crippled freighter could do about it. Sicko was too close in, too far inside the minimum range of its cannon, and now riding a very angry Routery Tiger. This is where you get off. Sicko's voice was just a little shaky. End of the line. Stand to. Niner said. The skirt of combing shot out of the TIV's hatch housing and sealed tight against the freighter's hull while the grapple arms held it secure. The pressure equalization light flashed red and the TIV's blast-proof inner hatch opened, then the outer one. Dar, take it! Dar slapped the frame charges on the freighter's hatch, the inner hatch snapped shut again, and a muffled wump vibrated through the TIV. How Sicko had managed to bring the TIV alongside the port hatch without ramming the vessel or ripping the deck head out of the TIV-5 would never understand. But that was what trooper pilots did, and he was in awe of them. The inner hatch opened again. Darman Bolden two flashbangs blinding, deafening stun grenades and Niner was first through the hatch. Go, 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 dash. Phi buoyed up on a wave of adrenaline, plunged through after him, DC-17 set to blaster mode. The TIV and Sicko were swept from his mind from that moment as time disobeyed all the rules and he was caught in an infinite, slow-motion split second while the squad burst through the hatch and the LSIXS artificial gravity smacked him down hard on the deck. The impact ran up through the soles of his boots. He was running for seconds before his proprioception caught up with the gravity and his body said one remember this but there weren't many places to run on an L-6 freighter. It was a cockpit, and a couple of cabins bolted to a Durasteel box of nothing. Aten moved ahead and simply opened up with the D's new pep laser, 
knocking two men flat in a massive shock wave of sound and light as they came out of the starboard cabin firing blasters. Fi's anti-flash visor darkened instantly. Even with armor, he felt the shock of the pep's unleashed energy. They all did. Fi ran on over Otten as he dropped to one knee to cuff and search the men, wrists to ankles, as they lay struggling for breath, whimpering. A pep round was like being flashbanged and hit in the chest by several plastoid rounds at once. It was usually non-lethal. Usually. Two down, three maybe to go. The cockpit doors didn't open when Niner stood back and hit the controls. Otten caught up with Fi again, and they stood catching their breath. Niner motioned Darman into position at the cockpit doors. Shame that Pep doesn't work through bulkheads. Confirmed, three still inside, Darman said, running the infrared sensor sweep in his gauntlet up and down the seam of the doors. Nothing in the port cabin. Intel had it right for once. There were five bandits on board. Encourage them to step outside, Dar, Niner said, checking his D's Pep setting. He peered at the power readout. This thing actually scares me. Darman unrolled a ribbon of adhesive thermal charge and pressed it around the door's weak points. Then he pushed the debt into the soft material and cocked his head to one side as if calculating. All that fuss getting in, and now we just walk over them. Anticlimactic, I think the word is. There was a dull echoing thud and screech of metal that vibrated through the deck. For a second Fi thought the dead had gone off prematurely and that it was all a trick of his adrenaline-distorted perception, and that he was dead but didn't know it yet. But it wasn't the dead. Fi looked at Niner, and Niner looked at Otten, and Fi saw in Darman's viewpoint icon that he was staring at a fragment of flimsy that whipped past him as if snatched by a sudden wind. It was being carried on a stream of air. Escaping air. Fi felt it grab him, and they all reached instinctively for a secure point to anchor them. Hull breach, Fi said, arms tied around a stanchion. Check suit seals. They went into an automatic and long-drilled check of their suit systems. Katarn armor was vacuum-proofed. Fi's glove sensor confirmed his suit was still airtight and the thumbs up from the rest of the squad indicated that their suit integrity was holding up too. The temporary gale of escaping air was abating. Sicko, you receiving? Said Niner. Fi had the same thought, and judging by the rapid breathing on the shared comm link, so had Otten and Darman. The decompression was via the hatch. And that meant the seal formed by the TIV had been breached. On their comm link there was only faint static and the sound of their own breathing and swallowing. Fear effect, Otten said. Whatever it is, he's gone. Niner motioned Darman to stay by the cockpit hatch and beckoned Fi to follow him. Let's see if it's fixable. You two stay there. Well, we've probably lost two prisoners now, Darman said. Better make sure we haven't lost the rest. There was no telling what had dislodged the TIV and whether they were going to meet someone boarding to deal with them. They made their way back up the passage to the entry hatch, DC 17's raised, and there was no sign of the two prisoners they'd left cuffed, nor anybody else. And the hatch about two meters by two was wide open, star-speckled void visible beyond. Phi gripped the rail on one side of it and leaned out a little. It was a good way to get your head blown off, but he decided that the urgency of the situation warranted it. There was no sign of the TIV. There was no sign of anything. He pulled himself back in board. At least the gravity was still functioning. Niner checked the environment sensors on his forearm plate. Atmosphere's fully vented now. They have to have a foam system in these things. Yeah, but if you had us running around your vessel, would you seal the hull and help us out? Is the cockpit airtight? Fi asked. 
We won't know for sure until they go cold, and we can't pick them up in the infrared. Niner switched on his tactical spot lamp and began searching the bulkhead for panels. And by that time we'll be ice cubes ourselves. Katarn armor even the Mark III version was only good against vacuum for 20 minutes without a backup air supply. And they hadn't counted on being exposed that long. For some reason Fi was distracted by Sicko's fate. It was a strange thing to discover when you were on borrowed time yourself. But Sicko had said the power conduits were routed via a panel three meters from. Here. Fi ejected the vibroblade from his knuckle plate and pried open the panel. Niner stood behind him and directed his spot lamp into the recessed mass of cabling, pipes, and wires. That one's labeled isolation bulkhead, Niner said. Yeah, but where does that come down? They looked up at the deck head for shutter housings. There were at least three back down the passage that they could see. Let's play safe and withdraw to the one nearest the cockpit, Niner said. We could blow the whole panel here and shut everything down, including the gravity. Lovely. Usually triggers emergency containment. Niner put his glove to the side of his helmet. It was a nervous habit of his, just like the way he grew increasingly irritable with Phi as his stress levels peaked. Dar, are you getting this? Halfway there already, said Darman's voice. Fai's chrono said they had 15 minutes left to make this work. Okay, if Dar blows this remotely and it activates the emergency bulkhead, then we'll be stuck between that and the cockpit hatch. And if there's atmosphere in there, we can open it and cozy up to the other three Huron. Or, Fai said, we find it's hard vacuum, too, and then we'll be completely stuffed. Stuffed if we don't, said Darman appearing at Fai's shoulder with a ribbon of thermal detonator tape. Go on. Get back there and wait for me while I set the timer. We ought to call in a red zero. Let's wait until we know if there'll be anything left of us to make it worth rescuing, Niner said, trotting back down the passage. Fai watched him go, shrugged at Darman, and then patted the wide-open cover of the control panel. Thanks, sicko. He said. Three. MRU. Already committed. Much regret enable. Signal relayed from CO, RAS Fearless, on receipt of request to withdraw to Skuma and abort extraction of Sarlacc battalions. The Winchell factor in the open troop bay of a LAT slash C gunship flying at 500 km per hour was sobering. But then so was the deafening roar of air and the swoops and dips of the flight path as the pilot jinked to stop ground-based A fire from getting a lock. Attain realized why the trooper's sealed armor and bodysuit was a good idea. She had only her Jedi robes and the sensible precaution of upper body armor plates, which did little to insulate on their own. She summoned the force to help her withstand the icy blast and made sure her safety line was hooked securely to the bulkhead rail. You're going to be in the Dwang when you get back to HQ, General. The clone trooper sergeant said with a grin. He slipped on his helmet and sealed it. His nickname was Clanky. She made a point of asking. I really did not see the signal, she said carefully. Or at least I looked at it a little too late. His voice emerged now from the projection unit of the anonymous helmet. It was very funny, signaling MRU. Funny? Oh. There was a frozen pause. It's how you decline a social invitation, an RPC. Request the pleasure of your company? Much regret unable. Yes, she was in the dwang indeed, as he put it. She wasn't fully up to speed with the mass of acronyms and slang that had erupted in the last year. She could hardly keep up with the clone troopers' inventiveness, their extraordinary capacity to appropriate language and habits, and shape them to their needs had spawned subcultures of clone identity everywhere. 
She almost felt she needed a protocol droid. But she knew what Alardi was. Darman had said the LAT slash IOR in this case. The bigger cargo variant was the most beautiful vessel imaginable when you needed an urgent lift out of trouble. It certainly felt like it now. Am are you indeed? How could I be so stupid? So the troopers thought she was a smart mouth like Fi, flourishing a little bravado. Instead, she was simply ignorant of the rapidly evolving and idiosyncratic jargon and used it carelessly. I'm sure they'll forgive me if you pull this off, Sergeant. Her voice was drowned by the roar and falling note of V-19 torrent drives as two of the fighters streaked past them and disappeared into the distance. They were heading off to soften the droid positions that stood between the heavily forested terrain where both Sarlacc battalions were pinned down, and there was a narrow ribbon of Delta shoreline where pilots could land. Droids, as Darman had once pointed out, were rubbish in dense forests. Attain hoped so. The gunship dropped suddenly now level with the tree canopy, and the streaked image of green foliage showed her just how fast they were flying. Another lardy came up on their port side. There were thirty-four gunships somewhere near, strung out in a loose formation, heading for the extraction zone. Three minutes, General, the pilot's cockpit intercom said. There was a crack and flare of something exploding off to their starboard side. Getting some attention from the Tinny's AAA, so we'll drop a little more. Hold tight. It hardly made her flinch now. She had reached the saturation level of adrenaline where she was vividly aware of every hazard but running on some primeval automatic level of painless cold reason too scared to panic, as one of the clone troopers had described it. Three minutes became three hours became three seconds. Red blaster fire from droids lit up the tree line as the lardy bank to come around in a spiral descent. Atane didn't think, and she didn't feel, and she simply jumped the last ten meters from the open deck over the fast-roping four-man squad of clone troopers and the green-trimmed sergeant. Force skills came in very useful at the most unlikely times. She landed in front of the squad and brought the C-O-N-C rifle up level one hand on the stock the other on the barrel grip to sweep the forest edge in front of her. She felt other gunships landing all around them, whipping up soil and leaves, but she saw only what was in front about two platoons of Sarlacc men exchanging fire with super battle droids on the edge of the clearing and her squad to either side of her. A spread of ten EMP grenades from the squad and a volley from her CONC brought half the super battle droids to a halt. It was at times like this that she longed for the calm link convenience of a helmet instead of one strapped to her arm in just the wrong place. The force was short on specifics like SBD strength 100 units, closing up at green 20. And there was so much chaos and pain in the force right then that she couldn't harness it to focus. So she did what she had been drilled to do without thinking since she was four years old. She fought. She ran, the squad matching her pace and firing a blue stream into the droid line in odd silence until Clanky activated his voice projector, and she heard him say, They're closing up all along the shoreline. Sorry, General. Big holes now in the droid lines. No link, she said, superfluous words stripped from her mind. The concussion rifle was getting heavy and running out of charge the power indicator was edging back down to zero. Two more volleys knocked three SBDs flat and a small tree with them. How many more? Forward air control says 200 SBDs and tanks bearing 20 degrees with four torrents on their case. More V-19s screamed low overhead and a yellow fringe ball of white fire backlit the forest, suddenly throwing silhouetted trees and running men into sharp contrast. Fearless their group commander certainly had a grip on the reality of the situation. No wonder everybody loved pilots. Clanky dropped flat and began firing prone at the stream of SBDs that had turned toward the gunship landing area. Attain followed him without thinking. He was listening to data in his helmet, 
judging by his occasional emphatic nod. Sarlacc's breaking out all along the shoreline, General, and Fearless is directing the rest of the Lartais north. Any word on General Vazgier? Clanky went silent for a moment, to her at least. One click north with Commander Gree, calling in air strikes. Two gunships moved in close enough to catch Atain's peripheral vision and knots of men broke from the trees, some carrying wounded comrades between them. Atain hoped the single IM-6 medical droid on each lardy could handle the triage of dozens of men at once. One gunship set down again at right angles to the tree line, its starboard hatch shut tight and taking droid fire that scattered sparks while it trained composite beam lasers on the SBDs. The starboard gunner horribly exposed in the transparent steel bubble set in the wing was hosing the droids at waist height. Atain saw movement, and white-armored shapes race behind the vessel and disappear, presumably into the port side of the troop bay. The torrent of comp beam laser was like a freeze frame in its unbroken, steady stream. For a slow-motion moment Atain reasoned, Using the forward cannon and deploying the heavier and nastier armaments radiation burst missiles would cause heavy trooper casualties in this position. Her mouth was dry, her heart pounding so fast that she could hardly distinguish between beats, and yet she could stop the chrono to think these odd things. She resumed firing. She held her fingers tight on the trigger until the C.O.N.C. died in her hands. Whoa, Tinny's breaking this way, Dash. Her focus narrowed. She no longer saw the five men around her except as white blurs and vortices of raw energy in the force. The lead battle droid overran their position, and she simply swung the dead rifle in a force-driven arc right up into the thing's chest, smashing the alloy and sending the droid's sunken head assembly flying into the air. She was suddenly aware of blue energy behind the next droid like a continuous backdrop although it had to be interrupted bursts of DC-15. Fire. She let the cone rifle drop and drew her lightsaber because she had nothing else left. The blade of blue light sprang into life and she didn't recall touching the control at all. She swept her arm around in a clean arc that brought the mountain of metal down without its legs, tipping like a felled tree to one side of her falling flat on its firing arm and shuddering as its own discharging weapon tore it apart. Hot shrapnel sizzled on her robes and skin but she felt nothing. And she was on her feet now, lightsaber gripped in both hands, point blank with the next droid. She saw two of her squad blasting away from a prone position, while Clanky scrambled to one knee to fire a grenade into the advancing rank of a dozen SBDs. Droids kept advancing. So did clone troopers. And so did she. We're all the same. None of us is thinking. We're just reacting. She fended off a barrage of red fire, whirling and flicking the lightsaber without conscious decision. Each snaz of colliding energy was the first and last. She went on, and on, and on, blocking each shot as if it would never end and the next droid was upon her. She slashed. Cables and alloy fragments showered her. A white gauntlet fist grabbed her shoulder and pulled her bodily out of the way. Bang out, General, the lardy's ready to lift. Clanky almost had to drag her off the pile of shattered droids and shove her into a run toward the gunship. We've done all we can here and the bay's full. Go. Run. She grabbed the cone rifle as she ran back, retracing their line of advance, blind on adrenaline. But at the gunship's platform she still stopped dead, one foot on the edge of the rail, to look back and count men passing her. One to three four troopers, and clanky. All accounted for. She sprang up just as an armored hand gripped hers and yanked her inboard. She had no idea who the trooper was but he was one of hers now. The gunship lifted in a straight vertical so fast that her stomach plummeted back to ground level. The forest and fertile delta plain of Dinlo shrank beneath the ship and grew dark. 
The bay hatches slid forward and slammed shut. Then she was standing in a warehouse of scorched, filthy armor, and a stench of blood and seared flesh. Her primeval survival mechanisms yielded to shaking anticlimax. Clanky pulled off his helmet and their eyes met, an odd moment that was almost a glance in a mirror. She knew that the unblinking wide-eyed shock on his face was exactly what he was seeing on hers. Instinctively, they both reached out to clasp forearms and their grips locked for a second or two. Clanky was also shaking. Then they parted and turned away. It was synchronous. Yes, Satane thought. We're just the same, all of us. It was very, very quiet once she blocked out the thrum of the gunship's drive as it made 660 kilometers per hour off the dial back to Fearless. And no, the IM-6 droid could not deal with 40 men crammed into a modified bay better suited to 30, not if a quarter of them were injured. Then, when Atane listened more carefully and her adrenaline had ebbed, she realized the bay wasn't as quiet as she had thought. There was ragged breathing and stifled yelps of pain and the worst, this incoherent whimpering that peaked to a crescendo of a single stifled scream and trailed off again. She picked her way across the bay, stepping over men who were crouching or kneeling. Propped against the bulkhead, a clone trooper was being held in a sitting position by a brother. His helmet and chest plate were removed and Etain needed no med droid to provide a prognosis for a chest wound that was producing blood on his lips. Medic? She whipped around. Medic! Get this man some help, now. The med droid appeared as if from nowhere, jerking bolt upright from a knot of troopers where it was obviously working. Its twin photoreceptors trained on her. General! Why is this man not being attended to? Triad X, the droid said, dropping down into the unbroken carpet of troopers again to resume its first aid. Attain should have known. The red X symbol glowed on his shoulder. She hoped the man hadn't heard, but he probably knew anyway, because that was the unsentimental way the Kaminoans had presented their training to the clones. Triage Codex, too badly injured. Not expected to survive despite intervention. Concentrate resources on Code 3, then Code 5. She took a breath and reminded herself that she was a Jedi, and there was more to being a Jedi than wielding a lightsaber. She knelt down beside him and grabbed his hand. The grip he returned was surprisingly strong for a dying man. It's okay, she said. She reached out in the force to get some sense of the injury, to shape it in her mind, hoping to slow the hemorrhage and hold shattered tissue together until the lardy docked. But she knew as soon as she formed the scale of the damage in her mind that it wouldn't save him. She had vowed never again to use mind influence on clones without their consent, 
she had eased Aden's grief and given Niner confidence when he most needed it, both unasked for, but since then she had avoided it. Clones weren't weak-minded anyway, whatever people thought. But this man was dying, and he needed help. I'm a taint, she said. She concentrated on his eyes, seeing behind them somehow into a swirl of no color at all, and visualized calm. She held out her hand to the trooper supporting his shoulders and mouthed medbacks at him. She knew they carried single-use syringes of powerful painkiller. Darman had used them in front of her more than once. There's nothing to be afraid of. What's your nickname? Fi, he said, and it shocked her briefly, but there were many men called Fi in an army with numbers for names. His brother said no silently and held up spent syringes. They'd already pumped him full of what little they had. Thank you, ma'am. If she could influence thought, she could influence endorphin systems. She put every scrap of her will into it. The pain's going. The drug's working. Can you feel it? If the force had any validity, it had to come to her aid now. She studied his face, and his jaw muscles were relaxing a little. How's that? Better thanks, ma'am. You hang on. You might feel a bit sleepy. His grip was still tight. She squeezed back. She wondered if he knew she was lying and just chose to believe the lie for his own comfort. He didn't say anything else, but he didn't scream again and his face looked peaceful. She rested his head on her shoulder, one hand between his head and the bulkhead, the other still clutching his, and held that position for ten minutes, concentrating on an image of a cool, pale void. Then he started a choking cough. His brother took his other hand, and Fai a painful reminder of a friend she hadn't seen for months and might never see again said, I'm fine. His grip went slack. Oh, ma'am, said his brother. Attain was aware in a detached way of spending the next twenty minutes talking to every single trooper in that bay, asking their names, asking who had been lost, and wondering why they stared first at her chest and then at her face, apparently bewildered. She put her hand to her cheek. It stung. She brushed it, and a fragment of alloy came away on her hand with fresh, bright blood. She hadn't felt the shrapnel until then. She aimed herself towards a familiar patch of green in the forest of grimy white armor. Clanky, she said numb. Clanky, I never asked. Where do we bury our men? Or do we cremate them, like Jedi? Neither usually, General, said Clanky. Don't you worry about that now. She looked down at her beige robe and noticed that it was way beyond filthy. It was peppered with burns, as if she'd been welding carelessly, and there was a ragged oval patch of deep red blood from her right shoulder down to her belt, already drying into stiff blackness. Master Camus is going to fry me, she said. He can fry us too, then, Clanky said. Etain knew she'd think about the deftly evaded answer to her question sometime but right then her mind was elsewhere. She thought of Darman, suddenly conscious that something was wrong, but something was always wrong for commandos on missions, and the force was clear that Darman was still alive. But the other Phi the trooper wasn't. Atain felt ashamed of her personal fears and went in search of men she could still help. Bravo 8 Depot Crime Scene, Manor I, Coruscant, 367 days after Geonosis. Skirata took every clone casualty as a personal affront. His frustration wasn't aimed at Obram. The two men respected each other in the way of time-served professionals, and Ordo knew that. He just hoped Obram knew that Calbert didn't always mean the sharp things, he said. So when are your people going to get off their shebs and tell us how the device got in here? Skirata said. Soon, Obram said. The security holocom was taken out in the blast. We're waiting on a backup image from the satellite. 
won't be as clear, but at least we have it. Sorry, jailer, Skirata said, still chewing, eyes fixed on the rubble. No offense. I know, comrade. None taken. It was another reason why Ordo adored his sergeant. He was the archetypal Mando ad. A Mandalorian man's ideal was to be the firm but loving father, the respectful son learning from every hard experience, the warrior loyal to constant personal principles rather than ever-changing governments and flags. He also knew when to apologize. And he looked exhausted. Ordo wondered when he would understand that nobody expected him to keep up with young soldiers. You could leave this to me. You're a good lad, Ordike, but I have to do this. Ordo put one hand square on Skirata's back and one on Obram's to steer them both a little farther from the scene of destruction, anxious not to make it obvious in front of the Arotais the non-Mandalorians, the foreigners, sometimes even the traitors that his sergeant needed comforting. Waiting was the worst thing for Calbert's mood. Obram's calm link chirped. Here we go, he said. They're relaying the image. Let's play it out to Ordo's link. The images emerged as a grainy blue aerial hollow rising from the palm of Ordo's gauntlet, and they replayed it a few times. A delivery transport came up to the barrier and was waved into land on the strip. Then the scene erupted in a ball of light followed by billows of smoke and raining debris. The explosion blew out the transparency land granite walls of the Brevo 8 supply depot 15 times before Ordo had seen enough. Looks like the device came in on that delivery transport, Obram said. Some of the recognizable debris scattered around the blast site confirmed that there had been a transport caught up in the explosion. Nobody running away. So the pilot was inside, and... He stopped to look down at Data loading into his own pad. I'm getting confirmation that it was a routine delivery and the pilot was a regular civilian driver. Nothing to suggest that it was a suicide mission, though. Just a routine run with some extra unwanted supplies. Can we go back over the recordings from previous days? Ordo said. Just to see if anyone was doing a recce of vessels and movements in the run-up to this? Archived for ten days. Won't be any better in terms of angle and clarity than this. I'll still take it. Orda looked to Skirata, who was silent and visibly angry, but clearly thinking hard. Ordo knew that calculating defocus all too well. Okay. The best lead we have right now is to track back the other way down the line from confirmed explosive supply chains, Cal said. Omega's on a tie-ups run checking that right now, Bordo said. They might come back with some suspects for Vav to work on. I'm turning a blind eye to that, right? Said Obrim, a man who left the impression he would have given a lot to be back in the front line instead of supervising others. Because suspects are my part of ship to deal with. But I do have this annoying eyesight problem lately. Long-term condition? Skirata asked, moving Ordo out of his way with a gentle pat on the forearm. As permanent as you want it to be, Cal. Make it incurable for the time being, then. Skirata picked his way past the forensics team, who were still setting marker holotags at various points in the rubble. Red holos for body parts, blue for inorganic evidence. Ordo wondered if the civilians who'd been gawking from behind the barrier would see anything about that on the HNE bulletin. Skirata paused and leaned over a Celestin technician who was sensor scanning the rubble on hands and knees. Can I have the armor tallies when you find them? Tallies? The Celestin sat back on her heels and looked up at him with round black liquid eyes. Explain. The little sensor tags that identified the soldier. On the chest plates. Skirata held finger and thumb a little apart to indicate the size. There'll be fifteen around here somewhere. We can sort the admin for you, Cal, Bobram said. 
Don't worry about all that. No, it's not to account for them. I want a piece of their armor. To pay our respects, the Mando way. Ordo noted Obram's puzzled expression. Bodies are irrelevant to us. Which is just as well, really. Obrim nodded gravely and ushered them behind another plastoid screen where the Soko team was assembling and logging fragments of alloy and other barely identifiable materials on a trestle table. You can take over all this if you want. Skirata motioned Ordo across to the trestle. It's Ordo's area, but I'm happy for your people to process it. I've got faith in Celestin diligence. Maybe it was just Skirata indulging in harmless hearts and minds work. But it seemed to do the job for the Soko personnel. One of them looked up. It's good to know that military intelligence respects CSF. I've never been called military intelligence before, Skirata said, as if he hadn't realized that was what he had been doing every waking moment since five days after Geonosis. Ordo held out one hand to the nearest scenes of crime officer and crooked a finger to gesture for their data pad. You'll need this, he said, and linked it to his own pad. Here's our latest IED data. Yes, the CSF's anti-terrorism unit and Skirata's tight-knit team had become very close indeed in the last year. Going through official Republic security clearance channels just wasted time and there was always the chance that civil servants would behave like petty fools across the galaxy and mark data as top secret for their own dreary little career reasons. Ordo didn't have time for that. He was checking that the data had transferred cleanly when the hololink on the inner side of his forearm plate activated again, and his hand was filled with a small scene of blue chaos. For a split second he thought it was an image in his HUD, but it was external and it was Omega Squad. Omega Red Zero, Red Zero, Red Zero, over. The hollow image showed the four commandos pressed against a bulkhead with an occasional fragment of debris floating into view. They were all alive, anyway. Skirata whipped around at the sound of Niner's voice and the code they all dreaded, Red Zero, request for immediate extraction. Ordo switched instantly and without conscious thought into emergency procedure, capturing coordinates from the message and holding up his data pad so that Skirata could see the numbers and open a comm link to fleet. Their language changed, their voices became monotone and quiet, and they slipped into minimal, direct speech. The Soko team froze to watch. Citrap Omega. Targets boarded. Unplanned decompression and our pilot and the TIV are missing. No power, but no squad casualties. Fleet, Skirata here, we have a red zero. Fast extraction please on these coordinates. Pilot down, two, no firm location. Stand by, Omega. We're scrambling fleet assistance now. Time to critical? Ten minutes if we don't get the hatch on the side of us open. Maybe three hours if we do. Skirata stopped, calm link still held to his mouth. Obram was staring at the little blue hologramic figures with the expression of a man realizing something terrible. We could be watching them as they die. Go on, Bordo said. Three suspects the other side of that hatch, and they can't open it now even if they wanted to. Dar's got to blow it. In a confined space? We've got the armor. Well, that was true. Phi had withstood a contact blast from a grenade in Mark II armor. You don't have any choice, do you? We've had worse days, Phi said cheerfully. Ordo knew he meant it. He could feel the other part of him, the Ord I.K. who wanted to cry for his brothers, but he was very distant, as if in another life. There was just absolute cold detachment in the physical shell where his mind was situated now. Do it, he said. The Red Zero's been transmitted to all GR ships in striking distance, Skarada said. 
Ordo didn't want him to watch the hololink in case things didn't go as planned, and turned his back to him. But Skirata turned him around by his arm and stepped into the hollow pickup's field of view so the squad could see him. I'm here, lads. You're coming home, okay? Sit tight. There was a certainty about Skirata regardless of how impossible that assurance sounded in cold reality. But Ordo could feel his utter helplessness, and shared it. Omega was light years from the Coruscant system, far beyond the sergeant's ability to step into the firing line in person. The two soldiers turned together to shield the hollow image, and then Obrim moved in close, diplomatically blocking the view of his own team. Your lad Fi, he said. My boys still want to buy him that drink. It was Obram's men Fi had saved from the Grenade. And that was probably as openly sentimental as Jailer Obram would ever be. In five, Darman said. Four. Like a hollow net drama whose budget hadn't run to a decent set, the image in Ordo's cupped hand showed the squad curling themselves against the far bulkhead, grasping conduit to anchor themselves in zero-g heads tucked to their chests and hunkering down. The image disappeared as Niner whose gauntlet obviously carried the holophy buried his head, too. Three, two, go! The picture flared into a ball of blue light, and the silent explosion looked even more like a poor-quality holovid whose audio track had failed. The hollow image dimmed for a moment, and then the squad's jet packs ignited and they surged forward in free fall, rifles raised, and the video feed broke up into wildly random movement with two more blinding flashes. Okay, three bandits down, not slotted, not fragmented, but not very happy either, said Fai's voice, clearly relieved. And oxygen. Nice one, Omega. Skirata had his eyes shut for a moment. He pinched the bridge of his nose hard enough to leave a temporary white mark. Now take it easy until we get to you, okay? Obram's face was ashen. I wish the public realized what those boys do, he said. I hate criffing secrecy sometimes. Shabu Drotan, Skirata muttered and walked away. No, he didn't care much for the public at all. What's that mean? Obram asked. You don't want to know said Ordo, mulling over Juzik's tenuous analysis of the force around the blast scene. The enemy was never here. So, maybe there was nobody watching. There was nobody waiting for precisely the most damaging moment to detonate the device from nearby. Remote detonation of a moving device required one of two things, either a very good view of the target, or, if the target was invisible, a precise timetable so the terrorists would know exactly where the device might be at any given time. And that meant either a very good knowledge of GR logistics, or if the terrorists wanted to see the whole area, not just the immediate base access to security hollow networks. Ordo felt a sudden cool clarity settle in his stomach, a satisfying sense of having learned something new and valuable. Gentlemen, he said, I think we have them all. R.S. Fearless, hangar deck. Clanky kept a tight grip on Atain's upper arm until she felt the drag of deceleration and the thud through the soles of her boots as the gunship docked in Fearless hangar. By the time she teetered on the edge of the troop bay, somehow more wary of jumping down one meter than ten, Get was waiting, expression carefully blank. The general's got a taste for making shrapnel. Clanky said approvingly. You're instant droid death, aren't you, ma'am? Helmet off, he lowered his voice as he bent his head close to Gitz, but she still heard him. She heard the words rough time. We'd better get you cleaned up, Gitz said. I fear it's the proverbial interview without CAF when we get back to fleet. Commander Gree limped past them with General Vaz G.A both looking smoke-streaked and exhausted. Oh, I don't think so, Vaz Jie said. Well done. Thank you, Fearless. Let me walk this off a little, please, Commander, 
Etienne looked around the hangar deck, now crowded with gunships disgorging men. Medical teams moved in. The smell of burned paint and lube oil distracted her. Anyone want to give me the numbers? Git glanced down at the panel on his left forearm. Impraco Company 4 Kia, 15 wounded, total returned 140 out of 144. Sarlacc A and B Battalions, 1,058 extracted 94 Kia, 215 injured. No MI. 20 torrents deployed and returned. That's 7.5% losses, and most of those were during the Dinlo engagement itself. So I'd call that a result, General. It sounded like a lot of deaths to attain. It was. But most had made it. She had to be content with that. Back to triple zero, then. She'd called it 000 originally the street slang but the troopers had told her that was confusing, and that over a comm link it wouldn't be clear if she meant Coruscant, or was simply using the standard military triple repeat of important data. She decided she liked triple zero better anyway. It made her feel part of that culture. And not before time. Very good, General, Get said. Let me know when you want to refresh yourself and I'll call a steward. Atain didn't want to be back in her cabin on her own, not right now. There was a mirror on the bulkhead above the tiny basin, and she didn't like the idea of looking herself in the eye yet. She wandered around the crowded hangar. The back-to-tanks were going to be fully occupied on the journey home and the clone troopers of the 41st Elite who were trying to find somewhere to get a few hours sleep seemed a different breed from the four almost boys who had been her rough-and-ready introduction to unwanted command on Kalura. Men changed in a year, and these soldiers around her were men. Whatever Navi purity of purpose this Kota, this glory fueled them when they left Kamino for the last time, it had been overwritten by bitter experience. They had seen, and they had lived, and they had lost brothers, and they had talked and compared notes. And they were not the same any longer. They joked, and gossiped, and evolved small subcultures, and mourned. But they would never have a life beyond battle. And that felt wrong. Atain could feel it and taste it as she wandered across the hangar deck, looking for more troopers she might be able to help. The sense of child that had so disoriented her when she first met Darman on Kalura was totally absent. There were two shades of existence that tinted the force in that vast hangar, resignation, and an overwhelming simultaneous sense of both self and community. Atain felt irrelevant. The clones didn't need her. They were confident of their own abilities very centered in whatever identity had evolved despite the Kaminoan belief that they were predictable and standardized units, and they were bonded irrevocably with each other. She could hear the quiet conversations. There was the occasional word of Mandoe, which few ordinary troopers had ever been taught, but had somehow flowed through their ranks from sources like Skarata and Vav. They clung to it. Knowing what she knew about Mandalorians, it made perfect sense. It was the only rationale that could make sense when you were fighting for a cause in which you had absolutely no stake. It was the self-respect of a mercenary, internal, unassailable, and based on skill and comradeship. But mercenaries got paid, and eventually went home, wherever that might be. One trooper was waiting patiently for the medic. He had a triage flash stuck on his shoulder plate, the number. Five, walking wounded. There was blood streaked across his armor from a shrapnel wound to his head, and he was holding his helmet in his lap, trying to clean it with a scrap of rag. Atain squatted down and patted his arm. General? He said. She had so ceased to notice their appearance that it took her a few seconds to see Darman's face in his. They were identical, of course, except for the thousand and one little details that made them all utterly unique. Are you all right? 
Yes, ma'am. What's your name, and not your number, okay? Nye. Well, Nye, here you go. She handed him her water bottle. Apart from two lightsabers her own and her dead master's her concussion rifle, and her comm link, it was the only item she was carrying. I have nothing else I can give you. I can't pay you, I can't promote you, I can't give you a few days R&R, and I can't even decorate you for valor. I'm truly sorry that I can't. And I'm sorry that you're being used like this and I wish I could put an end to it and change your lives for the better. But I can't. All I can do is ask your forgiveness. Nye seemed stunned. He looked at the bottle and then took a long swig from it, his expression suddenly one of blissful relief. It's... Okay, General. Thank you. She was suddenly aware that the hangar deck had fallen completely silent no mean feet given the vast space and the numbers of men packed in it and everyone was listening. The unexpected audience actually made her face burn, and then a little ripple of applause went through the ranks. She wasn't sure if that meant they agreed, or that they were just being supportive of an officer who now that she had some embarrassing clarity of mind looked like a walking nightmare and was clearly having trouble dealing with the aftermath of battle. CAF and a change of clothes, General, Get said looming over her from nowhere. You'll feel a lot better after a few hours sleep. Git was a gracious commander and a perfectly competent naval officer. He ran the ship. He was, to all intents and purposes, the commanding officer. She wasn't. And had he been born to a family on Coruscant or Corellia or Alderaan, he would have had a glittering career. But he'd been hatched in a tank on Kamino and so his artificially shortened life would be very different because of that. When she got back, she would seek out Cal Scarada and beg him to help her make sense of it all. She would find Omega Squad and tell them face to face how much she cared about them before it was too late. She would tell Darman that most of all. She never stopped thinking of him. You meant what you said, General, Get said, steering her back toward her cabin. Oh, yes. I did. I'm glad. However powerless you feel, solidarity means a great deal to us. She suddenly wanted to see Git go home to a house full of family and friends, and wondered if she wanted it for him or for herself. I was once taught to see while blindfolded, she said. It was a far more important lesson than I ever imagined. At the time, I thought it was just a way of teaching me to strike with my lightsaber using the Force alone. Now I know what purpose the Force had. I look beyond faces. But you won't change anything by blaming yourself. No. You're right. But I won't change anything by pretending I have no responsibility either. At that point she knew as surely as she had ever known anything that the Force had lifted her from one existence, turned her around, and dropped her on another path. She could change things. She wouldn't change them immediately, and she couldn't change them for any of the men here, but she would somehow change the future for men like this. If it's any comfort, General, I'm not sure what we'd do if we weren't doing this, Get said. And you do get to hear an awful lot of good jokes. He touched his fingers to his brow and left her at her cabin. They actually found things to laugh about even surrounded by pain and death. Get had that understated, inventive, and irreverent humor that seemed common to anyone in uniform. If you couldn't take a joke, apparently, you shouldn't have joined. She'd heard Omega quote that Skirata line more than once. You had to be able to laugh or else the tears would ambush you. Attain stared at the dried blood on her robes and, while the memory appalled her, she couldn't bring herself to obliterate it by rinsing it away. She shoved the garment under the mattress of her bunk, shut her eyes, and then didn't even recall lying down. She woke with a start. She woke, 
and then the ship changed course and picked up speed, she felt it. That hadn't woken her. Some disturbance in the force had. Darman. She could feel the very slight vibration that told her fearless drives were straining flat out. She sat up and swung her legs over the side of the bunk, rubbing a painful cramp from her calves. A clean set of robes was hanging on a peg behind the hatch door of her cabin. She had no idea where the crew had acquired them, but she washed her face in the basin and looked up at last at the small mirror to see the scratched, ashen, rapidly aging face of a stranger. But at least she could meet her own eyes now. She pulled on the clean robes and was pocketing both her own lightsaber and master cast fuliers which she always carried out of sheer sentimentality and pragmatic caution when there was the sound of boots padding down the passage outside. Someone rapped on the hatch. She eased it open using the force. It was reassuring to know she wasn't too beaten to do that. General? Get said. He handed her a mug of CAF, remarkably relaxed for a man whose ship was clearly driven by new urgency. Sorry to disturb you so soon. That's very kind of you, Commander. She took the CAF and saw her hands shaking. I felt something. What's wrong? I took a liberty, General. I hope you won't be offended, but I overrode your orders. She couldn't imagine that ever bothering her. She'd once ordered Darman to do that if he ever felt she was screwing up. The clones knew their trade far better than she ever would. Yet you know I trust you implicitly? I've diverted the ship to the Tinnis sector. We received a Red Zero call and I thought you'd really want to respond. An extra day or so isn't going to make any difference to the survival rate of casualties now. Red Zero An emergency command for all vessels to respond to a disaster of some kind, something very serious indeed. Even extracting the 41st hadn't been a Red Zero signal. I'd always give a Red Zero top priority, too. Good call, Get. Thought you might. He watched her drain the cup and held out his hand to take it. Especially because this one's from Omega Squad. They're in very deep dwang, General. Darman, she thought. The Force always made sure she got the most important intel after all. Dar. Four. Delta Squad to Fleet Ops. Responding to Red Zero. Position, Shaken. Sector, ETA, 1 Standard Hour 40. Can assist, medical and oxygen. Please. Note, deploying in requisition Nymoidian vessel. No defensive. Capacity. Repeat, negative armament. Strongly advise any GAR vessels to. Ping transponder before opening fire. Be aware that separatist traffic in. Sector has increased in last 20 minutes in response to fleet movements. Prep for unwanted company. Signal received at fleet ops. Passed to Milant N11 Captain Ordo and acknowledged. Vessels responding now, fearless, majestic, and impounded enemy shuttle. Advised to assume extraction may be opposed. 367 days after Geonosis. It was cold and pitch black in the cockpit, but it certainly beat being dead. Phi kept his suit temperature at the bare minimum to conserve power. He flicked on his spot lamp briefly and checked the trust and shivering suspects who were lying against the deck, a human, and disturbingly to Nikto. Phi had only seen Nikto in obscure databases devoted to identifying the best part of their anatomy to aim at to stop them dead. They were tough. Intel said they could defeat Jedi. They were even rumored to have a weapon that could deflect and destroy a lightsaber blade. Maybe Jedi needed to tool up with pep lasers then. 
and all the prisoners had tested positive for explosives residue when Darman had run his sensor over them. With the intel and the heavily encrypted data on their pads, the three looked like being dead to rights, as Scarato would say. But it was a long way from being satisfied that they'd snatched the right people to actually extracting useful information from them. Phi took his thermoplastifol survival blanket from his backpack and folded it carefully over the human, who seemed to be more affected by cold than the Nikto. Losing a suspect to hypothermia after going to all this trouble to grab them wasn't an option. Wrapping a body wasn't an easy maneuver in zero-g, but at least he'd stopped feeling sick. The ultralight plastiful kept drilling away every time the man shuddered. Phi sighed and took out his universal solution to any problem, a roll of thick adhesive tape, and hooked his leg around the handrail to stop himself floating while he tore off lengths. He taped the blanket to the suspect. Then he secured the truss suspects to the deck with more of the tape. It was amazing how handy tape could be. And don't ask me to tuck you in and read you a story? The human just stared balefully at him. He had a lovely black eye now from resisting Darman a little too vigorously. They never have happy endings. The man's ID said Far Orgel, but nobody took that too seriously. He was about thirty, fine blonde hair, sharp features, very pale blue eyes. The Nikto claimed to be Mtruli and Jiwaiske, or at least their mining licenses did, because none of the suspects was talking. Asopia's standard operating procedures said they had to stop prisoners from talking to each other before processing. But SOPs hadn't allowed for the little complication of running out of air before an interrogator could be found. Niner turned his head slightly to Orgel. You can talk to us. Or you can wait until Sergeant Vav sits you down with a nice cup of CAF and asks you to tell him your life story. He's a good listener and you'll really want to talk to him. There was no response. Apart from the brief curses and grunts of pain they'd emitted when Omega stormed the cockpit and subdued them Phi loved military understatement none of the suspects had said a single word, not even name, rank, or serial number. And of course, the two who were dry frozen somewhere in the vacuum of space weren't going to provide many answers of their own free will, either. Look, shall I try to get some information out of these gentlemen just in case the taxi doesn't get here before our air runs out? Fi asked. We're not trained to interrogate prisoners, said Niner. Fi maneuvered himself above the human. He didn't know what Nikto felt or feared, and suspected that it wasn't much, but he knew plenty about his own species' vulnerabilities. I could improvise. No, you'll bounce off the bulkheads, expend too much oxygen, and then we'll have to slot them to preserve the supply for us. It can wait. Vav isn't going anywhere, and neither are they. Niner was reclining in the pilot's chair, restraining belt buckled and staring straight ahead. The blue-lit tee of his visor was reflected in the transparent steel viewscreen, making him look wonderfully droid-like. Phi wasn't sure if Niner was simply saying coldly brutal things to intimidate the prisoners or not. Phi wasn't entirely sure whether he was really joking some of the time. War was nothing personal. But somehow Phi felt differently about people who didn't carry a rifle and who didn't kill in honest combat. They were an invisible enemy. Fearfec, even droids stood up where you could see them. He put it out of his mind with a conscious effort, and not only because Ordo had insisted on undamaged prisoners. He knew how to kill, and he knew how to resist pain, but he wasn't sure how to inflict it deliberately. But he was pretty sure that Vav did. He'd leave the job to him. Darman had positioned himself against the bulkhead with his legs stretched out. He looked asleep. Arms folded. Had lowered, his point of view icon in Phi's HUD showed only an image of his belt and lap. Dar could sleep anywhere, anytime. At one point he flinched, 
as if someone had said something to him, but there was nothing audible on the comm link. Aden belted into the co-pilot's seat, worked on the assortment of data pads, data sticks, and sheets of flimsy that he'd taken from the suspect's dead and alive and prodded probes into data ports, doing what he seemed to enjoy best, slicing, hacking, and generally dismantling things. Niner occasionally reached out to grab any of his prizes that floated free. Phi propelled himself forward with a gentle push against the deck and offered his roll of tape. Aden managed a smile and trapped the wayward components on the sticky side, securing the other end on Niner's left forearm plate. Phi, you know I don't mean it, don't you? Niner said suddenly. When I get on your back about stuff, I'm just venting steam. It took Phi aback. Sarge, I think the first thing you ever did was to tear me off a strip, and we're still brothers, aren't we? You're just like Sergeant Cal. He never meant any of it, either. Did you see the state of him on the hololink? He looked pretty exhausted. Poor beer, he never stops worrying. Phi paused. It was the first time he'd ever heard Niner use the word bear openly, father. Phi preferred to see everyone burying their fears in wisecracks. This was all too raw. We could be dead in two hours. Well, we've been there a few times before. He shrugged, desperately seeking the other part of him that always had the smart answer ready. I don't know about you, Vode but I'm planning on getting back to base because Obram still owes me a drink. And your free war of nuts. So Darman wasn't asleep, then. Fearfeck, I keep getting this weird feeling like someone's here next to me. It's me, Dar. But don't ask me to hold you hand. Decut. He unfolded his arms slowly and turned to Aten. At IK, if you can't decrypt that data... Why not just try to send the whole memory back down the hololink as is? That's what I'm doing, Aden said without looking up. The only light in the compartment now was the blue glow from their helmets. Fi noted that Aden had his night vision filter in place to see the small ports on the data pads. You're right. I can't crack the encryption here but I can dump the data down the link now and let Ordo play with it if I can override the anti-tampering. Otherwise, it'll just delete everything on here. Ten minutes, maybe? I'm not letting this beat me. Niner eased himself out of the seat and gave Aten a pat on the shoulder as he floated past him. I'm going to keep the hololink open. Time to update fleet on our rate of drift anyway. They had nothing to say at the moment and the link was a power drain that they might regret later if things didn't pan out quite as they were hoping. But Phi understood. Cal Scarato would be going crazy not being able to keep an eye on them at a time like this. It was what he always, always said when things got tough, I'm here, son. He felt he had to be there for them. And he always had been. There was exactly the right word. Phi had no idea how he had managed to keep faith with more than a hundred commandos. The link flared into blue light again. Ordo appeared, in full armor and looking away formed the cam. He must have been at Fleet HQ, then, to be working with his helmet on like that, and the hollow unit must have been placed in his desk. Omega here, Niner said. Captain, mind if we keep the link open until further notice? You okay? Bored, Sarge, said Phi. Well, you won't be bored much longer. Majestic and Fearless are on their way, ETA under two hours dash. Good old ma'am, Niner said. But you'll probably have help sooner, because Delta Squad are in transit. Oh, we'll never hear the last of this. You haven't met them yet, son. Heard enough. Rough, rude boys, Fi said. 
and rather full of themselves. Yes, but they have oxygen, a functioning drive, and they're just gagging to get to you first. So play nicely with them. Skirata moved into the Hololink's visual range and sat down on Ordo's desk, swinging one leg, his injured one. He looked the way he always looked on training exercises, grim, focused, and constantly chewing something. Oh, and don't open fire. They're driving a SEP ship. How did they get hold of that? Not that the cannon on this crate is working now anyway. Well, I don't think the SEP pilot was keen to part with it, but maybe they promised that they'd bring it back when they were finished. Fi cut in again. Anyone looking for Sicko, Sarge? RTIV pilot? We'll keep you posted. Skirata glanced at Ordo as if he'd said something. Aten, son, you know Vav's back, don't you? Aten paused for a second and then carried on tapping a probe on the entrails of a dismantled data pad. He nodded to himself. Yes, Sarge. I noted that. You're coming back to Brigade HQ when we get you out of there. But you steer clear of him, okay? You hear me? Fi was riveted. Aten had never said a word about Vav, other than that he was hard, but his reactions were telling. He didn't even look toward the hollow image. I promise, Sarge. Don't worry. I'll be around to make sure, too. Aten inhaled audibly, a sign that usually meant he was either exasperated or burying his anger. Fi thought better of asking which. Niner detached the hollow emitter and pick up from his forearm plate, unlatched the small disc from inside the wrist section and stuck it on the flat shelf that ran along the freighter's console with a rolled-up piece of tape. The hollow image of Ordo and Skirata was silent, as was Omega. There was nothing more to discuss. Just having that visual link was enough to comfort everyone. It was a long, silent half-hour. Maybe Darman slept and maybe he didn't, but Fi suspected he was just thinking. Aden's ten-minute estimate had stretched somewhat, but he plowed on, head down, completely focused. Aden was exactly what he was. Not. Stubborn. As Basic translated the word, a negative refusal to change. But Aden in the Mando a sense courageously persistent, tenacious, the hallmark of a man who would never give up or give in. Eventually, he let out a breath. Sorted. He leaned forward to connect the data port to the hololink. Downloading now. Plus Dar's explosives profiling and some images of the prisoners. Sorry we didn't get pictures of the dead ones, but they wouldn't look too cute now anyway. All yours, Captain. That's my boy, Skarada said. Well, he was now. He wasn't Vav's batch any longer. They all settled back and relaxed as best they could. Fi could hear it in his helmet. They were breathing in unison now, slow and shallow. Ordo disappeared from the hollow image, no doubt to take the prize data somewhere else to crack it. Skirata simply stayed where he was, occasionally turning to check a screen behind him. After an hour, he spoke again. Update position and intended movement, Omega. Fearless on station in 43 minutes, Majestic 59. Delta 35. They're so competitive and macho, Fi said. We're going to have to teach them how to relax. There was a brief snort of amusement from Darman's audio, and then everyone was silent again. The three prisoners shifted from time to time. The human far orgel was shuddering uncontrollably in the cold despite being wrapped like a roasting joint of nerf in all four of the squad's emergency plastiful blankets. Condensation was forming on the bulkhead next to Fi and he ran his gloved fingertip across it, making the moisture bead and run. 
It was just as well that the vessel's electrical power was down. It would be shorting out by now. And just when things were going so well all things considered Skirata jumped upright from the desk and rushed out of camp shot. When he came back seconds later it was clear something had gone Asakla, as he always put it badly wrong. Omega, you've got company. There's a set vessel on an intercept course with you, unidentified but armed and going fast. Have you any power at all you can divert to cannon? Are you certain it's offline? Niner swallowed hard. The problem with a shared helmet com link was that you heard your brother's every reaction, even the ones you really didn't want to. It was one reason why they checked each other's biosign readouts only when they had to. We blew all the power relays to trigger the emergency bulkheads, Sarge. It's dead. Skarada paused for a heartbeat. Their ETA at that speed is 35 minutes. Add Ike, I'm sorry, Dash. It's okay, Sarge, Niner said. He sounded flat calm now. Just tell Delta not to stop for CAF, okay? You couldn't defend yourself against cannon with a DC-17, not in a sealed and crippled section of a slowly drifting ship. Phi hadn't found himself helpless for a long time. He knew he wasn't going to handle it well. Darman looked up suddenly. He hadn't reacted at all to the grim news until then. He turned to face Phi, just a ghostly blue T-shaped light on the other side of the cockpit. I don't want to throw any more cold water on this party, he said. But has anyone thought through the logical sequence of this extraction? Because I bet Delta has. Arias Fearless, time to target. Twenty minutes commander get leaned over the ops room trooper, the one he called Piwo. It had taken Etain a while to realize that he called all the men who took watches at that console Piwo. It was simply an acronym for Principal Weapons Officer. The man's name was actually Ten. Ten's face was blank with total concentration, thrown into sharp relief by the yellow light from the screens in front of him. There it is, he said. The separatist ship appearing on the tracking screen as a visibly shifting red pulse was now within their scanning range. Omega's wasn't, although Ten had programmed in a blue marker that corresponded with their last position and projected drift. How many minutes are we still behind them? Atain asked. If Ten didn't like having a commander and a general breathing down his neck, he showed no sign of it. Atain admired his ability to ignore distractions, even without a little force help from her. He didn't seem to need it. Five, maybe four if the velocities hold constant. Now, what's that? Get said. A smaller target had appeared on the screen, first red, then blue, then flashing red with a cursor saying unconfirmed. Set drive profile, but the scan is probably detecting a GR. Encrypted transponder, Ten said. I think we can guess who's in the driver's seat there. Wasn't Delta carrying out a rummage of prosecutor? Get asked. I gather they had expected visitors. Doesn't Delta file full contact reports? Atain interrupted. No more detail than they have to, I understand, Get said. Silent ops. I think they get out of the habit of talking to the regular forces side of things. Perhaps General Juzik might have a word with them. Delta, like Omega, was part of Juzik's battalion, 05 Commando, which was one of ten in the Special Operations Brigade commanded by Etain's former master, Arligan Zay. A year before, there had been two brigades. Casualties had slashed their strength in half. And like all the commando squads, Delta was utterly self-reliant and operated largely without command, merely receiving intelligence support and a broad objective. 
It was the kind of command that was ideal for a very smart but inexperienced general. And there was no other way for one Jedi to run 500 Special Forces men, clones led clones, as they did in the regular GR. So Delta did more or less as they pleased within the overall battle plan. Fortunately, it seemed to please them to be blisteringly efficient, a quality Atane noted and respected in every clone soldier she met. Get me a link to them, Commander, she said. I need to talk to them. As do you, I have no idea how they're going to play this. Ged just raised his eyebrows and turned to the signals officer to request a secure link via fleet. It took 30 seconds. There were 18 minutes to target. Time was running out. Ten moved his seat a little so Ged could place the hololink transmitter on the console where they could see both the link and the tracking screen. Delta, this is General Termukin Fearless. The image that shimmered before her showed one man in a familiar suit of Katarn armor, squatting with a DC-17 across his thighs. The blue light distorted natural color, but the dark patches on his armor suggested red or orange identity markings. RC-1138, General, receiving. It was time for names. Your boss. Yes, General, boss. Our ETA is 14 to 15 minutes. You don't have any armament, do you? No, and we're aware that there's another SEP ship right up our shebs that does. Boss appeared to check himself. Apologies for the language, General. But you're the ones carrying the cannon. Boss, how do you plan to execute this? That you first get them... That usually works pretty well. She bristled, but she knew that wasn't fair to him. Could you be more specific? Okay, we get alongside, access the cockpit, seal against vacuum, and extract personnel. Access means a big bang, yes? No. Scorch would usually love that, but this is a cutting job if you want those prisoners alive because that'll mean an instant decompression. If you don't want them alive, then that's easier. Omega has enough air, so their suits are still good for another 20 minutes in vacuum. In that case, we just blow the cockpit view screen and haul them out. Boss had his helmet cocked slightly to one side as if he was asking her to make a command decision. He was. It was the mission objective versus Omega's safety. And that's what command is all about. Atain suspected this was where she finally stopped playing at being a general. Omega didn't have to survive, but a few terrorists who might hold the key to a wider terror network did. Accessing the cockpit carefully with cutting equipment would take more time, time that might mean the SEP ship arrived before Omega was safe and clear. Her personal choice was immediate. But she wavered over the professional one. She was aware of Git glancing at her, and then looking down at something of overwhelming interest on the deck. Boss showed unusual diplomacy for a squad that had a name for being unsubtle. He wasn't blind. He could see her as well as she could see him, and he probably saw a child out of her depth. General, I've spoken to Niner, he said. He's clear. They're all clear. This is as close as we've come to grabbing some key players for a long, long time, and it probably cost their pilot his life as well. We have to make prisoner retrieval the priority. We all know the game by now. It's a risk for us, too. We might all get vaped. I know you're correct, Atain said. But none of you is expendable as far as I'm concerned and I know you'll do everything you can to get them out alive. General, is that an order, and if so, what is it? Extract Omega and abandon the prisoners? Or what? She felt her stomach fall. 
It was relatively easy to be the commander who held a trooper as he was dying. It was much, much harder to stand there and say yes, rescue three terrorists, and let my friends die, let Darman die if that's what it takes. Had they asked Skirata? What did he say? Git touched her arm and indicated the tracking screen. He held up three fingers. Three minutes behind the SEP vessel now. They were gaining on them. Extract the prisoners, Atain said. It was out of her mouth before she could think further. And we'll be right behind you. Unnamed commercial freighter, drifting 3,000 clicks core side of Perlemian node. Red Zero first responder ETA six minutes Phi studied his data pad and considered his brief and busy one-year career as an elite commando. He'd fought at Geonosis. He'd taken out a SEP research base, nearly slotted his beloved Sergeant Cal, and ended the careers of 85 assorted SEPs and more droids than he bothered to count. And he denied the CIS an awful lot of assets from replenishment depots to a capital ship and a fighter squadron that didn't even have the chance to fly its first sortie. Some of it had been fun, most of it had been a grim hard slog, and all of it had been frightening. And now the cheerful euphemism was over. He was probably going to die. And he didn't want Skirata to witness that. He looked up from the expired op orders on his data pad and saw that the hull image of Skirata was still much as it had been for the best part of two hours. Sergeant Cal waited. He wouldn't leave. Niner continued to stare out the view screen. Then he sat bolt upright, prevented from shooting forward by the restraining belt. Phi checked his viewpoint icon and saw he had activated his electro-binocular visor. Visual contact, Niner said quietly. Fearfec, it really is a sep crate. Nymoidian. The whole squad maneuvered so they could see what he was looking at. About time, Niner said. Phi listened in. Delta, Niner here. You been sightseeing? Boss receiving. Sorry. We had to stop and ask for directions. He had a voice very like Otten's but with a stronger accent. My boys are now going to show you how to do an extraction properly, so take notes because you might blink and miss it. There's a SEP ship with missiles up the spout about three minutes behind us. Can we bring some friends? The more the merrier. We're going to align with your cockpit. Slap an isolation seal on the viewport, and Scorch will cut through. Then you shift it fast, and we RV with Fearless for CAF, Cakes, and Hero Worship. Got it? Copy that. I love emotional reunions, Phi said. And Hero Worship. Boss, that sep's getting awfully close. Another voice. Phi couldn't identify any of them yet. This might have to beat the galactic record. How close? Close enough to make me mad? They could launch a missile in two minutes and it'd singe your shebs overtaking us. Okay. Close. Omega, you heard the man. Boss sounded unperturbed. Powder your noses and get ready to party. Fearfec Fi thought. He rolled carefully to peel Orgel off the deck and haul him upright for a hasty exit with jetpack assist. The human prisoner looked straight at him. And he spoke. You're really not very good at this, are you? Now you decide to get chatty. We'll all be charcoal in a few minutes, and that gives me some satisfaction. Okay, I'm now really motivated to introduce you to Sergeant Vav. Whoa, cut it out, Darman said. One of the Nikto tried to gore him with its short horns as he lifted it ready for escape. Ungrateful D-cut. He brought his helmet hard down in its face in a perfect headbutt. Only the pilot's seat stopped them from being catapulted by the inertia of the impact. Darman looked around at the other Nikto. Want some? 
You DCI boys, you DCI. Niner raised his dees. Push comes to shove, we only need one of them alive, so next one to look like a safety risk isn't going home. Okay? The small Mimoidian assault vessel now filled their field of vision as it came to Nestle partly across the freighter's view screen. Fi watched, mesmerized. A hatch opened and something distressingly reminiscent of a wide-mouthed worm emerged and sucked against the transparent steel. A familiar blue light loomed from the darkness of its maw. Through the plate, Fi saw a helmet very like his and an exaggerated thumbs-up gesture. Stand back and watch a pro at work, said a disembodied voice on the comlink. For a second, Fi thought Scorch was attaching a frame charge. Yeah, that's... Clever, I don't think. But the large ring of alloy pipes sat snugly on the plate and began to glow white-hot. Scorch's thumbs-up became a jerked move-away gesture. Scorch, sooner rather than later, okay? Boss's voice said. One minute, Tops. We haven't got a minute, Dash. What you want me to do, chew through it? Niner gathered up the hololink and snapped it back on his forearm plate. Aden shoved data pads and tools in his belt. Tell you what, shall we just float here and panic incoherently while we're waiting? Fi said. Good idea. Scorch said unmoved. Very good idea, panicking, Boss said. Guess what I just eyeballed from the port side screen. Arius Fearless, Ops Room, ETA to target. Two minutes the assault ship had to decelerate to drop from hyperspace and open fire. It cost critical time. Atain watched while Ten made rapid calculations to see if they could find that single critical firing solution that balanced losing speed with firing missiles and would not only make up those seconds, but also take out the SEP ship before it had a chance to target Omega. The ops room was crowded with white armor and yet utterly silent as fearless crew watched the tracking screen repeater on the bulkhead. It mirrored what Ten, Get, and Atain could see in smaller format at the PWO's station. Ten didn't seem to have blinked in the last three minutes. Firing solution, General. His hand rested on the firing key, his gaze welded to the screen. Target acquired. Best solution we're going to get and our window is ten seconds or we'll take out Omega and Delta, too. Now, General? Atain glanced at Get, her mind partly sensing the ripples in the Force. And the Force agreed with Ten to the very second. Take it, Tennessee. Yes, ma'am. The key made a small snipping noise as he depressed it. Fire one, fire two. Missiles away dash. Two huge trails of savage energy sped away from the decelerating assault ship and into the void. Atain could feel too much imminent disaster in the force. She didn't want to watch it as well. She cupped her hands over her nose and shut her eyes for a second, and then made herself look back at the screen. The tracking screen followed the missiles as steady white lines. They looked as if they had overlapped the pulsing red point of light that was the separatist fighter. All the traces winked out of existence at the same time. Splash one, said a trooper at another station. Visual confirmation. Target destroyed. And who else? Commander get asked? Woa. Fi wasn't certain if it was his own cry of shock or Scorch's voice in his comlink, but he saw the ball of white and gold flame expanding toward them, silhouetting the section of Nimi's ship that partly obscured the shield, and he ducked instinctively. A hailstorm of debris rained on the screen. Something large and metallic skidded along the casing of the freighter with a long, dull screech. Fi straightened up as the hammering faded to the occasional rattle, like stones being tossed onto a roof. Then it stopped completely. Fear effect, Scorch said. Now, 
If they'd only added a spot of meranium to the warhead, it would have burned a really pretty purple. Fearless, fearless, fearless calling Delta. Are you clear? Repeat, are you clear? Respond. A large rectangle of hot softened glass peeled slowly away from the screen, helped by Scorch's fist, and drifted off serenely into a silent, slow-motion collision with the headrest of the pilot's seat. Delta here, fearless. Just extracting Omega and cargo now. Five fought to stop himself from sounding breathless and shaky. It would let the squad down. I'm glad the Navy's here, he said. Because if it had been down to you, Grease Lightning, we'd be an asteroid belt by now. Scorch's visor poked through the aperture at last, followed by his arm, and he made an unmistakable gesture of displeasure. Fi felt his mouth take over, fueled by shock. My hero! You finally made it. You want to walk back to base? Niner lifted the plastifo-wrapped ordral with one hand and lined him up with the opening. Fi's going to give his mouth a nice rest now and help me cross-deck the garbage. Gift wrapped? Ah, uh, you shouldn't have. Scorch hauled himself a little farther down the access tube and hung motionless at 135 degrees, assessing the three bound prisoners. Feet first, please. Then if the Dika tries to kick out I can break his legs. Don't want this tubing breached. It proved harder than expected. But by the time the second Nikto had been rammed up into the connecting tube like a torpedo, the warm air from the hijacked Nymoidian vessel had worked its way into the freighter cockpit and made Fi feel a lot more comfortable. He stood back to let Otten and Darman make their way up the tube. Scorch hauled Darman inboard by his webbing. Fi waited for his boots to disappear and then rolled to peer up the aperture into a circle of dim light. Next! Fi lined up and then pushed off with one boot. As he passed through the open hatch at the other end, he felt artificial gravity seize him, and he rolled onto the deck with a clatter of armor plates. It took him a few seconds to get to his feet. Niner collided with him from behind. It wasn't a very big ship. Boss's armor daubed with chipped and peeling orange paint slammed the hatch behind Niner and sealed it. Niner stared at him as if he wasn't sure what should happen next and then the two men simply shook hands and slapped each other on the back. Like what we've done with the place, Boss said, taking off his helmet. The flight deck looked as if someone had been dismantling it the hard way. Panels had been ripped out, wires hung from the deckhead, and there were empty slots in the console where units had either been removed or not installed in the first place. Okay. Perhaps it's a little basic, but we call it home. You nick this? No, they let us take it on a test drive. Boss gestured at the rest of his brightly painted squad. Fixer Sev, and you already know Scorch. Say hello to the boys in Boring Black. Thanks, Vode, Vi said. He wondered why Otten wasn't joining in. He had turned away and seemed to be taking a technical interest in a run of conduit. Any word on Sicko? If that's your pilot, Majestic's been diverted now. They picked up his beacon and that's all we know. Boss looked down at the three prisoners, lined up on the deck like corpses. He gave each of them a nudge with his boot. You'd better be worth everyone's effort. Fi eased off his helmet and inhaled almost fresh air. Except for Scorch, they had all taken off their helmets. Delta was one of fewer than a dozen squads that had survived intact since decanting, a true pod as the Kaminoans had called it, and they seemed to think that made them an elite within an elite. They had been raised and trained together, and they had never fought with anyone but their brothers. It was a luxury few squads now enjoyed. Fi suspected it meant they didn't play well with others. He remembered only too well how ferociously competitive and inward-looking his own pod had been, 
and how badly his confidence had been dented when he lost his brothers at Geonosis and was then dumped in Niner's care. You do okay for a mongrel squad, Sev said, and Fi chose not to react. He knew he was on autopilot now and that he should shut up. Niner's glance helped him decide. I don't suppose you did a rummage on that ship, did you? Not with a rapid decompression on our hands, no, said Niner. Word was that it was carrying explosives. Okay, we're going to be coated in seps anytime now, so let's get this crate into fearless hangar and then they can blow the freighter. If there's anything useful in it, at least the seps don't get it. Darman slid down a bulkhead onto the deck, and Niner sat down beside him. They were nearly back aboard Fearless, and that meant they were nearly home, and home meant Arca Company barracks and at last a good night's sleep after two months on patrol. Fi never got enough. None of them ever did. And fatigue could make you dangerously careless. So, Otten. He wandered up behind Otten and stood close enough to be annoying. Otten didn't turn around. Sergeant Vav asked to see you again, VOD IKA. I'm not your little brother, Otten said quietly. He kept his back to Sev. I just work with you. Ah, uh, so there was some history between those two. Fi bristled. He rallied to his adopted brother. He could see that the prospect of actually meeting Vav again was stoking something inside that wasn't typically Aten. Sev didn't let up. I don't forget, you know. This time Aten did wheel around, face to face with Sev, so close that Fi thought his placid brother was actually going to lose it for once. He prepared to intervene. It's my business, Aten said. Stay out of it. Sev stared into his face. And disagreements stay inside the company. Aden hooked his fingers in the neck of his bodysuit and yanked it down to the left as far as the edge of the armor, exposing his collarbone. He had a lot of raised white scars. Nobody took much notice of them because injuries in training and combat were so common that they rarely drew comment. You got worse than that, did you? You spent a week in Bacta, did you? Aden looked about to snap, and Fi stepped forward to intervene. Then Niner was across the cabin in three strides and slammed in between the two men. He had to break them up by putting his arms between them and knocking them apart with his arm plates. But Sev's unblinking gaze was still fixed on Aten as if Niner weren't there. I think we all need to reach a comradely understanding. Niner said, blocking Sev with his body. Back at the barracks, if that's okay with you, Niviodi. Sev looked murderous. His eyes were still fixed on Aten's. Anytime, VODIK. Okay, you two can shut it now. And you, Fi. Stand down. We've all had a bad day, so let's throttle back on the testosterone and play nicely. Sev held his hands away from his sides in a gesture of reluctant submission and went to sit beside Scorch in the cockpit. Boss didn't say a word, but Niner grabbed Fi and Otten by their shoulders and shoved them farther away. You're going to tell me what that's all about. No, I'm not, Sarge. It's personal. There's no personal where this squad is concerned. Later, okay? I'm not having you brawling like a pair of civvies. If there's a needle match between you two, we all sort it together. Got it? Yes, Sarge. Niner emphasized his warning with a prod in Aten's chest and moved back to stand with Boss while Scorch brought the vessel alongside Fearless and began negotiating with the flight deck controller on how they might make space in the hangar for it. Fi waited with Aten in case he decided to resume his little chat with Sev. He had never seen Aten flare up even under the most extreme pressure, 
but he seemed ready to swing at anyone now. And even a brain-dead weak way could have spotted that it had something to do with Vav. At IK, you want to tell me about it sometime? Not really. Aden patted Fi on the shoulder. I have to deal with it myself sooner or later. Fi glanced at Sev and got a blank stare that wasn't even hostility, just an absence of anything comradely. It wasn't going to be a bundle of laughs if they ever had to work together again. Fi hadn't thought he would get on with Niner on first meeting either. But there had never been anything about Niner that had made Fi want to punch him in the face and get it over with, just to save time. It was going to happen, sooner or later. Fi knew it. He never had a disagreement, let alone a fight, with a brother before. It made him uneasy. He distracted himself with dreams of a hot shower, hot food, and the luxury of five hours unbroken sleep. 5. To Officer Commanding So BC, HQ Coruscant, SEAL Fleet Protection Group. From SEAL Majestic, off Calaria, 367 days after Geonosis. I regret to inform you that we have recovered the wreckage of TIV. Z590-1 and the body of pilot CT1127-549. Perlemian traffic control reports that Republic civilian freighter Nova Crystal logged that it fired on a vessel it described as a pirate, attacking its convoy to dislodge it from the hull. I also regret that due to security restrictions, I am unable to tell PTC that the freighter killed a special forces pilot on active service, and so PTC regard Nova Crystal's skipper to be something of a hero. Fleet Ops HQ, Coruscant 0600, 368 days after Geonosis, the first anniversary of the battle. Skirata walked out of the fleet ops lobby and into a cool, moist morning that he wasn't expecting to welcome. It was over, for the time being. Omega had survived, and they were coming home. They needed a break from continuous deployment in the Badlands, and he was certain they were needed here. CSF couldn't handle a big terror operation in the capital system, not even with Obram around. The question was how to work that past Arligan Zay. The Jedi was reluctant to commit men to what he saw as security work at a time like this. But it was what Ordo and the Nulls were ideally suited for if they had a few commandos to deploy as well. Skirata stood on the steps for a few minutes inhaling fresh air, eyes stinging from fatigue and raked his fingers through his crew cut. He could sleep now. Omega was safe, Ordo was here with him, and his five brothers were accounted for, safe and well. Meriel was on Kamino. If Zay was heard to mutter that the Nulls were Skarada's private army, he wasn't entirely wrong. There were still ninety of the men Skarada had trained from small boys on active service, and he worried about them, too. But Omega had become as much his closest family now as the Null Arcs. He would move the galaxy for them if he had to. The gold-veined marble fountain in the center of the plaza beckoned to him. He stopped as he walked past it and simply leaned over and plunged his head in the icy water, holding it there for a few painfully refreshing moments before jerking upright and shaking the water off like a mot. A couple of early morning pedestrians stared at him and he returned the stare until they looked away. It was rare for anyone to even notice him. He made a habit of being inconspicuous. But today he didn't care. Did they have any idea what was going on around the galaxy on hundreds of battlefields? He resisted the urge to grab them, shake them, and make them listen to what was happening in their name. It was the first anniversary of Geonosis. Nobody seemed to be marking that. Ordo walked up behind him. You should get some rest, Cal Bear. I'll sleep when you sleep. I have more good news. I could do with that. Darman's explosives profile.
The reading from the prisoners matches up with the manufacturing characteristics of at least a quarter of the devices detonated so far. We got a break. Good work. And good old Dar. He smiled at Ordo, reminded again of how well his boys had turned out. Tell you what, Ord I.K.A., fancy some breakfast while the system gets on with unpacking that data? They do a disgustingly greasy fry-up in the Kragget. It's not the sky sitter, but it sets you up for the day. Ordo shrugged and tilted his head in a conspicuously self-conscious glance down at his spotless white armor. I don't think we're the sky sitter's type of clientele, anyway. Skirata couldn't see the expression behind the visor, but he knew Ordo was amused. It was good that a man who'd had an unimaginable nightmare of a childhood could find anything funny. They have napkins. And I'll try not to splash sauce over you. Deal? Just to celebrate the fact that we're both still here a year on. Ordo started walking. What were you doing a year ago today? Sorry, Calbear. It was a very rapid deployment. I should have woken you. You did fine. I should have shaped up and realized you had a job to do. We certainly accounted for a number of enemy positions, Bordo said. I never said goodbye to the lads who didn't come back, that's all. I lost nine out of my batch. But the last time you saw them... You left them feeling confident, respected, and loved. That's enough for any bear to achieve. Thanks, son. How did he ever grow up this normal? Let's enjoy ourselves for a change, shall we? For a few brief hours, Skarada and Ordo did what normal civilians did and took an easy ride to the city's lower levels to have a dangerously unhealthy but comforting breakfast. Skirata had never used public transport with Ordo in tow before, and the reactions of other passengers fascinated him. They sneaked sideways glances. Ordo's custom holster with its twin blasters probably focused them somewhat. The Ark Trooper armor was spectacular even in a city jaded by the everyday presence of a thousand exotic species. Skirata regularly forgot how few of the capital civilians had ever seen a clone soldier face to face. Apart from the heavily publicized display of mass GR battalions boarding assault ships at the military staging area a year ago, the vast majority of Coruscanti had no contact with them whatsoever. And never without their helmets. Or die K, he whispered. Do me a favor. Take off your bucket, will you? Ordo paused for a moment, and then popped the seal on his collar and lifted off his helmet. Skarada kept an eye on the other passengers. Reactions? It was a revelation. Some looked blankly surprised. Others went a little farther. Oh no, they're human! One man whispered. And they're so young! Did anyone know how young? He hated using Ordo like this, but it had to be done. Skirata, tired and permanently irritable, bit back his retort and became a diplomat for a few moments. No, sir, the war isn't droids fighting droids, he said. May I introduce Captain Ordo? Ordo nodded politely at the man in the seat across the aisle and extended his hand. Skirata had taught his little nose to act like nice boys when they needed to. The man hesitated and then reached across to shake Ordo's hand, surrendering soft pale civilian fingers to a black gauntlet. The look on his face said clearly that he hadn't expected to find flesh and blood inside the droid-like shell, or to retrieve his hand uncrushed afterward. My pleasure, sir, Ordo said. It was unusually quiet in the easy ride after that. At least the reality had registered on them. Skirata nudged Ordo to get off when they reached the Kragget level, and the Ark replaced his helmet. You like to shock, said Ordo. 
I like to educate, said Skarada. Sorry, son. Strolling around Coruscant with a fully armored arc captain was hardly blending in, but it got him a good table in the Kragget, which meant one that the service droid actually wiped clean before they sat down. A couple of CFS officers acknowledged them. Police and security officers like eating here because it was right on the edge of their manner, as some of them called the rough territory where they plied their trade, handy for a quick response to a call but far enough away to be a haven. Ordo took his helmet off again to tuck into the plate of fried smoked nerf slices. The eggs were from something Skarada couldn't identify and knew he didn't want to. He concentrated on the seductively unctuous sensation of hot fat and salty yolk in his mouth and washed it down with several cups of CAF. We can't leave this to the boys in blue any longer, Skarada said. They both knew what this was without being specific in a public place. They're hampered by having to do stuff by the book, and we don't know if they're all playing for our team anyway. This is one for us. I'm going to make Zayi see sense about it. Once everyone's back in town, it'll be a lot harder for him to say no. If the cryptography droid extracts some relevant data from Auden's little hall, it might be even harder. Which reminds me. I haven't paid my respects to Vav. Promise me you won't pull your knife on him again. I'll behave. The server droid seemed to have been replaced by a female Chwilek waitress, who looked past prime dancing age, but who still distracted Skirata for a second or two. She put another plate of nerf strips in front of Ordo, who like every clone soldier Skirata had ever known would eat anything and everything put in front of him. She smiled and lingered. Ordo froze and returned the smile in the nervous way of a small boy, then busied himself with his breakfast, and the waitress moved away. Skirata reflected on the careless power of youth and looks, and how incomplete a teacher he had been of social skills. Somehow I don't think she's mistaken you for a droid. Ordo looked uncharacteristically flustered for a moment. Air. I've been assessing our requirements. He cleared his plate again, and Skirata slid his unwanted eggs onto the man's plate and watched them disappear. Kid is an issue. We need to discuss this before you see Zay. This is going to take some serious resources vehicles, safe houses, special surveillance equipment, and ordnance. Skirata had been doing the calculations at the same time Ordo had. They need two squads, at least, and a couple of nulls. But two squads of Republic commandos in their distinctively bulky, bad boy Katarn Mark III kit and Ordo and Mariel in their spectacular red and blue would be noticeable as unusual activity. They might need to wear that armor sooner or later, even if they could be deployed in civilian clothing the rest of the time. Skirata chewed the last overdone piece of smoked nerf he saved the delectable crunchy bits for last and a solution blossomed as his jaw worked. Hide in plain sight. He was good at that. He could become so mundane unkempt hair, scruffy clothing that he was almost invisible. And so could his lads by being the opposite. All they had to do was be one of a number of clone personnel wandering around Coruscant in full armor and if occasionally they took off that armor and went about in fatigues, then who would really recognize them as individuals? They all looked the same to most people, other than a few Jedi who cared about them as men, and their own brothers. Skirata considered it a very productive working breakfast. He opened his comm link and keyed a meeting request to General Zay. Then he leaned across the table, seized Ordo two-handed by his shoulder pauldron and gave him a noisy and exaggerated paternal kiss on the top of his head. Sorted, he said. Plain sight. The Chwilek waitress watched, fascinated. Hey, can I try that too? He's just a boy, Skarata said, and left her a very generous tip. Ordo got up to follow him, pocketing a couple of mealbread sticks for later. My son. 
Arias fearless hangar deck. Good grief, here comes the armored division, said Commander Get. He strode toward the Nymoidian vessel. Its casing was streaked and pocked with scorch marks. Our seas look like tanks, don't they? Republic commandos did look fearsomely bulky alongside the clone troopers. The first four to clamber out of the Seas Trade Federation craft were a riot of color, their battered armor daubed with green, yellow, red, and orange markings. The second squad was armored in matte black, utterly featureless and grim. But Etain knew instantly who they were and which man was which. She needed no battle livery to distinguish them. Their forms in the forest were almost like trails of phosphorescence in a tropical ocean and they were instantly familiar, instantly old friends. I was only with them for a few days and I haven't seen or talked to them for months. But it's as if we were never apart. Fio, yes, she knew it was Fi even before he spoke saluted, lifted his helmet, and winked. Ma'am, you look like the back end of a band, he said sympathetically. Are they looking after you properly here? Fi. She knew she was supposed to remain dignified and aloof, and she'd felt comradeship with many clone troopers in the intervening months, but her first reluctant command with Omega had utterly changed her. Fi, I really miss you. What happened to the gray armor? You know how much Dar griped about being too visible on Kalura. Anyway, he's brought you a present. He gestured over his shoulder. Darman was helping a group of troopers haul the prisoners out of the Nymoidian landing craft while Get examined it. They're all in one piece, too. We've been really good boys this time. Delta Squad had simply disappeared. When Etain looked around, she saw they had settled in a tight knot in a corner of the hangar deck, helmets on, obviously talking intently. She knew the body language now. They didn't feel like Omega in the Force at all. They were a concentrated well, a bottomless pool of something unyielding, and totally enmeshed with each other. The general impression they made on the Force was one of triumphant high spirits. Niner and Otten approached and clasped hands with her. It didn't feel at all inappropriate. They looked tired and anxious, and she wanted very badly to make things right for them. They were her friends. I bet you'd like something to eat, she said. Any chance of a hot shower and a few hours sleep first, please, General? Niner looked apologetic and shoved Fi gently in the back. Me first. I'm pulling rank. He's not really a sergeant, General, said Fi. He just helps them out when they're busy. Any news on our pilot? Niner asked. Yes. I'm so sorry. It was never easy. She tapped her data pad to bring up the copy of the signal that Majestic had sent to Fleet and handed the pad to him. Niner glanced at it, blinked, and passed it to Phi. Phi parted his lips briefly as if to say something, and then his slight frown almost crumpled into grief. He composed himself, and just looked down at the deck. He's not the first, Fi said, suddenly grim, and Etain had never seen that aspect of him surface visibly before. And he won't be the last. Etain watched them disappear through a hatch on the aft bulkhead, trailing after a trooper. Fearless shivered slightly under the soles of her boots, making top speed back to Coruscant and she waited while Darman spent what seemed like an interminable time fussing about with the prisoner handover. She wondered if he was reluctant to talk after choosing not to remain on Kalura with her. Perhaps he was just concerned that nothing else went wrong. She gave up waiting and walked carefully between the troopers still trying to catch some sleep on the hangar deck, curled up wherever they could find a relatively comfortable space. Well done, she said hoping that some were awake to hear her. Darman had changed. 
He bent his head to ease off his helmet, popping the seal, and then shook his hair and smoothed it flat with one glove. And although he smiled, he wasn't the Dharman she had been through hell with. He looked older. Clones aged faster than normal men. He was eleven going on twenty-two going on fifty. When she had first sensed him as a child in the force, his square, high cheekboned face had been both man and boy. At the stage of life when had she been able to manipulate time the slightest push backward would have revealed the child he had so recently been. But now he was a man, quite solidly, and with no hint of the boy about him. It wasn't simply that he had aged two years in one. The look in his eyes said he was much, much older, as old as the battlefield, maybe as old as war itself. She had seen it in the face of every clone trooper and commando and arc she had commanded. She knew that she had that same look, too. But Darman smiled anyway, and the smile broadened into a grin that made the rest of the ship even the galaxy utterly irrelevant to her. You always cut it fine, don't you, ma'am? It's good to see you, Dar. Whatever happened to Attain? She turned into a general and we're on the hangar deck. You're right. I'm sorry. Is it definitely confirmed that we're going back to base? Unless you want to argue with the officer of the watch, I believe so. Good. We need a break. Just a day or two, maybe. He never did ask for much. None of them did. She wondered if they didn't know what the world had to offer them or if they were just honed down to basic needs, too overwhelmed to think beyond recovering enough to do the job over again the next day. She patted his armored shoulder and held her hand there for a few seconds. He looked as if he suddenly remembered something and was embarrassed by it in a way he quite enjoyed. It must be nice to be able to reach out to someone through the force, he said so he'd felt it. She was glad. Get yourself off to the freshers, she said. Come and find me afterward if you're not too tired, and I'll show you over the ship. Have you met Sergeant Cal yet? No. Cal was always there for Darman, somewhere, even at times like this when she wanted to say so much to him. When we dock, perhaps you could introduce me. Darman beamed, clearly delighted. Oh, you'll like him, General. You'll really like him. Attain certainly hoped so. And if she didn't, then she'd try, for Darman's sake. So Brigade HQ, Coruscant, 369 days after Geonosis the smell hit Ordo long before he reached the meeting room. It was a familiar blend of wet wool, mold, and a pungent oily musk. Scarada reacted visibly. He straightened his right arm by his side out of old, old habit and let the blade slide into his hand, fall a fraction until the handle touched his palm, and then snatched it. Cal Bear, it would be better if I shot it, Ordo said. He put a restraining hand on Scarada's arm. I won't let it near you. I've often wondered if you're telepathic, son. I can smell the strill. You have your knife ready, and we're meeting Sergeant Vav. Telepathy isn't required to work that one out. Ordo would have been quite content to shoot the strill without a second thought because it upset Calbear. But it wasn't the strill's fault that it stank, or that it had a master who cherished cruelty, or that it had become savage itself. It had been selected by nature and then trained by people to hunt for pleasure rather than for food, and nothing else had ever been allowed to cross its mind. He felt some pity for it. But he would still kill it without a moment's hesitation. The doors slid back. Ordo placed his right hand discreetly on the grip of one of his repeating blasters. His attention went instinctively to Vav, then to the strill lying on his lap and then to the fact that he had a clear shot at both. It took less than a second to process the information and then to subdue the impulse. 
Behind Vav's head, the walls of General Zais' meeting room were a beautiful soothing shade of aquamarine. But they weren't working. Scarada wasn't soothed. And Captain Mays was sitting at the table beside Zay, arms folded across his chest and looking none too impressed either. There was an ugly purple bruise at the point of his chin, more discoloration around one eye, and a cut on the bridge of his nose. I didn't think I hit him that hard, Ordo thought. Unfortunate. Zay motioned Scarada to enter just after the man strode in of his own accord, and indicated chairs at the Lapis top table. Bard and Juzik sat beside him, hands clasped on the tabletop in an attempt at serenity. Well, Scarada said and sat down. He ran his hand across the luxurious polished surface. This is nice. I hope I never hear anyone complaining about the Gar's expenditure on armor and weapons. Cal, Vav said politely. It's good to see you again. Vav was settled in one of the deeply upholstered hide chairs with the strill draped across his lap on its back, all six of its legs flopping in an undignified sprawl while he scratched its belly. Its huge fang mouth was slack, tongue lolling and a long skein of drool hung almost to the floor. Its body was a meter long, lengthened by a whip of a tail covered in more loose skin. The strill was still prettier than Vav, though. The man had a long square-jawed face that was all bone and frown lines, and graying dark hair cut brutally short. Faces rarely lied about the soul within. Wallet, Skarada said, nodding. Say he gestured to Ordo to sit, but he remained standing and simply removed his helmet. He transferred the bead-sized calm link connector to his ear, noting Zay's expression without looking directly at him. Scarada looked up. Take a seat, Captain. Ordo obeyed only one man's orders, and that man was Calber Zay was visibly thrown again. No doubt all other arcs and commandos jumped when he said so but he should have known Ordo by now. Maze certainly did. He was staring at his brother Ark as if one snap of Zay's fingers would give him permission to jump up and return that punch. Maze, perhaps you'd like to go and have a break, Zay said. This is just going to be a tedious administrative matter. Maze paused for one beat, his eyes never leaving Ordo's. Yes, sir. He grabbed his helmet from the table and left. Say he waited for the doors to close behind him. Let's hear your plan, Sergeant. I want to deploy Delta and Omega on Coruscant to identify and neutralize the SEP network here, because it is here, said Skarada. It has to be in order to strike us so easily. And CSF doesn't have the expertise or personnel to deal with this and there might even be someone inside the CSF passing intel to the terrorists. Sei's eyes were locked on him. Commandos are a military asset. Not an intelligence one. Nor police. We have theaters of war across Dash. I wasn't planning to arrest anybody. This is a shoot-to-kill policy. I wasn't aware we had one. You haven't, so you'd better get one fast. I can't ask the Senate to authorize use of special forces against Coruscant residents. Don't ask them. Skirata became pure ice at times like this. Ordo watched him carefully, anxious to learn more nuances of the part of soldiering that required no weapons beyond nerve and psychology. Is the Jedi Council squeamish about that sort of thing, too? Sergeant. Then don't ask them either. In fact, we never had this conversation. All you've done is tell me you can't ask the Senate to give its blessing to a change in the Gar's terms of reference. But I know what you're suggesting, Say he said. Scarado was fidgeting with his blade. Ordo could see it. It was a tiny movement, but he could detect the flex of his forearm muscles through his jacket. 
Skirata had the point of the blade resting on his curled middle finger and was pressing it ever so slightly up and down, a preparation for dropping and catching the grip. The Jedi Council is pretty adept at turning blind eyes, Skirata said. For an organization that knew it was taking on an army with an assassination capability, you do send out conflicting signals to simple soldiers like me. Valve was watching the exchange like a man being mildly amused by a hall of it. The Strill yawned with a thin, high-pitched whine. The difference the Senate will see, Zay said, is that this is coruscant. General, the days when wars were fought elsewhere while the home fires were kept burning are long gone. I know. But there are armies, and there are. Bounty hunters and assassins and the Senate will be wary of crossing that line on home ground. Well, that's what tends to happen when you let a bunch of bounty hunters and assassins train your army. We didn't know we even had an army until a year ago. Maybe, but the fact that you're sitting here now with a general's rank means you've accepted responsibility for it. You could have objected, collectively or individually. You could have asked questions. But no. You picked up the blaster you found on the floor, and you just fired it to defend yourself. Expedience ambushes you in the end. You know what the alternative was. Look, General, I need to clarify a few things, being just a simple assassin and all that. Answer a few questions for me. Zay should have been furious that a mere sergeant was treating him as if he were an annoyingly pedantic clerk rather than a battle-hardened general. To his credit, he seemed more intent on a solution. Ordo wondered where expedience ended and pragmatism began. Very well, said Zay. Do you want to stop attacks on vulnerable targets that are starting to compromise the ability of the GR to deploy and are destroying public confidence in the Senate's ability to defend the capital? Yes. Do you think it's a good idea for some of our hard-pressed special forces lads to have an unprecedented break on Coruscant after months in the field? Say paused, just a breath. Yes. Do you need to ask anyone else to authorize that purely administrative matter? No. General Juzik is responsible for personnel welfare. Ordo kept his face utterly blank. Leave? There was never any leave for the GAR or their Jedi command in the front line. Neither would have known what to do with free time anyway. Juzik looked pinned down. I do believe some are and are would be a good idea, actually. Skirata smiled at him with genuine warmth. Juzik was all right, one of the boys, all desperate courage and desire to belong. It was hard to tell if he was now playing the game or just being a decent officer. I'll look into it. And sir, Skirata said, is it true that you knew all along that I was a complete shikar who could never follow orders? who kept you in the dark, who treated his squads like his own private army, and was generally a mandalolite just like Django and the rest of that mongrel scum? Zay leaned back in his seat and pinched the end of his nose briefly, staring hard at the blue stone table. I do believe I might realize that at some time in the future, Sergeant. The corners of his eyes crinkled for the merest fraction of a second, but Ordo spotted it. I have my suspicions. Proving them is hard, though. Zay was all right, too, then. Vav had been watching the exchange with mild interest, and Ordo had been watching him, because he knew the man all too well. Sergeant Vav, do you have any view on this? The strill rumbled. Vav, apparently distracted, fondled its ghastly, stinking head, his slightly narrowed eyes revealing a doting affection that he never seemed to spare for any other living creature. I'm just hanging around. When those detainees are released, I'll offer them a room for a while, and I'll have a conversation with them. Nothing to do with the GR or the Senate at all. 
merely a private citizen doing what he can to welcome visitors to Karuskant. Juzik was watching the exchange with an expression that suggested he was both excited and aware that the stakes had just been raised. They were subverting democracy in one sense, but they were also saving their political masters from a decision they could never be seen to take, yet had to. That's the worst thing about having Shakar like us around, Skarada said. We just wander off, find some place that you don't know about, and hole up in it and get into all sorts of mischief that you also know nothing about. And then we bill you for it. Dreadful. Dreadful, Zayi echoed. Is this the kind of thing that CSF might notice? Were we to get a little out of hand, I imagine very senior officers in CSF might need to be reassured, but not by you. Dreadful, Zayi said. Hypothetically, anyway. Language was a wonderful thing, Ordo thought. Skirata had just told Zayi that he was about to go bandit, as he called it running an unauthorized shoot-to-kill operation in a civilian location and simply sending Zay the bill. Vav planned to interrogate the prisoners. CSF Senior command would be placated by Skarada should anything go wrong, without any need for Zay to be involved. And yet Zay had authorized it all. And the subject had still not been discussed. I wonder if anyone will notice our commandos on leave here. Juzik said, apparently catching on. Probably, said Skarada. And wouldn't it be nice if we also extended that home deployment to honest ordinary clone troopers, lots of them? That'd be good for morale. And reassuring for the public to see soldiers in armor around the capital. I wonder how I can persuade the Senate officers that it's a good idea? Say cut in. Have you met Mar Rigian, the Senate's head of public affairs? Just asking. Skarada nodded. I do believe I've had some contact with him, yes. Excellent, Zayi said. I know you two will get along very well. And the conversation that had never taken place was over. Skarada stood to leave, and Vav gave the Strill a gentle shove to persuade it to drop to the floor. It complained in a gravelly rumble but settled at his feet, looking up at Skirata with red-rimmed gold eyes. Skirata's hand was still cupped, arm at his side, in that way Ordo knew often preceded a fight. Cal, I hear Auden's returning, Vav said. Skirata walked out of the room, head down, Ordo right behind him. Juzik followed. You stay clear, Skirata said quietly. I'm meeting them all straight off fearless. That includes Delta. And they're not yours to run anymore, remember? You just sit tight at the barracks and wait for me to give you a location. Ordo wasn't fooled by Vav's restrained politeness. Seven years ago Vav had loomed over him as a figure of authority in his black Mando armor for the first time, the Strill at his heels. Its name was Lord Myrdalen. Ordo, like all the Nels, had perfect recall. He sometimes wished he hadn't. But at least it gave him clarity, and he knew the source of all his fears and anxieties. Lord Myrdalen Murd had lunged at him at Vav's command, snapping. Ordo had drawn the little hold-up blaster that Skarada had let him keep and would have killed the animal had Calbear not yelled. Check! and brought him to a frozen halt as his blaster aim came to rest between Murd's eyes. Vav, Ordo recalled, had laughed. He said that Ordo was G. Verd almost a warrior. And Skirata had aimed a kick at Murd to drive it off, saying there was no, almost, about it. Ordo watched the strill carefully. The creature trotted ahead of them sniffing noisily in crevices and leaving behind a waft of pungent scent and a trail of drool. If that thing's going to accompany you on jobs, said Skirata, you'd better keep it under control or find a use for a strill pelt. He drew up his arm and flicked his wrist before even Ordo could react. 
The three-sided blade shaved past Murd and thudded into the polished pleakwood floor a pace ahead of it. The knife vibrated to a standstill. Murd squealed, leaping sideways. Ordo stepped between Vav and Skirata ready to defend Kalbir in yet another confrontation with the man he loathed. But Skirata just turned to fix Vav with a stare that said he wasn't joking. Vav stared back his long hard face suddenly a killer's again. It's not the Strill's fault, Skarada said. He walked a few paces forward and pulled the knife from the floor. The Strill backed away from him, lip curled back to reveal its fangs. But you have your warning, both of you. We need to get this job done, and that's the only reason I haven't gutted both of you already. Understood? I've moved on said Vav. And it's time you did, before I end up having to kill you. Ordo really didn't like that. He ejected the custom vibroblade in his gauntlet, a better weapon at close quarters than his blasters. Skarada gave him the palm-down gesture. Leave it. Stay useful, Wallen. He beckoned Juzik and Ordo to follow him. And I hope that Otten's moved on too, because I won't stand in his way now. How far is too far, Cal? Can you answer that? How far did you go? Vav called after him. I made that boy a warrior. Without me, he wouldn't be alive today. With him, Ordo thought, Aden very nearly wasn't. Why didn't you mention to Zay that we might also have a leak within the Grand Army? Ordo asked. Because... Skarada said. I can't assume I know who it isn't. The leak might not even know that they're the one either. Until then, only the strike team will know we're looking. What about Obrim? He's an ally. I hope so. But in the end, who are the only people we can really trust? Ourselves, Kalbir. So we make sure we know who's watching our back car Taili ad Meg Hukakama. It was good advice to live by. Ordo knew who always watched his. Arius Fearless, inbound, to Coruscant Sector Control, 369 days after Geonosis. I really should make a hollow of this, Commander Git said. He reached into the assortment of pouches clipped to his belt and took out a small recorder. It doesn't happen that often. Atain and the commander of the assault ship stood on the gantry that ran around the upper hangar bulkhead and watched the extraordinary spectacle beneath them on the deck. She had heard of this thing, but never seen it. It was the DHA Word of Verde Mandalorian ritual battle chant. Men from the 41st Elite and some of the ship's company about 50 in all. Helmets off were learning to perform it with some instruction from Phi and Scorch. Sev, easy to spot by the blood-red streaks daubed on his helmet, sat on an ammunition crate nearby, cleaning his sniper attachment and looking as if he wasn't interested in joining in. He was, of course. Attain could sense it, and she wasn't even properly attuned to Sev's presence in the Force. The DHA Werda looked fearsome. General Bardan Juzik, a young man who barely came up to a clone commando's shoulder, said he loved to see it, and drew so much courage from it that he learned to perform it with his men. It was Cal Skarada's legacy. Juzik explained that the veteran sergeant wanted his men to know their heritage and taught them the right along with Mandalorian language and culture. Tong S. Rang Broka. J. T. S. C. The commandos were layering rhythm upon rhythm, hammering first on their own armor and then turning to beat the complex tempo on the plates of the man next to them. Timed precisely, it was spectacular. Timed wrong, a soldier could break the next man's jaw. D-H-A-W-E-R de Verdade in Tratu. C-O-R-U scanta cando si adu. Do memo tir si etran outra sinya. G-R-A. It was irresistible, ancient, and hypnotic. The chant rose from the hangar deck in one solid communal voice. 
She recognized words like Coruscanta and Jedi eyes. Coruscant, Jedi. That couldn't have been in the original Mandalorian chant. Even their heritage had been remolded to serve a state in which they had no stake. It was, Attain recalled, something to do with being shadow warriors and forcing traitors to kneel before them. They were supremely fit warriors displaying their discipline and reflexes. Any flesh and blood enemy would have been adequately warned of the power of the forces that awaited them. But droids didn't have the sense to be scared. That was a pity, really. Atain winced. The blows looked real. They were putting all their weight behind everyone. Astonishingly, none of the initiates had yet timed the movements badly enough to receive an accidental blow in the face. Phi and Scorch demonstrated another sequence. Armor clashed. Sev abandoned his feigned disinterest, took off his helmet, and joined in. Then Darman appeared and they formed a line of four in the front. It was strange to watch Darman actually enjoying himself, oblivious to his surroundings. She had no idea that he had such a powerful voice or that he could for want of a better word dance. Juzik always talks about this, said Atain. I've seen a few squads do it, Get said. It came via Skirata, I hear. Yes. Atain was wondering how she would ever measure up to that man. Halfway would have been enough. He taught all the commandos to live up to their Mandalorian heritage. You know customs, language, ideals. She was mesmerized by the unconscious precision of men who were all exactly the same height. It's very weird. It's like they have a compulsion to do it. Yes, we do, Get said. It's very stirring. I'm sorry. That was rude of me. No problem, General. It certainly wasn't part of our trooper training on Kamino. It gets passed on from man to man now. He looked restless. She knew what he was thinking. General Dash. Give me the recorder, she said and smiled. Go ahead. Get touched his glove to his brow and shot off down the ladder to the deck, sliding the last three meters on the handrails. It was delightful to see the mix of armor yellow striped commanders and pilots, plain white troopers, and the motley mix of commando colors drawn together in one ancient Mandalorian ritual, every face the same. Atain felt adrift, excluded. She had never truly felt this degree of bond with her Jedi clan. The connection in the Force was there, yes, but... No, the real strength here was attachment, passion, identity, meaning. She thought of Master Fulier, the man who insisted she have a second chance as a Padawan and not be consigned to build refugee camps because she lacked control. The man who was also passionate and prone to taking on causes. The Jedi who lost his life because he couldn't stay out of a fight when Gez Hulkin's militia roughed up the locals on Kalura. Atain thought that wasn't such a bad sort of Jedi to be. Not textbook, but centered on fair play and justice. The clone soldiers were worth that, too. She was suddenly aware of Darman looking up at her, grinning, and if it hadn't been for his armor and surroundings he could have been any young man showing off his prowess to a woman. She smiled back. She still envied him his focus and discipline, especially as he had somehow managed not to lose it after being exposed to a galaxy that didn't quite resemble the ideal he had probably been taught about on Kamino. But Cal Skirata had largely been responsible for his training. She didn't know Skirata yet, but one thing she was certain of was that he was just like a Jedi a pragmatic man who dealt in reality. The DHA wordo went on for verse after repeated verse. Then the klaxon sounded and the pipe came over the address system. Port duties men close up. Damage and fire control parties to stations. Prepare to dock. Commander Git broke out of the ranks and came bounding back up the ladder, wiping sweat from his face with a neatly folded piece of cloth. 
General, will you come to the bridge to see the ship alongside? I won't be much help, but I'd like that, yes. It was as if she were leaving a ship after a long association, a retiring captain. She was only a temporary officer, but still Git treated her as if she actually had some importance to the crew, and she found that touching. She stood at the command console and watched as the docking grapnels and platforms slipped past the view screen and the crew maneuvered fearless on instruments. Git had the con. Stop reactor. Stop reactor, commander. Reactor stopped. Fearless secondary propulsion shivered into silence. The vessel slipped gradually into dock on the power of tugs bringing her alongside port side to, as Atain had now learned to call it. She walked slowly across the bridge to watch the dockside team getting a brow in place to disembark those members of the crew being transferred and to allow maintenance and replenishment teams to board. There was the slightest of jarring sensations as the ship came to rest against huge dock fenders. Fearless was back safely in her home port for the time being. Etain held out her hand to get. Gloves off, my friend. He shrugged, smiling, and slipped off the entire gauntlet. They shook hands as equals. Then she pressed the key on the console, opening the public address system that reached every cabin and flat and hangar and mess deck in the huge warship. Gentlemen, she said. It's been an honor. Six. In five millennia, the Mandalorians fought with and against a thousand armies on a thousand worlds. They learned to speak as many languages and absorbed weapons technology and tactics from every war. And yet, despite the overwhelming influence of alien cultures, and the absence of a true homeworld and even species, their own language not only survived but changed little, their way of life and their philosophy remained untouched and their ideals and sense of family of identity, of nation, were only strengthened. Armor does not make a Mandalorian. The armor is simply a manifestation of an impenetrable, unassailable heart. Mandalorians, Identity and Language, published by the Galactic Institute of Anthropology. Arius Fearless, Upper Dock, Fleet Support Depot, Coruscant, 370 days after Geonosis. The ramp went down, and for once the scene that greeted Phi was in hostile droid-infested territory and red blaster fire. But Coruscant and possibly high towers and deep canyons of Skylanes was every bit as alien as Geonosis. Phi had seen it once before, all too briefly, on the way to break a siege at the spaceport. It had been an exotic exciting lightscape at night, but in daylight it was breathtaking in a totally different way. Can we have a run ashore? Niner stood with his hands clasped behind him, with his dees slung across his back. Not my call. I'm not the sergeant now. Boss and the rest of Delta had formed up behind Omega in a neat line, presenting a more orderly rank. They were on the same comm link. Niner said it was ungrateful to block them out, seeing as they'd ridden to the rescue. But Omega would never hear the end of it, Phi was sure of that. The 41st Elite were disembarked first. Scorch leaned a little closer to Phi. He was right behind him. The nice thing about Katarn helmet comm links was that you could switch between circuits and have totally private exchanges without any external sign that you were talking or even having a stand-up fight, come to that. So you want to run ashore? What's that? Sev said. Fi enjoyed Skirata's wide-ranging and often bizarre language. No other squads talked quite like Sergeant Cal's. A night out on the town. Dinner at a fine restaurant, perhaps taken to Mon Cal Ballet. Yeah. Right. Don't fight, Niner said. 
You're just being cruel to the Weekway team here. Okay, ale and war and nuts. No ballet. And maybe a little shopping with your spook squad buddy? Scorch said. New comma, maybe? Ah, uh, news did travel then. Don't let Ordo hear you say that, Vi said. He'll rip your leg off and hit you with the soggy end. Yeah? Arcs are all mouth and commas. Boo, hard man, eh? I've seen Trilek dancing girls tougher than you, said Scorch. How many times are we going to have to save your shebs then? Probably as many times as we have to clean up your Ossic, said Niner. Can't you two talk about blowing stuff up and play nicely? Where's the general? Fi said. Darman interrupted. Saying goodbye to Git. He seemed to be taking a keen interest in Atane's whereabouts. Can you see Sergeant Cal yet? She said he was meeting us. So. Touchy, touchy. There was a faint click on the helmet comm link. Delta. This is the geriatric. Get down and give me point fifty now. Fear effect, Sev sighed. Omega parted ranks to give Delta the room to perform fifty press-ups in full armor, with backpacks. Phi watched appreciatively. He didn't care for Sev at all. But he was also scanning the landing platform for Skirata, desperate to see his real sergeant again. When Skirata was around, Niner ceased to play the senior NCO. Generals tended not to get much of a look in, either. Skirata was his own command chain. That was forty, not fifty, Skirata said from somewhere behind them. I hate innumeracy almost as much as I hate cracks about my personal state of disrepair. Skirata just had a knack for sliding around unnoticed. There had been times when Phi had wondered if he was a Force user, because only Jedi were supposed to be able to pull those kinds of stunts. But Cal Beer was adamant that he was simply good at his job, because he'd been doing it since he was seven years old. That made him a late starter by clone standards. He appeared suddenly from between a knot of 41st men and ambled over to Omega not limping quite as badly as usual and looking rather dapper in a smart leather jacket. In rough working clothes he could disappear, but the jacket changed him utterly. Yet there was always something about the man that inspired relief and confidence. Fi felt instantly ready for anything, just as he had when Skirata had been the highest authority in his limited world on Kamino. Skirata paused for a moment in front of him. He didn't seem worried whether Delta had cranked out the extra ten press-ups or not. He just clutched Fi's arm and hugged Darman and slapped Niner across the shoulders and grabbed Otten's hand. He never seemed to have the slightest trouble now in showing how much he cared about them. Over the years he changed from shielding his emotions behind a veneer of good-natured abuse to abandoning the pretense altogether. Nobody had ever been fooled by it anyway. Don't scare me like that again, Adik. He turned to Delta, easing themselves up from the floor. And you bunch of DQ, too. I'd better keep a tighter rein on you. He watched the last of the 41st men disappearing into transfer vessels, presumably for return to barracks, and something appeared to amuse him. Scorch, if you're not a good boy then I'm going to make you wear a comma. Sorry, Sergeant. Is it true that Sergeant Vav's back? He's back, but he's not a sergeant. I'm your sergeant now. Scorch. And General Juzik? He's not your sergeant either. Skirata looked past Scorch and seemed suddenly startled. Fi turned and saw what he was staring at. Etienne Termukin walked across the huge landing platform hauling the LJ-50 as if it were putting up a fight. That has to be General Termukin, yes? 
That's her, Darman said. She's very keen to meet you. Fi was distracted by a blip of movement in his HUD. A scruffy civilian air taxi had risen over the parapet of the landing platform. And it shouldn't have been able to do that. His unconscious brain said danger and reacted a split second before his ingrained training reminded him that unidentified civvy vessels shouldn't penetrate the fleet base cordon. He was on one knee with his D's charged and aimed before he even noticed from his HUD that Omega and Delta had both formed up into a single front contact formation. The taxi stopped dead in midair. Check! Scarada stepped in front of them. Phi froze, but Delta aimed around the sergeant. Stand down! One fist held up clenched to hold off the squads, Skirata signaled vigorously to the taxi with his other hand held flat, slapping down on the air. Drop. The taxi settled slowly on the platform. Omega stopped dead at the check command. Delta took a second longer. Maybe it hadn't been drilled into them as it had Skirata's batch. But all of them still had their rifles trained. Fi's heart pounded. They were all wound tight and still alert to any threat, alert enough to let hard-trained reactions take over. It was what kept you alive. You could never switch it off. Your muscles learned to do things and then stopped asking your brain's permission. I'm sorry, lads. Skirata spun around to face them. UDCI, UDCI. Relax. It's ours. I'm glad you pointed that out, Sarge, Niner muttered. He lowered his dees. Fi followed his lead and glanced behind him. Atain was still lying prone with her concussion rifle aimed in the right direction, no easy task with a weapon that size, but her arc of fire left something to be desired. He hoped that her Jedi sense of right place and right time would have stopped her from blowing them all to pieces if she had opened fire. Phi gestured to her to stand down, and then gave up and just shook his head at her. No. She gestured back, palm up, and jumped to her feet. He wondered if anyone had thought to teach her basic hand signals. Skirata was still apologizing. I should have warned you I had transport coming. That was sloppy of me. The taxi's hatch opened and a Wookiee not a big one. Just over a couple of meters tall and folded itself from the taxi and clambered out, throwing its head back and yawling in complaint. Okay, my fault, Skarada said. He held both hands up in admission to the mountain of glossy brown fur. They're just jumpy, that's all. We'll load now. All of us in that? Niner asked. It wasn't a very big taxi. With the Wookiee, too? No, the prisoners. Just load them in. Where are they going? That's all you need to know right now. Niner paused, then shrugged and beckoned boss, fixer, and on to follow him back on board fearless. Atain had moved forward by now and walked up to Skirata, rifle slung across her back. She was so small that she looked more like a bolt-on accessory to the weapon. Darman reacted and stepped in to get Skirata's attention. It wasn't that he needed to, of course. Skirata was watching Atain, and he seemed to have one eye on Fearless Ramp, and he was placating the clearly irritated Wookiee, somehow juggling situations as skillfully as he had ever done. General, he said. He paused to nod formally to Atain which given Skirata's general contempt for anyone not in armor seemed quite an encouraging start, Fi decided. We've got a nice new job, and that includes you. Sergeant, she said and bowed her head. You're not what I expected. Skirata raised an eyebrow. Nor are you, General. He shoved the Wookiee back a few meters, apparently untroubled by the fact that the creature could have used him for a cleaning rag. He rounded on it. No, just put them on the back seat and drive. Let Vav do the rest. The mention of Vav gave Fi a hint of what he couldn't grasp from the Shiry Wook words. 
so the Wookiee was delivering the prisoners to Wallen Vav. It seemed to have volunteered to do something that Skirata preferred to leave to old Psycho, then. The Wookiee obviously wasn't asking if they wanted to stop for lunch. What's happening here? Atain asked. What's happening to the prisoners? Civilian matter, General, Skirata said, and stood back as Niner and Boss jogged past steering a medbay repulsa with what looked like three large rolls of blanket on it. They bundled each into the back of the taxi with a little grunting and cursing, then slammed one hatch closed. Don't you worry about it. But I am worrying about it. The Wookiee barked once and folded itself back into the taxi. The vessel lifted off and swung back over the parapet, dropping below their view into one of the artificial canyons that seemed to reach down into Coruscant's core. Fi fought the urge to peer after it, then lost and walked a few paces to gaze over the edge. It was a long, long way down. He was thrilled by the sheer scale and variety of it, polished stone, sparkling glass, a blur of vessels in the sky lanes, hazy sunlight. Alien, utterly alien. Skirata blew out a breath and rocked his head slightly as if easing tense neck muscles. General, he said. You and I need to talk. Omega, Delta Transport will be taking you back to barracks. He paused to check his chrono. You just relax until 1500 hours and then you report to the briefing room at HQ Main Admin Building. Yes, Sarge, said Niner and Boss, absolutely synchronized. But Attain wasn't giving up. Fi rather liked that about her, but she could be a pain in the shebs when she persisted. She stepped a little closer to Skirata. I don't like being left in the dark, Sergeant. Then this galaxy is going to be a constant source of disappointment to you, General. For a second Skirata had that edge in his voice that made Fi stiffen. But it softened as soon as it had hit its target. Things change. You can say no to this, and I'm rather hoping you won't, but if you do, then Omega, Delta, and my null boys will do it without you. Attain lapsed into silence. Skirata could motivate a brick if he put his mind to it. She wanted to stick with the squad and everyone knew it. She looked at him as if she was listening to other voices. If Omega can't say no, then neither can I. Good, said Skirata. He peeled back the collar of his jacket and muttered into a tiny comm link. It looked as if General Juzik still had a taste for supplying unusual kit. Standing by. Fi peered back over the dock platform parapet, gripping the safety rail to lean out a little more and get a better look. It was the kind of view the very wealthy paid a fortune to see from their window, but you could get it for free in the Grand Army, as long as you didn't mind getting your head shot off to qualify for the privilege. Skirata leaned against the parapet beside him. I'd like to fast rope down there, Fi said. He'd always enjoyed that in training on Kamino. He preferred endless vistas to cramped spaces, as did many of his brothers. They said it was the legacy of being gestated in glass vats. Ordo claimed he could even remember it. How long have we got here, Sarge? Can we see some of the city? Please? Yeah, I promise you all a night out, didn't I? How long ago? Eight months. Fi remembered. All right. Straight after the spaceport siege, the promise of a drink from Captain Obram for a job well done and then Ordo hauled them straight off for another mission. I'd love to see it once before I dash. He paused. I'd just like to explore a bit. Skirata's brow creased briefly and he put his hand on Fi's back. Don't talk like that, son. You'll see plenty of this, I promise. Now? 
Far below, something that might have been a bird leapt suddenly into the yawning crevasse of buildings and plummeted at high speed with wings folded back until Phi lost sight of it. The platform was at least 5,000 meters high. That'd be a nice change. So you like the new battlefield then? Phi dragged himself away from the apparently limitless view. So we get a spell in a stone frigate? What? Just something I picked up from the lads on board Fearless. So he taught Sergeant Kel some new slang. That was something. A shore-based job. Filing Flim's eye and answering the comm links. Lots of CAF breaks. Try threat resolution. Interdiction. Oh. Welcome to the world of euphemism, Phi. We're going to be fighting in the hardest terrain of all. Right in the middle of billions of cities. Slotting bad guys on Coruscant. Good, said Phi. I hate commuting. Arca Company Barracks, so Brigade HQ, Coruscant Etain trailed Skirata down the long passage that ran from the main doors of the Arca Barak Wing and felt like she was following a Dan. Omega Squad's description had made her think of him as a kindly old uncle, a veteran soldier with a facade of tough talk who had sweated blood to give a generation of boys the benefit of his wisdom. But what she experienced in the Force was very different, just as his appearance was unlike her mental image of him. He was a whirlpool of balanced conflict truly cold black violence shot through with deep red passionate loves and hatreds. It marked him out as a complex man who had built a warrior elite. If she looked at him another way, though, he was very much the dark side everything she had been taught to shun. Yes, he reminded her of Adan, the nasty little carnivores that hunted in packs on Kalura and would take on any prey, small by comparison with his strapping troops, but ferociously, tenaciously aggressive. And he wasn't quite the elderly man the squad had first described either. To twenty-year-old boys, he must have seemed ancient. But he was about 60 standard years just middle-aged and obviously fit except for his tendency to drag his left leg. And he looked armored. He was only wearing a civilian jacket polished tan band of leather with a high black collar and plain brown pants. But he had that same presence that all the commandos had. He was ready for something. Given that he was a head shorter than his squad, had a pronounced limp, and yet still looked like trouble. Atain decided he must have once been a formidable soldier. She realized he still was. In here, ma'am. He could make ma'am sound like girl somehow. He could do the same with general. But as a Jedi, she had no right to feel affronted by lack of deference. She realized that she simply wished he would like her. Just a little chat and then you can find General Juzik and catch up on events. Yes, Skirata gave the orders. He ushered her into a side room that turned out to be a cabin with a table, a chair, and narrow bed with a half-packed carryall sitting on it. There was a neat pile of clothing, military-grade fabric equipment cases with unidentifiable lumpy items in them, and a set of sand gold, battle-scarred Mandalorian armor. The Force told her this was a tidy room filled with the wretched chaos of broken lives, pain, and misery. She wondered if it was entirely his, but she stopped herself from probing further in case he felt it and reacted. He was a dangerously perceptive man. She had no sense at all of any animosity directed at her. That's a fine helmet, she said. It had detailed crimson and gold sigils, and the alloy section that formed the eyepiece T of the visor was jet black. There were telltale scrapes and gouges as if some huge creature had clawed at it. Does Fi still have Hulkin's armor? Skarada nodded. Certainly has. Niner said he could have it, and he keeps it stashed in his locker. Atain thought of Gez Hulkin 
and how she had first mistaken Darman for Kalura's brutal enforcer simply because of that sinister helmet with its T-shaped slit. Phi had the helmet now. And that was because Etain had taken Hokan's head off with her lightsaber, nearly a year and a lifetime ago, when she was still not used to killing. It was red armor with a distinctive gray trim. She recalled that vividly. Mandalorian helmets didn't look half so fearsome now. The shape was familiar. It was even welcome. But she had somehow forgotten that Skirata, and most of the training sergeants who had been recruited to forge boys like Darman into elite commandos, had been Mandalorian mercenaries handpicked by Jango Fett. She wondered if she would have seen Skirata the same way nine months earlier, had he been her enemy on Kalura. Packing or unpacking? Packing. He lifted the fabric bags carefully, and they made a metallic clunk, weapons. We can't operate out of here. Officially we're off duty and on indefinite leave. He laid the armor plates in the bag and layered the clothing between them, then slid in the fabric-cased weapons. It occurred to her that this was probably all he owned, the nomadic mercenary ready to move on to the next war. Are you squeamish, General? I mean ethically squeamish. I'm a Jedi, Sergeant. Well, that answers a lot of questions I didn't ask. Ask me a specific question. Do you know what Black Ops means? Oh, yes. I thought you might. I had no idea you would be coming back with Omega right now. But you spent four months with Zayan Kalura turning the locals into gorillas to fight the Seps, right? And before that you survived when Master Fulier didn't. So I reckon you're pretty handy in a scrap. I know my weaknesses. Skarada paused and looked up from his packing. Best knowledge of all. Just tell me what's at stake, Atain said. Now, there's an interesting request from a Jedi. He put his hand carefully in the side of the carryall and withdrew a small cloth-wrapped package. When he unwrapped it and held it out in his palm, she could see it held small skin bars mounted on fragments of white plastoid alloy. For me, stopping more of these. For the Republic, stopping activity that limits the ability of the Grand Army to deploy. For the Senate, showing the Seps that they can't strike here at will. Take your pick. She knew what the objects were now. She'd seen them on hundreds of chest plates. They were armor tallies, the identification devices all clone soldiers wore. I'll take the first option. She thought of the other Phi, the one who was no longer alive to be boyishly excited like his namesake at the prospect of seeing the Coruscant that lay beyond the barracks. You believe I'll be of some use? In urban operations, a woman is always useful, Jedi or not. Another aid to invisibility old decute like me and females like you. Skirata smiled and rewrapped the armor tallies. Etain reached into her bag and realized that she had even fewer possessions than this nomad. And General Juzik is part of this operation? What about Master Zay? General Zay is not officially aware of this. If we're not operating out of here, then where? Oh, somewhere interesting. Give me a couple of days and then we can relocate. Besides, the boys need some rest. So he wasn't going to tell her. Fine. Delta seem a little. Different from Omega. I take it you have confidence in them? Oh, they're good lads. He fumbled in his jacket pockets and pulled out credit chips, scraps of flimsy, and a nasty-looking metal device crested with a row of short, savage spikes and that appeared to have holes for four fingers. She stared. He placed it on the table. The hormone that makes them hard fighters is the same one that makes them a bit of a handful, too. The contents of Skirata's jacket continued to pile up on the table. A coil of thin wire a 15-centimeter knife with a tapering three-sided blade, a stubby custom blaster, and a length of heavy, sharp-edged chain joined the cache. 
Not that the poor Adike are ever off duty, of course. But when you say the word, they're on the case like that. He snapped his fingers to make the point of immediacy. Yes, she'd seen that. Skirata took off his jacket, revealing surprisingly broad shoulders and an underarm holster holding what looked like a modified verpine shatter gun. He hung the garment over the back of a chair. Etain estimated he was still exceptionally fit in the wiry way of small men and continued to revise her view of him as a man who could only train others to fight. And she had never seen so many instruments devoted to injury and destruction in one man's possession not even a republic commando. She indicated the weapons with a cocked head and waited for a hint of why he was carrying them. Skirata paused, one hand raking his short gray hair. What? He said, looking bemused. The. Kit. He was a walking armory. The weapons. Oh, don't worry. He clearly didn't understand. I don't carry many tools when I'm in civilian areas. Don't want to be too conspicuous. Ordo looks after the rest of it. We'll be properly canonied up when we deploy. Guess what? Got six Verpine sniper rifles. Custom made and EMP hardened. Exquisite. Not really rifles, cause they don't have rifle barrels, but... He grinned suddenly, apparently distracted by a thought, and she had a brief and vivid vision of another man entirely. You haven't met Ordo yet, have you? He's a fine lad. Pride of my heart, really he is. Him and his brothers. Atain was totally disarmed by his candor, which seemed both incongruous and yet in keeping with a man who had gone to such extraordinary lengths to equip his young charges to survive. She knew he was a killer. She knew his people had a long history of killing Jedi, even fighting for the Sith. She knew exactly what he was, but she couldn't help liking him and knowing that he would be very very important to her for the rest of her life. Her certainty was in the Force. And she knew what was coming in the days and months ahead would take her beyond her limits and would bring her no sense of peace or understanding as a Jedi. But the Force would show her what it intended her destiny to be. 7. I think it's significant that the casualty rate among commando squads trained by Mandalorians is lower than those trained by other races. Somehow, Mandalorians imbue their charges with a sense of purpose, self-confidence, an almost obsessive sense of clan of fancy that gives them a genuine survival advantage. Let us be thankful they're on our side this time. General Master Arligan Zay, Director of Special Forces, Officer Commanding So BD, Addressing the Jedi Council So Brigade HQ Coruscant, Briefing Room 8, 1,500 hours, 370 days after Geonosis. I thought we'd have a chat, said Skirata. He turned a chair around and swung his legs astride it, folding his arms on the chair back and resting his chin on them. Just us Mando boys. No Arutai's present. Delta Squad had settled in seats on one side of the briefing room and Omega on the other, with the table between them. Skirata could have sliced through the atmosphere between Otten and Sev with a vibroblade. How could they think he hadn't noticed? He knew how to read every nuance of clone men like a book, even if they weren't the ones he knew intimately. In fact, he could read most species now. So they either thought he was stupid, or they were so at ease in his company that they felt no need to disguise their feelings and the Delta boys like Omega were painfully loyal to their sergeants. They sat around in dark red fatigues, looking disturbingly young without their armor and weapons. You don't see Termukin or Juzik as traitors, do you? Darman said. I was using Aruatai's in the general sense of non-Mandalorian. Oh, Darman was fond of Etain, wasn't he? He'd have to keep an eye on that. What I've got to say is just squad business, not the officers. Skirata dropped his knife from his sleeve and fidgeted with the blade, running his fingertip carefully along the honed edge. 
I hope you're listening to this, Delta. Yes, Sarge. Boss was watching him intently. And you, Sev? Sev glanced at Aten for the merest fraction of a second, but enough to confirm Skirata's hunch. Yes, Sergeant. Okay, number one, any bad blood between me and Vav is our business, not yours. If any of you want to fight about it, I'll personally make you regret it. Save it for the bad guys. The silence was almost solid. Aten stared ahead of him, unblinking. Sev compressed his lips as if choking back protest and flicked a glance at Niner. Darman and Fai simply looked baffled. No, Sev, Skarada said. Niner didn't say a word to me, but I've got eyes in my backside and a very good memory. You do not have a grudge against Aten, do you understand me? If you want to argue the toss about my little altercation with Vav, then you have it out with me. Understood, Sergeant. Good. Prove it. Sorry? You too. Skarata motioned to Aten and Sev with the point of his blade. Get up and shake hands. Neither Aten nor Sev moved for a moment. I said get up and shake hands. Now. Skarata wondered if he'd lost them, but then Aten stood just a heartbeat before Sev did. They leaned across the table that separated them and shook hands as ordered. Now do it again and mean it, Skarada said quietly. You have to be one team now, one big squad, and when I tell you what we're up against you'll understand why. Boss, I expect you to keep your boys in line. Boss leaned forward and shoved Sev in the back. You heard the sergeant. Aden held his hand out again. Sev took it and shrugged. Good, Skarada said. Because we're off the charts now. What we're about to do has no official authorization from the Senate or the generals, so if we screw up, we're on our own. Ah, said Scorch. So Juzik and Termukin don't know about this? Oh yes, they do. Then who's we? You, our young generals, Ordo, Vav, and me. Scorch raised his eyebrows. You're operational again? It was time for a little theater. Yes. Skirata hurled his knife with the exquisite accuracy born of decades of surviving by it. It embedded itself in the wooden paneling behind Sev, half a meter to his right. Bet you can't do that with a vibroblade, son. He can if I pick him up and throw him, said Fi. They all laughed. Skirata wondered if they'd still be laughing in a few minutes. Ordo was due back soon. With any luck, he and Vav would have beaten some information out of Orgel. The Nikto were probably too tough even for Vav to crack in that time. In the end it might not matter. He had his team ready to deploy on Karuskin now his team not the Republic's and they could do things that CSF either wouldn't or couldn't. Obram had his hands tied by laws and procedures, and maybe he even had a mole among his own comrades. But this strike team had no laws at all, it didn't even exist. On triple zero it was. Zero. Skirata hadn't asked say what would happen to them if they got it wrong. They could end up dead all of them. It was an academic detail. Scorch got up, pulled the knife from the wall, and handed it back to Skirata with a grin. Fixer applauded. Remember all that dirty black ops stuff that me and Vav taught you way back? Skirata slid the blade back up his sleeve again. My dad's knife. All I have of him. I took it off his body. Or did you file it with the boring stuff on contingency orders and emergency procedures? I think we recall it, Sarge. Skarada remembered it and didn't want to. It was training that had to be done. It broke his heart, but it was going to be all that stood between those boys and death sooner or later. 
they had to be able to face the unimaginable. And yes, there were even worse things than charging a line of droids with your comrades. There were the things you might have to face alone, in a locked room, with no hope of rescue. Maybe Valve was right. Perhaps trainees needed to be brutalized beyond the point where they were just brave, pushed into a state of existence where they became animals intent only on survival. That was how Vav had nearly killed Aten. It was why Skirata had then gone after Vav and nearly killed him. I'm not proud of what I did to you, Skirata said. You crawled through the nerf guts first, Sarge. It looked like so much fun that we followed you in. Fi roared with laughter and leaned back in his seat. And then you threw up. The sickener, they called it. One more endurance test to make sure they could face conditions that would break and kill lesser men, crawling through a ditch filled with rotting nerf guts. But there were more tests to come. A night out in fest-like temperatures, no sleep for three days, maybe more, scant water, a full 60 kilo pack, and blistering heat, and a lot of pain. Pain, pitiless verbal abuse, and humiliation. A captured commando could expect brutal interrogation. They had to be able to cope without breaking, and it took some imagination to test that to the limit. How far is too far, Cal? Valve was much more detached about handing out all that punishment than Skirata could ever be. It was very hard to hurt your sons, even if it helped them survive the unsurvivable. Well, Skirata said, mortified that Fi could take it in such good spirits. The nerf guts were the fun part. It all goes downhill alter that. Sev seemed quite animated. Do we get to do assassinations? If we do, they never happened. You imagined them. Whoops. My trigger finger just slipped, Sarge. Honest. You catch on fast about the fascinating world of politics in which we now find ourselves, young man. Is it okay if I say politicians are gutless shakar? Scorch asked. Call on what you like, son. You still haven't got a vote. Skirata felt the thud of boots striding down the passage outside. The vibration carried. Their voices didn't. Wars are legal violence. Everything else is just crime. Fortunately, we're Mandalorian, so we're a lot less prissy about that fine distinction. Just point us at the bad guys and say go. That's the awkward bit. What is? Scorch asked. You've got to find them first. Well, we found quite a few so far. Delta laughed like one man, even Sev and Omega joined in. The coded entry system blipped, and the doors slid open. Ordo strode through them, probably aware of the kind of entrance he could make. Delta had never worked with a null arc before. Maybe they thought it would be no different from working with Alpha or any of the other Django-trained arc troopers. Skirata watched with interest. Ordo would certainly break some more ice. Sir! Delta said sharply, all at once. Niner and the rest of Omega just touched their brows casually. Sorry I'm late, Sergeant. Ordo took off his helmet, tucked it under one arm, and handed Skirata a data pad and a rather heavy flimsy-wrapped package about the size of a small blaster case. Not much information, but Vav is still working on the problem. And General Juzik sends his compliments. Thanks, Captain. Skirata glanced at it, and then unwrapped the parcel. But it wasn't a weapon. It was a box of candied wheelie nuts. Juzik was a very thoughtful officer indeed. Skirata broke the seal and got up to place it on the table within the reach of both squads. Fill your boots, lads. Fi had his usual silly grin on his face, the faintest hint that he might be planning to do something at Ordo's expense. Ooh, nice new skirt, said Fi. 
You went to all that trouble just for us? What happened to the old comma? Did it shrink in the wash? He got up and stood a pace or two in front of Ordo, still grinning and clearly expecting some backslapping or some other show of delight at reunion after several months. Excuse me, sergeant, Ordo said calmly, and smacked Phi down on the floor with a none-too-playful body press. Phi yelped. Being hit by someone in armor when you weren't wearing your own hurt. Boss's expression was a study in shock. The Delta boys jerked upright in their seats and stared as if they were debating whether to step in and break it up. Ordo looked like cold death. Even Skirata had times when he wasn't quite sure which way Ordo would jump. Your big mouth is going to get you into a lot of trouble one day. The Ark hissed. Fi, eyes locked on Ordo's, neck tensed, looked ready to fight back. So you better hope I'm there when that happens. Then Ordo burst out laughing and got to his feet in one move. He hauled Fi upright by his arm, slapping his back enthusiastically. The old firm back together again, eh? Good stuff. Boss glanced at Skirata, who smiled enigmatically, or so he hoped. Nulls were either your best friend or your worst imaginable enemy. Fi, luckily, had a devoted friend. He still looked shaken by the nature of the reunion, though. Okay, you can thin out now and we'll resume tomorrow morning with our little generals for a full intel briefing at 0800. Skarada said. Now that we all understand each other. Ordo took a handful of candied nuts and stepped outside with Skarada. The two men stood in the corridor, giving the squads a chance to chat now that Delta had been suitably unnerved. And maybe they thought he couldn't hear them, but Skirata wasn't as hard of hearing as they imagined, years of exposure to deafening fire or not. And it wasn't what he expected to hear. Fear fact, I remember thinking he was just bent over breathless, but he was actually crying and throwing up. And it wasn't the nerf guts. He never liked knocking us around. And he always apologized and made sure we were okay afterward. Top man. That was Niner talking. Jat Bear. The best father. Well, that was a joke. His own kids had formally disowned him and declared him Dar Bear instead no longer a father. It was a very rare and shameful thing for a Mando father to be formally shunned by his sons. But he couldn't have left Kamino, or even told them where he was and that he hadn't completely abandoned them. Not even Ordo knew about the declaration of Darbear. You put your clones first, before your own flesh and blood, didn't you? Are you all right? And I don't regret doing that, not a second of it. I'm fine, Ordai K. Vav must be losing his touch, then. Nothing useful from our friends? There might be nothing to get out of them, of course. But it's not a quick process interrogating experienced suspects without killing them. What about getting one of our Jedi eyes to help out? They're good at persuasion. Possibly too squeamish. Juzik is always anxious to please, though. He's much more use in the field. Brave lad, handy with tech, and a good pilot. But the girl's got an edge to her. Let's see if she'll put pragmatism above principle. Do you dislike them, Calbear? It's not a matter of liking them or not. It's whether they're reliable. Look, Zay will waste you and every last clone in me if he thinks it'll win the war and save civilians. But Juzakiro worships you. And I don't know which of those two extremes is the more dangerous. This is your opportunity to help them become the soldiers you made of us, then. Ouch. Why do I always get the feeling that you were more of a man at four years old than I would ever be? Ordo gave him a playful shove. He was clearly in a good mood today. Let me ask General Termukin to interrogate the prisoners. If she finds that morally unacceptable, then her view of you won't be tainted by it. 
Scarada had to bite his lip. Ordo often shamed him with unexpected compassion and diplomacy. Yeah, I reckon she'll find it easier to do the heroic infantry stuff than get dirty along with us. But leave her to me. Very well, Ordo said. Have you decided where we need to base the operation? I've got a few people who owe me favors. Where would you hide soldiers? Hide hide or conceal hide? Somewhere with a bar. Somewhere you'd get a lot of off-duty traffic. You don't drink. Never seen a clone drink much at all. Scarado was suddenly ambushed again by Ordo's agile brain. For a man who knew little of life beyond warfare, his ability to learn and extrapolate from the smallest scrap of information was breathtaking. And you never get off duty. You said, Calbir, that you might disguise the presence of some hulking big boys in armor by having a lot more of them around. You were going to see Mar Rigian about a smokescreen. Sorry? Remember Mar Rigian? The man who can talk out of all three corners of his mouth at the same time? The man you grabbed by the dash. Cal remembered, all right. Yeah, if I'd known then that I'd need him, I'd have been a little more careful. I think I can propose an idea he might find attractive. Would that involve leaving bruises? I wasn't planning to injure him. Just point out that if troopers were actually allowed leave in considerable numbers, it would reassure the public, too. Eventually we become invisible. Ordo pondered, that telltale little frown creasing his brow. Sometimes his staggering intellect and perfect recall didn't help him process the real world one bit, at least not where Scarato was concerned. Let me try, Carber. I promise I'll be more diplomatic. It was a joke, or Dike. I think you'd probably stand as much chance of charming him as I would right now. Have I ever let you down? It wasn't a rhetorical question. Scarato was mortified. It was all too easy to swagger out of the meeting full of aggressive confidence and forget that Ordomuscular, lethal, the ultimate soldier was vulnerable to the approval of one person alone, him. It was as if Ordo became that literal, trusting child again, the one who had decided that the only person in the galaxy who would ever look out for him and his brothers was a down-on-his-luck mercenary who didn't much like Kaminoans. I didn't mean it literally. Scarada reached up and ruffled his hair just like he'd done when Ordo was a scared little kid, terrified by the lightning on Kamino, except he hadn't had to reach quite so far in those days. You're my pride and joy. You couldn't be smarter or better or braver, any of you. Ordo looked blank for a moment and then managed a smile, but it was the placatory gesture of a child under threat. I know I have gaps in my knowledge. Oh, son. I'm going to change that. For all of you. I know, Calbir. His trust was transparent and absolute. You're our protector and will always serve you. Scarada winced. Faith was devastating if you weren't up to being a god. But I don't regret it. No, not a second of it. Logistics Center, Grand Army of the Republic, Coruscant Command HQ, 370 days after Geonosis. You're now on the authorized personnel list for this center, said the security droid at the doors. Ordo reached past it and tapped a memorized code into the door panel. The sentry was a solid block with four arms, a head shorter than he was. Well done. You're right to challenge me. Sir Dash. Ordo reached into his belt and took out a stylus probe. The droid was fast, but not fast enough to avoid the probe Ordo slipped silently into the command port in its chest. There was a chack-chack-chack of memory drives and motor stalling for a moment, and then the droid seemed placated. You appear to be on the authorized personnel list, it said. You have access to all areas including those restricted to staff officers, 
without on-site security tracking. Excellent, Bordeaux said, walking through the doors into the polished white marble lobby. I'm a very private person. And it was easy to be private when you were in armor. Nobody took much notice of a clone inside the GR complex, not even one wearing an ARC troop or captain's livery. It was simply a matter of looking as if you had every right to be going about your business. And the Null Squad's proper business was anything Cal Scarata deemed it to be. Right now, that meant identifying a method of inserting covert surveillance into logistics, the most likely place for a mole who could relay very precise information on transport and contractor movements to the separatists. Ordo took out his datapad and consulted it frequently as if he were here for a routine visit. Without the possibility of eye contact, none of the civilian staff seemed even to register his presence. The white armor here was usually clone troopers who were physically unfit for frontline service, engineer corps, or ARC troopers carrying out occasional inspections for their generals. After striding into a few offices, startling the droids and getting an occasional glance from civilian technicians, Ordo walked into the operations room at the heart of the logistics wing and struck gold. It was a large circular room with walls that were covered in live holocharts of troop and material movements. It danced with brilliant light and color, a HUD on a grand scale. At the room's heart was a large multi-station desk staffed by two droids, four humans, six Celestins, three Nimbanese, and one clone trooper, minus his helmet. Excellent, Ordo said aloud. The clone trooper jumped to his feet and saluted, even though it was technically a poor example of protocol to do so without his helmet in place. Ordo returned the salute anyway. Problem with your helmet, trooper? It makes the civilians edgy, sir. They prefer to see my eyes. Ordo bristled. He would never defer to civilians' whims. I'm carrying out a routine survey for General Camus. He didn't give the man his designation. Alpha Ox rarely bothered to identify themselves to the lower ranks. He glanced at the civilians. One of the Nimbanese and a human female looked up at him. The pale reptilian nimbinal was interesting as a detail, but the human female was enough to make him stop, stare, and note her as suspicious. She smiled at him. He still had his helmet on, but she smiled at him, and she was shockingly beautiful. Both those facts were worry ing in an administrative department. She looked down at her data console, lost in her work again, and flicked long pale blonde hair over one shoulder. Trooper, Bordo said. He beckoned the man to him. I'd like you to brief me on the operation of this unit. They walked outside the main doors, and Ordo removed his helmet to look a brother in the eye and give him due respect. His gloves tally scanner told him the man was CT-5108-8843, an EOD operative, a bomb disposal expert, the kind of man who disarmed booby traps and UXBs so that other troopers could advance. The kind of man who could do work that even droids could not. The explosives connection wasn't lost on Ordo for one moment. What's your name? The trooper hesitated. C-O-R-R, -R, sir, he said quietly. And what brings you here? C-O-R-R -R paused and then pulled off his gauntlets. He had no hands. They had been replaced by two simple prosthetics, so basic that they didn't have a synth flesh coating, just a bare durasteel mechanism. Ordo didn't even have to ask how he had acquired them. Somehow losing both hands was shocking in a way that losing one was not. Hands defined humanity. There's a part shortage, sir. What with there being so many men injured and needing prosthetics? C.O.R. said apologetically. And these aren't good enough for me to do my job in the front line. As soon as the parts come through, I'll be back, though. Ordo knew what Kyber would have said then, 
and he was moved to do the same, but this wasn't the time or the place. He held back. Do they treat you properly here? C.O.R.R. shrugged. Fine. Actually, sir, the civilians tend not to speak to me that much, except for Supervisor Wenin. She's very kind to me indeed. Ordo could see it coming. Wenin would be the blonde woman, yes? C.O.R.R. nodded, his expression noticeably softened. Bessany Wenin. She doesn't approve of the fighting, sir but she doesn't let it affect her work and she's looking after me very well. Per Navi Trooper How well? We have lunch together and she's taken me to visit the Galactic Museum. Fascinating. Ordo had learned the wisdom of mistrust at a very early age. Glamorous woman, ED expert, logistics hub, he could work it out. Not starting his observation here would have been stupid but there was little to be gained from crashing in yet. How many shifts? Three per daily roster, sir. I might need to ask you to do something for me, Cor. Certainly, sir. But when I do, it will be classified and you're to discuss it with nobody, not even your supervisor. It will be part of a routine fraud audit, that's all, and that's why I need your silence. Did it matter if he told him his name? Only the special forces inner circle knew who he was anyway. My name is... Ordo. Mention that to nobody. Yes, sir. Understood. Ordo wanted to tell him that he understood his loneliness among strangers and his need to be back with his brothers at the front, doing real work. But he could tell him nothing. He ushered him back into the operations room, noted the lovely and apparently genuine smile that Supervisor Wenin gave him, and paused on his way out to break into the automated comm link relay and place a monitoring device. Per core. Ordo patted the sentry droid on the head and strode to his parked speeder. 8. Yes, I know how the Kaminoans did it. They used our genes against us. The ones that make us bond with our brothers, make us loyal, make us respect and obey our fathers, that's what they manipulated to make us more likely to obey orders. They had to remove what made Django a selfish loner, because that makes a bad infantry soldier, and you can tell from the Alpha ARCS that the Kaminoans weren't wrong. But there's one thing I don't know yet and that's how they controlled the aging process. That's the key. They robbed us of a full lifespan. But we will not be defeated by time, Naviodi. Our trooper lieutenant and seven Mariel in an encrypted transmission to N-11, Ordo. Republic Administration, Senate Head of Public Affairs Office, Floor 391, Support Services Center, 370 days after Geonosis Mar Rigian's office was very near the top floor of the administration building and had a view that some senators would have killed for. Ordo wondered how Rigian did his killing metaphorically, anyway because he had the air of a man who would terminate anyone in his way without a second thought. It was a long way down. Ordo tucked his helmet under his arm and admired the steady stream of speeders in the sky lanes below. It's been a while, Rigian said, perfectly pleasant. I never imagined I might be in a position to be any help to you. The subtle threat wasn't lost on Skirata, at least if his blink rate was anything to go by. I appreciated your assistance during the siege. You remember my captain, don't you? Captain Nordo? Sir, can Mr. Rigian offer you anything to drink? A glass of juice would be very welcome, thank you. Skirata was indeed inferior in rank, but it always made Ordo uncomfortable to hear Carver call him sir. We were wondering if you might be able to advise us. Rigian betrayed no discomfort whatsoever at talking to a clone. Happy to help, Captain. He tapped something on his desk. Refreshments, please, jail. Juice and some cakes. He smiled. But what could I advise you upon? 
You seem to have your public image pretty well honed. Smart, efficient, and noble. You can't buy an image like that. We feel that our troops should have a little more comfort in life, and we're aware how much weight your advice carries with key members of the Defense Department," said Ordo. Ah, Rigian's eyes narrowed ever so slightly. Quite right, too. What do you want out of this then? Leave. More of it. Any of it. They don't get leave. Any downtime is spent in barracks or in training. Oh. You didn't know that? No, frankly, I didn't. I never asked. Rigian actually seemed surprised, or at least he was feigning it very well. But that's a command decision. They won't bend easily to public servants like me. Ordo took a glass of brilliant emerald juice handed to him by Rugian's young female assistant, who simply stared, eyes scanning him. Calbir was right. Civilians never saw clone soldiers face to face. It almost threw him off track. In strategic terms, the temporary withdrawal of a few thousand troops from the front line makes very little difference, he said. But I'm sure you know that warfare isn't all about big bangs. There's another front, and that's here. Ordo tapped his temple. Visible troops around Coruscant. Good for public confidence right now, with the constant threat of terror attacks. And good for our men. Rigian toyed with a cake studded with chunks of glistening red and purple fruit. I admit that the Senate would like some positive results on the terror attacks. It's making the administration look helpless. Much as I respect our colleagues in the CSF, they're not making much progress, are they? Skarata cut in. But if they did, it would be very timely, wouldn't it? And I'm sure that you'd be told about it right away. This was the interesting thing about Skarata. He could speak around corners. He was an articulate self-educated man, and that always came as a surprise to outsiders. Juzik fell for the rough diamond act all too often, but Valve wasn't the only Mando with a razor-sharp mind and a fine line in rhetoric. Skirata could switch from Mando hard man to politician without a visible change of gear. Ordo found every conversation in education. I always appreciate information, Rigian said. Especially when I know it'll serve some real purpose. So, Ordo said and drained his glass. The assistant popped in again as if she'd been staking out the office and refilled it. We have two battalions of the 41st Elite back in barracks and an assault ship's crew waiting on a refit. If someone could come up with the idea of an extended leave with the men allowed and encouraged to go off base, I think everyone would benefit. And maybe some credits to spend, because they don't get paid. A nice feel-good story for the media. Rugian's expression flickered briefly from professional neutrality to surprise and then back again. Never even thought of that, you know. So is this going to involve your men? The RCs? Rugian pronounced it ARRCs, like a soldier would. It was internal jargon and not for outsiders. Skirata blinked for a second and then shifted down a gear into Mando Mercenary again, albeit at one in a better mood than usual. They're not RCs. ARC sounds like a droid to the public. My boys are men. So please refer to them as Republic Commandos, not just Commandos, and the other forces as troopers or by their rank. He slurped his CAF enthusiastically. Words like RCs, cannon fodder, Grunts, gropos, squad dies, pongos, meat cans, white jobs, or even shiny boys create the wrong impression. Terminology is everything, I find. Rugian was actually making notes on a sheet of flimsy. He took no offense at all, not visibly anyway. Very useful, he said. Leave this to me. And I'm sure Captain Obram has your comlink code at the very top of his list, 
should there be any good news for you? Scarada smiled and looked as if he meant it. Ordo nursed his glass, leaving a little juice at the bottom to fend off more instant attention from Rigian's assistant. An inevitable fact of life is that some of us are doomed to do the dirty thankless work in the shadows while someone else gets the headlines, Rigian said. Headlines can be overrated, said Scarada. The captain has another meeting to attend, but thank you for your time. It was all very civilized, another coded conversation where the unspeakable had somehow been spoken. And it was all a far cry from the sweaty, anxious hours at the galactic city spaceport a few months before, when Rigian had been no more than a severe irritant and Scarada had taken a rather physical dislike to him. Now the man seemed to have a clear and almost uncanny grasp of exactly what he was being asked to do, and although he must have had questions, he never asked them. It almost made him a soldier. The descent in the turbolift felt like a rapid insert via gunship as they plunged down a hundred levels. Scarada began laughing quietly and pinched the bridge of his nose, eyes shut. I wish I'd realized that Rugian would respond to a simple request. Then I'd never have well you know. If you hadn't captured his attention in such an assertive way at the siege, perhaps he wouldn't have been so accommodating today. That man might even make a useful member of an intelligence bureau one day. He just needed me to show some understanding of his own position. Sometimes I think people want more from me than they actually do. So where does this leave us, Lord I.K.? Ordo counted off on the fingers of his glove. Smokescreen in progress. Team on standby, split into watches. Observation points and potential operational houses collated and identified. Armory and logistics in place. Confirmed link between devices and prisoners. But... All dressed up and nowhere to go. Still a large gap in the intel. What did the droid crack out of the download from Aten? Skirata asked. A lot of data that needs combing by hand when we have other intel to put alongside it. It's just lists of businesses like any transport company would keep. Nothing leaps out. Sometimes I wish we had to deal with weak ways. They'd label things top secret and give us a clue. Why is this proving so hard? Fearfec, Sun, Kamarke and Jane can track a flitnet across the galaxy, and we can't find a gang in our own backyard. I'm sorry, Calbear. I should be able to crack this. I'm letting him down. This is a double line of surveillance. I'm afraid the terror network itself and whoever is providing their recce intelligence and that could be inside our own organization, or in the CSF, and the latter is going to be harder to identify. I'm not blaming you. It's just an expression. And my brothers do know the identities of the Flitnats they're looking for, of course. Only one option left, then. Explore every line and dot and hope for a lucky break while we're doing it to speed things up. Unless Vav gets lucky. Time to break out the emergency Jedi, I think, son. 0800 tomorrow, said Ordo. Still got time to do some more preparation, then. Let's go and see a hut who owes me one. Well, a lot more than one, actually. And let's pick up Sev and Scorch so they can see how it's done. There were things Skirata could do that not even a commando or an arc could, and one of those was to work his contacts. Ordo committed it all to memory. Tonight would be highly educational. Kibba's Hut, Entertainment District, Coruscant, Delta Recce Troop in attendance. Garish green light framed the pulsing orange sign above the entrance. Kibbu opened late. It was already dark and Skirata thought it was high time the bar welcomed new customers. I'm only a simple trained killer, Sev said, but something tells me never to eat in a restaurant with a bad pun over the door. 
You haven't tried the food yet, Skarada said. That'll leave no room for doubt. Or dessert, Scorch said. And did I mention I feel naked? About a dozen times since we left HQ. Get used to it. You can't wear armor all the time. Ordo drew one blaster. Scorch raised his eyebrows. I'm being Loki, Ordo said. Or I'd draw both. I really didn't notice you in that shiny white rig at all, sir. Listen up, lads. Skirata slid one hand into his pocket to feel for a reassuring meter of durasteel chain and held his right arm straight at his side. He hadn't seen the hut in a long time, years before Kamino, and it was bound to be a nasty shock for the old slug. Kibu might be surprised to see me, especially as he still owes me a fee. So no heroics. I can handle him. Skirata gestured for the two commandos to stand back in the open lobby. Look casual and read the menu. And don't throw up. The sprawling maze of rooms passed for a restaurant, bar, and hotel, but only if the coruscant food hygiene inspectors were looking the other way. It was perfect in every way if you wanted not to be bothered. There was a certain anonymity in the rough end of the entertainment district. It was just the kind of place where an awful lot of clone soldiers could pass in and out without drawing comment, at least after the novelty wore off. Skarada leaned on the intercom. Kibu the Hut was at home. He just knew it. It was the skinny Duros suddenly standing in the doorway with a blaster that gave the game away. We're closed, the Duros said. And I'm Cal Skirata. The Duro's gray fist closed on the blaster. And I said we're closed. Ordo swung around the door and leveled his blaster in the Duro's. Flat face. No, I do believe you're open, and we'd like to see tonight's special, please. The Duro's paused long enough to gape, which was probably what saved his life. If he'd lifted the blaster, Ordo would have killed him. Ordo grabbed his wrist anyway and twisted it almost as a side effect of wresting the blaster from his grip, and there was the unmistakable snick of cracking bone. The Duros squealed. I think that means come right in, Skarada said, and made sure he had his blaster in his waistband. Kibu might have shelled out some credits for competent help after all. He wandered into the deserted restaurant and noted that the carpet didn't quite stick to his boots as much as it used to. He wandered behind the bar, as much to check that nobody was lurking there to give him a very unhappy hour as to see if the glasses were clean. Ordo's blaster whirred faintly as he raised it. When Skirata looked up, Sev and Scorch were covering one door each. Good lads. They'd all do fine out in the big bad world. Kyle. Kibu inched out of the kitchens, a waft of exotic spice and burned fat escaping as the hut eased himself into the bar area. So you come for your bounty at last. I thought you would never come. And you have staff and a nice jacket now. Must be doing better business, yes? Colleagues, Skarada said. I'll take hard currency, but if you haven't got that, we can negotiate. Kibble was unattractive even by hut standards. His tongue flicked across his slit of a mouth, and he edged to the bar to slither onto his dais and pour a couple of drinks. Your boys want ale. Kibu indicated a jar of pickled gourd on the bar. Snacks? No thanks. Sev and Scorch were a chorus, eyes fixed on the jar of very dead amphibians. Couldn't manage another thing. Okay, you and I talk then, Kyle. I take it you haven't got ready currency? Not that much. Give me time and dash. Let me make it easy for both of us. Skirata pulled up a stool and sat down to bring himself level with the hut's eyes. I'm a tourist. Can my boys take a look at your rooms? 
If we like what we see, we'll stay for a while. Skirata indicated the turbo lift. Sev and Scorch drew their blasters and disappeared for a recce. Ordo locked the main doors again and paced slowly around the bar, probably committing the layout and every detail to memory. A right little hula recorder, Ordo, another superb advantage of perfect recall. So, you have a project in hand, Kyle? I might have. Does it involve dead people? Not this time. I just need a place where my colleagues and I can relax and not be bothered for a while. Kibba's yellow slit-pupiled eyes followed Ordo around the bar. Skirata could never see yellow eyes now without thinking of Kaminoans. Your colleagues are soldiers. Yes. They like to make the most of their leave. They don't get much. So they do little. Jobs for you, Kibba said. Yes, and none of those jobs need inconvenience you. You won't get any visits from CSF, because my boys behave themselves. You just want peace and quiet for them to do those little jobs for you. You have no idea how much, slug breath. Yes. In exchange, you write off that small sum I owe you? I might. It was 500,000 credits plus interest. He didn't need it now. There was a time when he would have risked his life and that of anyone who got in the way to pick up a fee like that. He'd been a successful dead enforcer for a brief time, but it wasn't proper soldiering. I might also bring some trade your way, because there could be a lot of troopers in town who want to visit somewhere relaxing. You offer me more than I owe you. There is a catch. The catch, Skirata said, feeling the negotiations slipping away from him, is that you'll guarantee no trouble here. And my definition of trouble is quite exacting. No unwanted attention. And no nonsense from your usual low-life clientele. No taking advantage of my soldier boys. As much food as they want fresh and properly cooked, please in clean rooms. They don't drink much but they do tend to like a lot of CAF and sweet beverages. Kibba blinked slowly, still apparently distracted by Ordo, who was taking an interest in the kitchen. Mind if I do a food hygiene inspection? Ordo said, and disappeared into the kitchens without waiting for a reply. Kibba's gaze slid toward the kitchen and then back to Skirata. You ask for a lot for your shiny boys. Skirata closed his hand around the end of the chain in his pocket. The slug needed to learn who had the upper hand in this negotiation. That's because they deserve a lot, you owe me a lot, and if you mess me about you'll have a lot more trouble than you could possibly imagine, Dash. Skirata's build-up to giving Kibu a serious smacking was suddenly interrupted by a stifled shriek from the kitchens. A young Trilek female came rushing out the doors. He realized Ordo must have startled her. It might have been the twin blasters. And only respectable females allowed in the bar, Skarada added. But the Twi'lek looked terrified in a way that said she was used to being that way, and he didn't like that at all. He knew Kibba only too well. She doesn't look like your usual. Kitchen staff. The girl huddled against the far wall staring at Ordo, who merely walked out and holstered his blaster with an exaggerated gesture. He didn't do reassuring very well at the best of times, let alone with women. It was time to teach him more social graces when carrying firearms. The hut gurgled a laugh. Females. You know how they are, Dash. Enough. Skirata pulled his Durasteel chain out in one movement and whipped it around Kibba's neck, twisting it in his fist as he wrenched the quivering bulk toward him. The metal cut into the creature's soft fat, leaving a white margin where the blood could no longer circulate. Listen, Shag, Skirata said, feeling his anger tightening his throat muscles. There was no worse insult for a hut than slave. 
I like tree like females. Honest ones, the sort that don't thieve, or worse. So no mistreating the staff or I might discover what a trade union activist I can be. Just look after any of my boys who pass this way. Iniki? You step out of line and there'll be a new batch of fresh blubber products at the market first thing in the morning. He twisted the chain a little tighter. Jaguar na yoka fatba. No trouble. Kiba's third eyelid flicked across his reptilian eye like a windscreen wiper. Your pretty shiny boys die anyway, sooner or later. That was it. Skirata jerked the hut's head down and brought his knee up in Kiba's face as hard as he could with a wet thwack. He didn't need this thing to remind him of that and mock their sacrifice. Kibbuz spluttered ammonia-scented saliva, moaning. Are we going to get good service at your establishment? Skirata said, ignoring the pain in his kneecap. Or would you prefer to pay me half a million creds plus nine years interest right now? Tagwa Lorda. That's more like it. He loosened his choke hold a little. A bit of customer focus is good for business. Kibba barked visibly. I lose profit. You'll lose a lot more than that if you mess around with me. I've always wanted to see if huts really can regenerate body parts. Skirata tightened the chain again. Kunu Jiraikadir Sha Mando Ade. Don't mess with Mandalorians. It wasn't bad advice. Kibu was no linguist, but Skirata knew tone could convey a great deal even to an animal, and maybe even to a hut. He hoped the lack of circulation in Kibu's neck was translating for him. Tagwa. Sergeant, Kibu said, and let out a long wet gasp as Skirata released the chain. Sev and Scorch emerged from the turbo lift again and gave Skirata the thumbs up. Ideal for a relaxing break, Sarge. Scorch said. Lovely clear views, platform to park a speeder or six, and lots of room to stretch our legs. A whole floor of rooms at the top, in fact. Good defensive visibility, easy access and escape, and the right layout for moving around and storing kit and ordnance. Excellent. If it's good enough for my colleagues, it'll be good enough for me, Scarada said. You want to take a look just to make sure, Ordo? Ordo shook his head, still seeming wary of the Trelec female. I'll go with the majority. So, long stay rates? Skirata asked. As. Disgust, Kibba said. Skirata slid off the stool and wiped the chain clean of Kibba's slime before coiling it and putting it in his pocket again. He was concerned about the Twi'lek, though. Civilians were hardly his prime concern on this operation, but it didn't cost anything to be courteous. He walked over to her. She was still cowering. He squatted down almost instinctively. He saw six scared little boys waiting to be reconditioned. I'm Cal, ma'am, he said. What's your name? She didn't meet his eyes. She had that way of looking off slightly to one side that he thought he'd seen too many times before. Lasima. Well, Lasima, if your boss isn't treating you well, you let me know. And I'll have a word with him. He smiled as best he could. And none of my boys will give you any problems either, okay? Okay, she said shakily. Her leku were moving slightly but Skirata couldn't understand the unspoken language they conveyed. She might just have been twitching out of fear. Okay. Skirata gave her as reassuring a smile as he could manage and move to the doors. We'll be back tomorrow to move some stuff in. Have the top floor ready for us, will you? Nice and clean. And fresh flowers, Scorch said. They ambled back to the speeder and set off for Arca Barracks, settling into an automated skylane and merging into the stream of glittering taillights. Coruscant was lovely at night, just as Fi said. 
Skarada had never thought about it much before. He nudged Sev. Good operational house, then. Taylor made. It'll take us a day to move the kit in discrete amounts, but we can access via the landing platform when it's dark again. Does our host get nervous about storing ordnance? Ordo said. He's a hut, said Skarada. He's stored a lot worse. And what he doesn't know won't keep him awake at night. Scorch seemed impressed. You really were a bit of a bad boy in your past, weren't you, Sarge? What do you mean, past? Sev said. And they laughed. They were perfect special forces troops, very bad boys in their own right, but they had never dealt with the criminal underworld and crime was an inevitable partner of terrorism. It was one reason why Skirata didn't feel one scrap of misgiving about going bandit himself. Fearfeck, he'd impressed them. The Delta boys were emerging from their closed, tight-knit exclusivity and settling into the larger team. That was one problem solved. There was still the operation itself, of course. And keeping an eye on Aten, Vav, and Sev. And introducing Atain to an element of war that wasn't remotely noble. And making sure that everyone came out of it alive. Skirata reached over the back of the seat and gave Sev and Scorch a playful swat, then nudged Ordo beside him. I promise you all a night out, he said. When we get this cleaned up, say he's going to get a really big mess bill from the officers. Club. Maybe we shouldn't wait until then, Scorch said. You never know what's around the corner. No. You didn't. You never did. 9. When the enemy is a droid or a wet with a weapon, then killing them is easy. But in this game you're operating among civvies on your home ground. You could be working right next door to the enemy. They might even be people you know and like. But they're still the enemy, and you'll have to slot them just the same. There's no Mandalorian word for. Hero. And that's just as well, because however many lives you save in Black Ops, you will never, ever be a hero. Deal with it. Sergeant Cal Skirata, teaching counter-terrorist tactics to Republic Commando Companies Alpha through Epsilon, Camino, three years before Geonosis. Arca Company Barracks Parade Ground, 0730 hours, 371 days after Geonosis. The missile skimmed the top of Etain's head and bounced off the force shield she had instinctively thrown up to protect her face. Juzik skidded to a halt in front of her, sweat dripping off the end of his nose, a flattened alloy rod clutched in one hand. There was a smear of blood across his cheek, and she wasn't sure if it was his. Sorry! He looked elated. Look, why don't you sit over there? It's safer. Atain indicated the blood. And why don't you use your force powers? She said. This is a dangerous sport. That's cheating, Juzik said, lobbing the small plastoid sphere back into the knot of commandos. They pounced on the object like a hunting pack and jostled each other ferociously to whack the thing with rods, trying to drive it hard against the barrack wall. Atain had no idea what the game was called, if it had a name at all. Nor did it seem to have any rules. The ball, such as it was, was being hit, kicked, and thrown as the whim took the players. And the teams were Niner, Scorch, Fixer, and Darman against Phi, Aten, Sev, and Boss. Skirata insisted that they played in mixed teams. Several other commandos had paused while crossing the parade ground to watch. The battle was conducted in grim silence except for the clash of rods, gasping breath, and occasional approving shouts of, And they are drowsier. Put your back into it. And, Kandosii. Which, Juzik had explained, had been appropriated colloquially to mean, classy, rather than, noble. They had all become much more ferociously mandos since she had first met them. 
It was a phenomenon that made sense given the specific nature of their duties, but it still left her feeling that they were becoming strangers again. Working so closely with Skarada appeared to have focused their minds on a people who seemed to have the ultimate freedom. Even Darman had fallen happily into it. He was utterly engrossed in the game, shoulder-charging boss out of the way and knocking Juzik flat. There was a shout of, Kandosii! As the ball thudded against the wall, two meters above the ground. Then Skarada emerged from the doorway. Atain didn't have to take any hints from the force as to his state of mind. Armor! He yelled. His voice could fill a parade ground. The commandos froze as one. He did not look amused. I said wear some armor. No injuries. You hear me? He strode across to Juzik with surprising speed for a man with a damaged leg and came to a halt with his face centimeters from the Jedi's. He dropped his voice, but not by much. Sir, I regret to have to tell you that you're a dicky T. Sorry, Sergeant. Juzik was a contrite scrap of bloody robes and sweaty hair. My fault. Won't happen again. No injuries. Not now. Okay, sir? Understood, Sergeant. Skarada nodded and then grinned, ruffling Juzik's hair just as he did his troops. You're definitely Oriatan, Bardike. Just don't get yourself killed. Juzik beamed, clearly delighted. Skirata had not only told him that he was exceptionally tough, but he had used the most affectionate form of his name. Now he was. Little Bardan, and thus one of Skirata's clan. He jogged off after the commandos and disappeared inside the building. Skirata ambled across to Atain and sat down next to her on the bench. He's a gutsy little decut, isn't he? So it wasn't only a term of abuse, then. If there wasn't a war on, I suspect that Master Zay would have had a serious word with him by now. Barden's become very attached. Being a loner might make a warrior, but it won't make a soldier. Where were you educated? Skirata was looking straight ahead rather than at her, and his eyes creased at the corners for a brief moment. On the street, on the battlefield, and by a bunch of very smart little boys. Atain smiled. I wasn't being rude. Just curious. Fair enough. I had to analyze and explain everything I taught my nose for eight years. It wasn't enough for me to show them the right way to fight. They wanted me to rationalize it. They shredded me with questions. Then they'd feed it all back to me in a way I'd never seen it before. Amazing. Do we get to meet them all? Are they all like Ordo? Maybe, Skarada said. They're deployed in various locations. It was his noncommittal answer, don't ask. And they're all of the same caliber, yes. So out of a strike team of twelve, you have eleven tough men, Aten, yes? And me. I can't help feeling I'm not going to be much use. Skirata took out a chunk of something brown and woody and popped it into his mouth. He chewed like a Dan, as if he were gnawing off someone's arm. Adenade, he corrected. Oh, you'll be plenty of use. I suspect you'll have the hardest job of all. Whatever it takes. I know. Sergeant, is this going to become clear at the briefing? It's not a secret. I just want everyone to have the full picture at the same time. Then we ship out and disappear. I hear you've done that before. Kui Valdar. Yes, I've been those who no longer exist before. You get used to it. It has its plus points. He got up and walked toward the barracks, attained following. His limp was far less obvious today. How did you hurt your leg? She asked. I didn't follow orders. 
I ended up with a verpine shatter gun round through my ankle. Sometimes you need to learn the hard way. Never got it fixed? I'll get around to it one day. Come on, breakfast before briefing. Some things sound better on a full stomach. When the briefing started at 0800, Juzik looked freshly scrubbed, but he was developing a fine black eye. He also seemed delighted. Attain envied him his capacity for finding joy in the most unlikely places, just like Darman did. Omega and Delta appeared to have broken up as squads completely. They took their seats, lounging around in their black bodysuits, but they no longer sat in their own tight groups. Aten and Sev still exuded a sense of distance, but Skirata's crash course and being buddies appeared to be working. There was also the small matter of the Wookiee who had walked in. Skirata directed the creature to a bigger chair and locked the doors. It was the one who'd piloted the taxi. Ordo, have you swept the room for bugs? Yes, Sergeant. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is strictly for those in this room. If anyone wants out, now's the time to say. Observe the complete lack of movement, Sarge, Scorch said. Nobody's passing on this one. I didn't think so. From now on, there's no general or sir or sergeant or designation codes, and no Jedi robes. There is no rank. There is no chain of command beyond me. If I'm otherwise engaged or dead, then you answer to Ordo. Got it? The Wookiee threw him two bundles of clothing, and he lobbed one each to Atain and Juzik. She caught hers and stared at it. Plain clothes, kids? You clone lads are just soldiers on leave, and us mongrels are. Well, Atain can pass for my daughter and Bard I.K. is a useful deadbeat I picked up on my travels. A go fair. The Wookiee emitted a long and contented trill. This is Zanaka, by the way. Skirata indicated the Wookiee with a polite flourish. She's our quartermaster and mobility troop. She'll secure supplies and transport for us. You ever worked with Wookiees? The commandos shook their heads, wide-eyed. Well, everything you've heard is true. He gestured to Ordo, and a hollow projection streamed from the Ark's glove onto the wall. It was a chart with arrows and labels on it. So here's what we have so far. 1. We have a point of origin for the explosives. 2. We think we have someone in GR Logistics or Support, or in the CSF, who is either passing information or being careless with it. Now. What we don't have is a link in the chain between the following terror cells, materials to bomb manufacture, bomb manufacture to placement cell, and placement cell to recce and surveillance cell in other words, the ones who tell them where to place the device and when to detonate it. Ordo had his projection arm resting on his chair. And Vav is trying to extract at least one link from the cell Omega lifted. But they might not even know what that link is, Skarada said. It's common to use the equivalent of a dead letter drop to deliver stuff. The prisoners tested positive for explosives, so they might be the manufacturers, but I'd assume the devices are made on Coruscant because it's simpler to ship bulk explosives than complete bombs, given that you can't pretend bombs are for mining use, although either is easy. So our best guess is that they're the procurement cell that buys the raw material. Juzik had his head cocked on one side. I take it that if we don't know this after a day, then Vav is not having much success with his interrogation. May I volunteer to help him? Jedi have some persuasive powers as well as ways of uncovering facts. I know, Skarada said. That's why Atain's going to do it. I need you out and about at the moment. Atain's stomach somersaulted. Is this a test? Juzik was watching her cautiously. He could definitely sense her discomfort. Perhaps he had tried to do the decent thing and save her from the duty. Or perhaps he was so caught up in being one of the boys that he really wanted to have a crack at a prisoner. 
Juzik had his own wary relationship with the dark side, it seemed. Okay, Atain said. You've killed. You've killed hand to hand, and you've killed by unleashing missiles. On Kalura, under deep cover, you stabbed and crushed and cut, and taught the local guerrillas to do the same. And now you worry about manipulating minds? I'll do whatever I can. Good. Skarata said, and moved on as if she had simply volunteered to cook dinner. Now, the data on sliced is just a list of 35,000 companies using the freight service that Valve's guests were apparently hitching a ride with. That means a lot of physical checking we can't do ourselves. So Obrim's running it through his database his personal, special one to see if any of them have form and customs irregularities, shady dealings, or even a speeding ticket. While he does that, we ship out. Juzik, Anaka is going to turn you into the galaxy's scruffiest taxi pilot, and the rest of you can draw your extra kit by which I mean discreet body armor, plainclothes rig, and civilian weapons. Ah, Sarge. Fi, you'll love it. You might even get to wear Hulkin's helmet. Just for you, then, Sarge. Good boy. Okay. We all RV back here at 2100 hours when it's nice and dark. Skirata gestured to Ordo to kill the hollow projection and then beckoned to Atain. General, Ordo with me. He led them into the passage and, instead of taking her into a quiet alcove to discuss matters, simply hurried her down the length of the corridor and out onto the parade ground, where yet another battered speeder with darkened transparent steel windscreens was waiting. Are you starting up a used speeder dealership with Anaka? Jokes always seemed to work for Fi, but Atain found they offered her no comfort at all. They don't draw attention though, I'll admit that. Get in. Time to go to work. Like the clone army, she had become very good at following orders. Ordo took the speeder at a sedate pace into the main skylands and dropped it into a gap in a route heading south. This is where it gets difficult, Attain, Skarada said. In a way, she knew what was coming. Yes. This is harder than taking on a column of battle droids and playing the hero. Skarada was still chewing the rook. She could smell it on his breath, sweet and floral. I won't insult your intelligence. I want you to torture a man. It's the first intelligence break we've had in months, and we need to make the most of it. Men died making sure we got those prisoners. She wasn't sure if it was a test of her loyalty or not. It was certainly something that Skirata knew would be the ultimate line for a Jedi to cross. But Jedi crossed the lines of decency all the time, and it was supposed to be fine as long as you didn't commit violence out of anger or dare to love. She was finding it harder to follow her path than ever before, and yet she was now clearer about her own convictions than she had ever been in her life. She was aware of Ordo, too. He appeared perfectly calm in the pilot's seat, but the eddies and deep dark pools in the force around him spoke of a man who was not at ease with himself or the world. Great peaks of fear and pain and helpless trust and desolation and... And... Sheer overwhelming speed and complexity hit Atain like a spray of cold water. He felt as foreign as a hut or a weak way or a Twi'lek. He was a man in frequent agony. His mind was racing at full throttle, and it felt as if it never stopped. She must have been staring at him. Are you all right, ma'am? He asked, still veneered and calm. I'm fine, she said, swallowing hard. What? What can I possibly do that Wall and Vav can't? Are you ready to hear some unpleasant things? Skarada said. I have to be. He rubbed his forehead slowly. You can train people to resist interrogation. That's a fancy phrase for torture, and I don't like using it. I know, because I've done it, and hardline terrorists get trained much like soldiers do but they don't get trained to resist Jedi. 
and that gives you a psychological advantage as well as a real one. Nikto are supposed to be tough. Humans can be tough, too. He seemed distressed. It was severe enough for her to feel the force around him become that dark vortex again. Cal, who's finding this more unpleasant, you or me? Me. I thought so. It comes back to you at times like this. So who? Trained Omega? She felt the faintest shimmer of distress in Ordo now. Me, said Skarada. Oh. Would you have let anyone else do it if you were me? No. She knew immediately. She didn't even have to think about it. It would have been an act of abandonment, letting someone else do the dirty work to salve your own conscience, with the same outcome. No, I wouldn't. Well... If I can train my boys, then you should have no trouble doing what Vav can't. Tell me what's at stake. For who? The Republic? Cal asked. I think it's marginal, to be honest. In real terms, terrorism doesn't even dent it. Casualties in the thousands, that's all. It's fear of it that does the damage. So why are you in so deep? Who's getting hit hardest? Clone troopers. But thousands of troops are dying in the front line every day. Numerically dash. Yeah, I can't do much about the war. I trained quite a few men to stay alive. But all that's left for me is to do what I can, where I can. Personal war, isn't it? Attain said. You think so? I don't care if the Republic falls or not. I'm a mercenary. Everyone's my potential employer. So where does the anger come from? I know anger, you see. As Jedi we guard against it all the time. You won't like the answer. I don't like a lot of things lately, but I still have to deal with them. Okay. Day by day, I get more bitter when I see Mandalorian men and that's what they are, whether you like it or not used and discarded in a war in which they have no stake. Skirada, sitting right behind Ordo, put his hand gently on the captain's armored shoulder. But not on my watch. Etain had no answer to that. She hadn't articulated it in racial terms and she knew that Mandalorians weren't a race as such. But there hadn't been one day since she had parted from Omega Squad on Kalura nine months ago that she hadn't agonized over the use of soldiers who had no choice, no rights, and no future in the Republic that they gave their lives to defend. It was wrong. There was a point somewhere at which the means did not justify the ends, no matter what the numbers argued like this violent, passionate little man beside her, Atain didn't refuse her role in the war out of principle, because that would have been no more than shutting her eyes to it. Men would still die. And if the Jedi Council could accept the need to let that happen to save the Republic, then she could sink to a level she had never believed possible to save soldiers she knew as people. I'll try not to let you down, she said. You mean me? Said Skarada. And you, she thought. Safe house, brewery zone, Coruscant Quadrant J47, 1000 hours, 371. Days after Geonosis. Skarada had been expecting the safe house to be in another seedy part of the city where unusual activity was part of the landscape. But Inaka had surpassed herself this time. The property was a small apartment in a refurbished quarter known as the brewery. The construction droids were still working on some of the buildings, facing them with tasteful Dura steel wrought work. 
Say he was going to have a fit when he saw the bill for this one land on his desk. I think that's what our brothers might call Kendosii, Bordo said, bringing the speeder up to the landing platform. It had a discreet awning to shield it from view, although Coruscant was so traffic-packed that enemy surveillance from tall buildings Skirata's dread was less of a threat than usual here. Lines of sight were frequently obscured. I'll be back later. Errands to run, Calbear. When the lobby doors closed behind them, the constant throb and hum of Coruscant was completely silenced. Ah. Uh, Top-range soundproofing. Inaka was a very smart Wookiee. Vav's job could be noisy. There was no point upsetting the neighbors in cheaper parts of town that had less efficient soundproofing. And it was the last place Orgel's colleagues would come looking for him. Etain had her arms folded tightly across her chest, her light brown wavy hair scraped back in a braid except for the wiry bits that had escaped and sprung into coils. Even her new civilian clothes already looked as if she had slept in them. She had a veil of freckles and an awkward gait, just a schoolgirl armed with a light saber, nothing more. You up to this, Ad I.K.? Little one, Skirata slipped accidentally into being the reassuring father. But he reserved judgment. Like him, she might just have made a point of looking a lot less trouble than she actually was. If not, walk away now. And if she did, what would he have to do? She already knew dangerous numbers of people and places. No. I'm not backing out now. He thought she might suddenly reveal a powerful charisma or sweetness that would explain why this scrap of skin, bone, and unkempt hair had so riveted Darman. But she was just a kid, a Jedi kid with a lot of responsibility that showed in her young face and old eyes. Skirata pressed on the entry buzzer into the main apartment, and after a moment the doors whispered apart. The strong smell that hit him on the moist air reminded him of walking into a barn full of frightened animals. It was so distinctive that he almost didn't notice the scent of the strill. But Murd was nowhere to be seen. Vav, sitting at the table, looked tired. He still seemed like a professor who wasn't very happy with his class, but the physical effort showed in deeper lines from nose to mouth and the way he was drumming his fingers on the table in front of him. It was his trick for staying awake. The man who had his head resting on the same table in front of him didn't look awake at all. Vav leaned forward and lifted the man's head by his hair, peered into his face, and set him down carefully again. You're the relief watch, then, Jedi? Vav got up and stretched extravagantly, Joints clicking, and indicated the empty chair. All yours. Attain looked surprised. Skirata had expected her to register horror at the blood spatter on the otherwise pristine cream walls, but she just looked at Vav as if she was expecting to see someone else. Where are the other two? Skirata asked. Nikto number one is Mtruli and he's secured in the small bedroom. Vav was perfectly polite. This was just business after all, and even Skirata felt too centered on the task at hand to resume their feud where it had left off. Nikto number two is Jiwaiske, and he's in the study. Your tunic could do with a wash. It's the little horns. You can't punch a Nikto. Had to use something else. Atain sat down in Vav's seat and placed her hands flat on the table, still looking puzzled. Skirata leaned against the wall. Vav wandered into the fresher, water tinkled into a basin. You want to tell me what you know, Atain said soothingly. You want to give me the names of the people you operate with. Orgel twitched. He raised his head from the table with some difficulty and stared into her face for a second. Then he spat in it. 
Etienne jerked back, visibly shocked, and wiped away the pink-stained spittle with one hand. Then she composed herself again. Keep your stinking mind tricks to yourself, Jedi, Orgel hissed. Skirata didn't expect her to break at that point. And she didn't, she simply sat there, although he knew it wasn't blank inactivity. She had been trained from childhood just like the clone army, except the first weapon she seized would be her control of the force and her ability to read it like clamoring comm link signals. Darman had told him. She could tell us apart right away by how we felt and thought, Sarge. Wouldn't that be a handy trick to have? Can I see the Nikto? She asked suddenly. Vav came out of the fresher, wiping his face on a fluffy white towel. Help yourself. He gave Skirata a you-know-best look and unlocked the doors for her. They're securely trust. You know we keep them from talking to each other, don't you? I work that out, Atain said. She disappeared into one room for a minute and then came out and went into the other. When she emerged again, she walked up to Skirata and Vav and lowered her head. I'm pretty sure those Nikto have no information, and no, they don't have it, she said quietly. People have useful information all the time and don't know it, Skirata said. We piece the apparently useless stuff together and come up with connections. What I mean is that they have this distinct sense that they're just afraid of dying, Vav shrugged. So much for Nikto Grit, eh? Every creature avoids death. The difference is that Orgel is afraid of breaking. It feels different to me. It's not animal dread. It's not as deep in the Force. Atain had her fingers meshed in that Jedi way that made her look as if she were wringing her hands. I might as well concentrate on him. He has information he's afraid to reveal. They watched her walk the few meters back to the main room and settle down at the table opposite Orgel again and stare at him. Vav shrugged. Oh well. At least I can have a nap while she's minding the shop. Then I can get back to work with more tangible methods. There was a sharp gasp from Orgel and Vav looked around. Whatever Atain was doing, she wasn't even touching him. Just staring. Cal, those people scare me more than Orgel does, Vav said. I'm just going to get my head down for a couple of hours. Wake me if she gets anywhere or kills him, of course. It was about 10.30 in the morning when people were going about mundane business in the city. It felt like an odd time of day to be conducting an interrogation. Skirata somehow felt they were always carried out in some permanent night. And Atain showed every sign of being up to the task. From time to time, she would lower her head as if to try to get a better view of Orgel's expression while he sat face down at the table, fingers knotted in his pale hair as if he had a blinding headache. Skirata wanted to ask her what she was doing to him, but he was worried it would break her concentration. And she was fixed completely on the task in hand. Her blink rate had slowed so much that she appeared to be frozen, except for the pulse in her throat. Orgel would occasionally pant and squeal, writhing as if he were attempting to crawl into the very surface of the table. Skirata walked away and went to stare at the Nikto for a while. When he came back into the room, Orgel was making little hiccuping sobs. Atain, face level with his, was talking quietly to him. Can you see it, Orgel? Can you see what happens? Skirata watched. Orgel. The man whined exactly like a strill, a thin animal noise. I can't. Fear of being wrong is worse than pain, isn't it? It just eats you and you can't shut it off. Are you right? 
or are you as bad as the republic you hate? Are we really the enemy, or are you? Look at the helpless pawns you kill. So that was what she was doing. Skirata had wondered if she was using her force powers to cause real physical pain. But she had cut to the chase and recreated the stuff that pain did to you anyway. It made you fear for your sanity long before your life. He had to hand it to her. It was non-lethal and not that far beyond the usual mind influence. Maybe she was struggling to find an ethical limit in her own mind. Maybe it was her own nightmare, the worst thing she could conceive. She kept it up for an hour. He had no idea whether she was suggesting terrible images and consequences in his mind, or if she was simply flooding him with adrenaline against his wishes, but whatever it was it was exhausting him and her with it. Eventually Orgel broke down sobbing, and Etain shuddered and looked disoriented as if coming out of a trance. Skirata grabbed Vav's shoulder and shook him awake. Get in there. She's broken him down enough for you to finish the job. Vav looked at his chrono. Not bad. What's up? Don't want to let her face the real consequences? Just do it, will you? Vav swung his legs off the bed and stalked into the main room to usher Atain from the chair and steer her and Skirata toward the doors. Go and have some physak, Jedi. He turned to Orgel, who was staring after Atain with wide-set eyes. She's just stepping out for some refreshment. She'll be back later. Skirata caught Atain's elbow. He wasn't used to grabbing small people. His lads were solid muscle, bigger and stronger than Etain. He felt as if he were clutching a kid's arm. He sat her down on the little bench at the back of the landing platform and took out his calm link to call for transport. No, I'm going back in, said Etain. Only if Fav calls us back. Kel. Only if he really needs you. Okay? They were still waiting for Ordo to collect them when Etain flinched and then looked back at the lobby doors. They opened and Vav wandered out, rubbing his eyes. There was a distinctive tang of ozone clinging to him, like a discharged blaster. Retail zone, quadrant B85, said Vav simply. He held out his data pad with coordinates. But he hasn't given me a date if he knows one. He was supposed to drop the explosives off in the warehouse, and someone would be along to collect it. He never knew who. Skirata sniffed the ozonic scent again and switched to Mandoe, although he was sure Atain had flinched because she had sensed what had happened. Gar are you Kiritut Keish, Dikut, Tayantane Keish Rijahani? You killed him, you moron! What if he was lying? Vav made an irritated sound. And I are you Karadna Niktos. Met Orjil Jihadi. Kesh Karteli me and I yen current Kesh. I killed the Nikto. If Orjil's lying, he knows I'll kill him. Orjil would be dead sooner or later anyway. No prisoners, not on this run. It was amazing how many people overlooked the inevitable while hoping for a way out. Atain said nothing. She almost bolted for the speeder when Ordo settled it down on the platform. Skirata settled beside her. She simply seemed subdued. Result? Ordo said calmly, helmet on the seat beside him, eyes straight ahead. Potential drop-off location, said Skirata. Someone might be expecting to collect a stash of explosives so we'd better have something ready for them to collect. Intel doesn't suggest they've noticed a loss of the consignment yet. Well, if the cells are as isolated for security reasons as we think, then there's nobody to notice for a while, is there? There's the small matter of getting hold of a cache of explosives, but we can make this work for us. I can hear the cogs working, son. Skarada patted Atain's hand. 
And you did fine, Ad I.K. Ordo glanced over his shoulder and then appeared to realize that Skirata meant Atain, not him, this time. There was no gender in Mandalay. It's never easy. She accepted his touch without reaction, and then seized to his hand so tightly that he thought she was going to burst into tears or protest. But she maintained the facade of calm, except for that desperate grip on his hand. He had always been a soft touch for a desperate child's grasp. Sowing doubt is a very corrosive thing when you're dealing with people who believe in causes, said Atain. Skirata decided he'd have no trouble treating her as his daughter. He forgot his real, a strange daughter all too often. He'd enjoyed returning to little Razan's excited welcome, but each time he came home from a war, wherever home happened to be, she was unrecognizably older and less excited to see him, as if she didn't know him at all. But I have sons. That's why I stick to causes nobody can take from me. Skarada said. A Mandalorian's identity and soul depended only on what lived within him. And he relied only on his brother warriors or his sons. 10. Clone troopers are well disciplined. Even the Alpha Batch arc. Troopers surly though they are are predictable, in the sense that Fett gave them precise orders that they continue to obey. But the commando batches are almost as unpredictable as the Nulls, and the Nulls are as good as being Skirata Private Army. That s the problem with having intelligent clones trained by a ragbag of undisciplined thugs they've e turned out at best idiosyncratic, at worst disobedient. But they'll probably win the war for us. Tolerate them. Assessment of Republic Commando Cadre by Director of Special Forces General Arligan Zay explaining discrepancies in stores and armory inventory to General I.R.I. Camus. Kibbu's Hut, Entertainment Sector Strike Team Operational House Early Evening, 371 Days After Geonosis. This is plain unnatural, Boss said. He stood in front of the mirror. I can't help noticing what this body armor doesn't cover. It covers your torso and thighs, and that's where your major blood vessels and organs are. Aden tugged at his tunic. They had all defaulted to Giarishu fatigues, the standard red tunic and pants. Outside the barracks, the casual rig made Fi feel ludicrously naked. That's all you need. See? Doesn't show under fabric. You can live without an arm. Fi said. They can always bolt on a new one. What about my head? Like I said, they can always replace non-essential parts. Boss didn't even look up from the inspection of his tunic. I love this guy. He'll make such great target practice. He had a point. They were fighting without helmets. That was going to be tough. Everyone from Clone Trooper to our captain lived by his bucket. The Baisi was a command and control center in itself. Fi picked up a coil of razor-sharp wire and stretched it out between his hands. Skirata had taught him to use this, a garrote, flicked around the neck if your target had a neck and pulled tight to slice or choke. There were all kinds of interesting devices and techniques that Skirata recommended. Other instructors had their own favorites, according to their commando training batches, but cars were clearly close-range, personal ones. What was it he used to say? You need to be able to fight if you're cornered in just your underpants, son. Nature gave you teeth and fists. Sergeant Cal sounded as if he knew exactly how that felt. He certainly knew his techniques. The main room at the top of the seedy hotel hastily soundproofed with a micro anechoic coating over the walls and windows was filling with jostling bodies. Juzik bounced in, clearly pleased with himself, and laid out a row of small beads and devices on the scratched black duraplast table. Aden wandered over and peered at the hall. Where'd you get all that, Bardan? 
Juzik trapped one of the beads on his fingertip and held it out to Aten. Fai moved in. Whatever it was, he wanted one too. Arc Trooper Oral Standalone Com Link. One each. No need for your biceps or anything too obvious, just stick it in your ear. Plus. The Jedi took out a small transparent sack of what looked like powdered permaglass. Tracking marker. Never seen it before. Brand new from the labs. It's called dust. Microscopic transmitters. Scattered on a battlefield for pretty much invisible monitoring. You never know when you might need it. You liberated all that from stores? Asked Fi. And procurement development. It all ended up in my pockets somehow. Captain Mays is going to go spare. That's okay. Ordo can explain the necessity to him later. He listens to Ordo. Where's Skirata? Sev asked. Maybe they're having trouble cracking the prisoners. Not Vav. Fixer pocketed a calm link bead. Why did he need a tame then? Maybe to show her how it's done. Fi watched Darman bristle. He waited for his brother to say something, but Dar swallowed whatever retort was forming and went on fussing with the fit of the armor plates under his tunic. It wasn't exactly a secret that he had a soft spot for Atane, but nobody teased him about it, either. It was one of those aspects of life that Skirata had taught them about, but that none of them entertained much hope of pursuing. It was easy back on Kamino, where the real world had never intruded not beyond the risk of getting killed in training, of course. But the last nine months' exposure to people outside the tight fraternity had made ordinary life feel much more dangerous than combat itself. Because other people's lives were not ordinary at all. Fi went to the window, now obscured by a fine film of anti-surveillance gauze and watched the promenade of tourists and locals along the walkways facing Kibba's hut. He didn't envy them their day-to-day -day existence. Skirata had told his commando batch just how grim and dreary it could be to earn a living, and how much cleaner it was to have a clear purpose in life. But he hadn't told them how it might feel to watch couples and families of all species. Skirata stuck to the basics. I've been kicked out by so many females that I can't tell you anything useful about relationships, so just avoid them if you can. Again, it struck the class as something he said and didn't mean like the way he called them wet droids and said they were here to fight, not socialize. It just meant it was a painful topic for him to face. He also called them dead men. But they were not dead men any longer. They had learned to be Mandalorian, and that, Cal said, meant they had a soul and a place in the Mando eternity. Fi thought that was probably worth having. The doors opened and all eight commandos spun around to train a motley collection of modified civilian blasters on the opening. Security code or not, you could never be too careful. Skirata entered with Ordo and Atane at his heels. The squads lowered their weapons. Been shopping, Skirata said cheerfully. And he meant it. Fi expected it to be his usual euphemism for acquiring illicit weapons or worse, but it seemed he really had been buying things. He tipped a bag of assorted fruit, candies, ices, nuts, and other delicacies that Fi couldn't identify onto the table next to Juzik's hall. Go on. Fill your boots. Delta hung back. Omega didn't. Then Delta appeared to remember that fill your boots meant eat your fill. Phi peeled bright green wrapping from something that smelled of sour fruits and found it to be frozen and covered in something appetizingly crunchy. But Atain looked tired. Juzik was watching her warily as if something unspoken was going on between them. Jedi could do that kind of thing, just like soldiers on helmet comlinks silent to the outside world. 
Then Etain muttered something about having a hot soak in the fresh earth and disappeared into the next room. We have a drop location, Skarada said. And a few thousand or so clone troopers on leave for a few weeks thanks to our totally unexpected friend Marugian. Mmm, -hmm, crushed nuts, Fi said, identifying the topping on the ice. That was very helpful of him. They all stopped in mid-crunch. Fi noted Juzik wasn't eating, just watching the sergeant with a rapt expression. The young general had a very bad dose of the Skiratas. As diseases went, it was one of the best to catch. So do we get to drop them, or do we have to do the boring thing and let them stroll off? Boss asked. Niner gave him one of his funny looks, the kind that said he thought a bit of quiet contemplation was called for. Niner and Boss didn't see their newly reduced roles in quite the same way. Niner liked to lead by being certain, and Boss seemed to like being first. This is a tracking job, right? Vav made you into very impatient boys, Skarada said. Yes, this is where it gets boring. And you know what? You won't be any less dead if you get it wrong. He picked up some Shura fruits and lobbed one each to the Delta team. And I really hope Vav schooled you well in this, because I'll be pretty hacked off if you get trigger happy and blow this up. Boss looked hurt. Fi didn't think Delta ran to such delicate emotions. We're pros, Sarge. We know how to do this. What did I tell you? Sorry. Cal. It's just that we haven't even seen the enemy yet. Welcome to anti-terror ops, hotshot. They aren't droids. They don't line up and march at you. Didn't you listen to any of my lectures? Well, Dash. They can kill you and not even be on the planet when it happens. But you can track and kill them the same way. This is about patience and attention to detail. Delta's really good at that, so I hear, Fi said. Sev gave him that blank cold stare. It simply provoked Fi all the more. That's why they do their op planning with finger paints. Skirata lobbed a rolled up ball of flimsy at Fi, and it hit him in the ear hard. Okay, Ordo is going to score some credible explosives over the next few days, because that's going to be handy if we need to infiltrate the cells. And we'll start surveillance of the drop point now because we don't have a time window when the explosives were due to be picked up. Four shifts Fi and Sev as Red Watch, relieved by Dar and Boss as Blue Watch, relieved by Niner and Scorch as Green Watch. Fi noted Auden's process of elimination. He looked as if he'd been doused in cold water. Fi suspected he'd wanted to be paired with Sev, and for all the wrong reasons. That leaves you and Fixer as White Watch, so you stay focused. Skirata said, giving Aden a friendly prod in the chest. He'd spotted it, too. But then, Skirata spotted everything. One watch on observation, one on intel collation, and two stood down. What about everyone else? Ordo's going undercover to find our mole, and Bardan and Etain will join the normal shift rotations until we need to break into a new phase. If needed, Vav and Anaka will turn to as well, and give us a hand. Juzik looking convincingly unsavory in ordinary clothing and with his hair unbound checked his snazzy S5 blaster. Yes, Zay would go nuts when he saw the bill for this op. Can we use the force, Cal? Course you can, Bardai K.A. As long as nobody notices. Or as long as you don't leave witnesses anyway. Same goes for lightsabers. No witnesses. Might look a bit obvious. When do we start? Boss asked. Skarada looked at his chrono. Three hours. Time to eat, I think.
Sev elbowed Fi, a little too hard to be friendly but not hard enough to start a fight. So you and me. The brains and the mouth. Don't get me killed. I'm slumming it. I usually work with our captains. Watching normal people leading normal lives. I'd rather charge a droid line. What happened to my certainty? Do the others feel like this? But there's a war on, so sacrifices have to be made. Can you do the dumb trooper act? You mean you're not doing it now? I hope you're as good as you talk, Naviogi. Count on it, Fai said, and noted that Darman had wandered off in the direction of Atain's exit. Sometimes I'm not very funny at all. Atain felt she had held out pretty well, all things considered. It was only when she closed the refresher door that she let herself vomit uncontrollably until tears spilled down her face and into her mouth. She ran water into the basin to cover the sound and choked on her sobs. She'd been so convinced she could handle it. And she couldn't. Ripping into Orgel's soul had been even harder than outright physical violence. She had stolen his conviction from him, which was no great evil until set in the context of the fact that he would, she knew, die very soon without even the comfort of his beliefs, broken and abandoned and alone. Why am I doing this? Because men are dying. When do the ends cease to justify the means? She vomited until she was convulsed by dry heaves. Then she filled the basin with cold water and plunged her head into it. When she straightened up and her vision cleared, she looked into a face she recognized. But it wasn't hers. It was the hard, long face of Wallen Vav. Everything I've been taught is wrong. Vav was all brutality and expedience as clear an example of the dark side for a Jedi as any she could imagine. And yet there was a total absence of conscious malice in him. She should have sensed anger and murderous intent, but Valve was just filled with... Nothing. No, not nothing. He was actually calm and benign. He thought he was doing good work and she saw her supposed Jedi ideal in him motivated not by anger or fear, but by what she thought was right. She now questioned everything she'd been taught. Dark and light are simply the perpetrators. Perception. How can that be right? How can Vav S. passionless expedience be morally superior to Ski Rada's anger and love? Atain had struggled for years with her own anger and resentment. The choices were to be a good Jedi or a failed Jedi, with the assumption sometimes unspoken, sometimes not that failure meant the dark side awaited. But there was a third path, to leave the Order. She wiped her face on the towel and faced a hard realization. She remained a Jedi because she knew no other life. She pitted Orgel not because she had tortured him, but because he had been robbed of the one thing that held him together, his convictions, without which he had no direction. The truth was that she pitted herself devoid of direction and projected it onto her victim by way of denial. The only selfless thing one have ever done that was not centered on my own need to be a good, passionless, detached Jedi was to care about these clone men and ask what we're doing to them. And that was her direction. It was so very clear, but she was still raw and aching within. Revelation didn't heal. She sat on the edge of the tub with her head resting on her knees. Ma'am, what's wrong? It was Darman's voice. It should have been the same as every other clone's, but it wasn't. They all had their distinct nuances in accent, pitch, and tone and he was Dar she could sense Darman across star systems now. She'd wanted to reach out to him in the Force many times, but feared it might distract him from his duty and endanger him, or if he knew it was her and didn't welcome it annoy him. 
After all, he'd had the choice of staying on Kalura with her. And he had opted to stay with his squad. What she felt for him now, the longing that had developed only after they parted, might not be mutual. He called out again. Are you okay? She opened the doors, and Darman peered in. I don't want to be ma'am right now, Dar. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt Dash. Don't go. He moved a couple of steps into the room as if it were booby-trapped. She had been here before. She had been utterly dependent on his military skills when her life was at stake. He had been so focused, so reassuring, so competent. Where she had doubts, he had certainties. So you still don't find it any easier then? said Darman. What? Giving in to anger. You know. Violence. Oh, any Jedi Master would have been proud of me. I did it all without anger. Anger makes it the dark side. Being serene makes it okay. I know it must have been hard. I know how Sergeant Cal reacted when he had to dash. No. I was harming a stranger. No personal dilemma at all. It doesn't make you a bad person. It has to be done. Is that what's upsetting you? That, maybe. And having doubts. She didn't want to be alone with all that in her head. She could have meditated. She had the strength of will and the ancient skills to pass through this turmoil and do what Jedi had done for millennia detached from the moment. But she didn't want to. She wanted to risk living with those terrible feelings. The danger suddenly seemed to lie in denying them, just as she tried unsuccessfully to deny what she felt for Darman. Dar, do you ever have doubts? You always said you were certain of your role. I always felt you were. You really want to know? Yes. I have doubts all the time. What kind? Before we left Kamino, I was so sure what I had to do. Now. The more I see of other people, the more I wonder, why me? How did I end up here, and not like the people I see around me in Coruscant? When we win the war, what will happen to me and my brothers? They weren't stupid. They were highly intelligent, bred for it, in fact, and if you bred people to be intelligent and resourceful and resilient and aggressive, then sooner or later they would notice that their world wasn't fair, and begin to resent it. I asked that too, Attain said. It makes me feel disloyal. It's not disloyal to question things. It's dangerous though, Darman said. For the status quo? Sometimes you can't argue with everything. Like orders. You don't have the full picture of the battle, and the order you ignore might just be the one that should have saved your life. Well, I'm glad you have doubts. And I'm glad I do, too. Darman leaned against the wall, all concern. Do you want something to eat? We're going to risk Kibba's nerf and Glaka sauce. Scorch reckons it's probably armored rat. I'm not sure I can face crowds right now. You might be overestimating the popularity of Kibba's cuisine, he shrugged. I could probably get the cook to stun the thing with my dice and send it up by room service. That was Darman all over. He had a relentlessly positive nature. It was her job to inspire him, but he'd been the one on Kalura who had made her get up and fight time after time. He'd changed her forever. She wondered if he had any idea how much he was still changing her life now. Okay, she said but only if you keep me company. 
Yeah, eating armored rat alone is probably asking for trouble. He grinned suddenly, and she felt illuminated by it. You might need first aid. Niner's voice interrupted from down the passage. Dar, you coming with us or what? Fi and Sev are supposed to be on watch. No, I'll get something sent up. They can head on down with you. We'll do the duty. Darman cocked his head as if to listen for some rebuke. That okay? This time it was Skarada's voice. Two steaks? Please. Not something safe, like eggs. Steaks. We fear nothing. Suddenly Atain felt an urge to laugh. Fi might have been the comedian, but Dar was genuinely uplifting. He wasn't trying to suppress pain. She also found him distractingly handsome, even though he looked identical to his brothers. She adored them as friends, but they were not Darman, and somehow they didn't even look like him. Nobody else ever would be that precious to her, she knew that. Well, what shall we do now? He asked. Not lightsaber training for a start. You really whacked me with that branch. You told me I had to. So you take orders from clones, do you, General? You kept me alive. Ah, uh, you'd have done fine without me. Actually, no, said Atain. Actually, I wouldn't have done fine at all. She looked him in the eye for a few moments, hoping that Darman the man would react to her, but he simply stared back, a bewildered boy again. I'd never been that close to a human female before. Did you know that? I guessed as much? I wasn't even sure if Jedi were. I wonder sometimes, too. I wasn't scared of dying. He put his hands to his head for a moment, and then raked his fingers through his hair, that gesture she'd seen in Skirata. I was afraid because I didn't know what I was feeling and dash. The service droid buzzed to be let in. Fear feck. Darman's shoulders sagged a little. He got up and took the tray from the droid, looking pink-faced and annoyed. He peeled back the lids and inspected the contents as if they were unstable explosives, and she felt the moment was now lost. Is it dead? Atain asked. If it isn't, it's not getting up again any time soon. She chewed a test mouthful thoughtfully. Could be worse. Ration cubes. Oh, that brings back memories. Now you know why we'll eat anything. I remember the bread, too. Ugh. He prodded something in the container with his fork, looking concerned. You did reach out to me in the forest, didn't you? I wasn't imagining that. Yes, I did. Why? Isn't it obvious? How would I know? I'm not sure if I know that much about you. I think you do, Dar. Darman suddenly took exceptional interest in the remains of the stake, which might have been nerf after all. I don't think anyone believed females would matter to us, given our life expectancy. And it wasn't relevant to combat. That was freshly agonizing. Of all the injustices piled on these clones who had never been given choices, that was the worst, the denial of any individual future, of hope itself. If they beat the odds of battle, they were still doomed to lose the war against time. Darman would probably be dead in thirty years, and she wouldn't even be halfway through her life by then. I bet Cal thought it was important. Darman chewed his lip and averted his gaze. She wasn't sure if he was embarrassed or if he simply didn't know what she was really asking. He never mentioned what to do about generals, he said quietly. My master never specifically mentioned soldiers, either. I hear you ignore orders anyway. I was afraid I'd never see you again, Dar. But you're here now, and that's all that matters. She held her hand out to him. 
He hesitated for a moment, and then reached across the table and took it. We could be dead tomorrow, both of us, she said. Or the next day, or next week. That's war. She thought of the other Phi, whose life had ebbed away in her arms. And I don't want to die without telling you that I miss you every day since you left, and that I love you, and that I don't believe what I was taught about attachment any more than you should believe that you were bred only to die for the Republic. This was breaking all the rules. But the war had broken all the rules of peacekeeping Jedi and a civilized Republic anyway. The Force wouldn't be thrown into turmoil if a mediocre Jedi and a clone soldier who had no rights broke just one more. I never stop thinking about you either, said Darman. Not for a moment. So, how long does it take two squads to finish their meals in the bar? Long enough, I think, said Darman. Eleven. I'd rather have little Jedi like Barden and Attain working with us than the likes of Zay. They're sharp, no preconceptions, no agenda and they're more concerned with pulling their weight in the team than all this philosophical Asik about the dark side. Say he might be a seasoned man, but he seems to want respect from me just because he can open jars of CAF with his mind. Cal Skirata, having a quiet drink with Captain Jailer Obram, well away from prying eyes. Retail Sector, Quadrant B85, nine days later, observation vehicle in position overlooking warehouse space. 1,145 hours, 380 days after Geonosis. Juzik was enjoying himself. So, he said, and let the trendy dark visor slide down his nose so he could look over the top. Do I look like a low-life taxi pilot? Pretty convincing, Dotfi said. He wondered if Juzik ever had the sense to be scared. Do I look like a fair? He was pinging, as Skirata called it. Each time a delivery transport or other craft passed through the dead-end canyon of warehouses that lay beneath the retail levels above, Sev checked the registration transponder against CSF's database. He also checked the cargo with the scope sensor scan. Phi was impressed by the ease with which Fixer and Aden had set up the remote link without CSF spotting it. They hadn't even had to call an Ordo to sort it out. Ordo had melted into the city again two days ago, no mean feat for an ARC trooper captain. Fi tried not to wonder where he might be. It was bad enough thinking about Sicko. Okay, that one was routine. Garment delivery. Sev made a low rumble in his throat, almost like an animal. What do we look like from the outside now? At the moment, one Rodian taxi driver reading a holozine while he's parked and waiting. Phi could see out, but nobody could see in or at least they could see something that wasn't actually in the taxi, thanks to the thin film of photoactive microemitters coating the interior. Clever stuff, this gauze. Thank you, Juzik said. It took me a long time to work out how to program moving images into it. Are you bored? Sev said, looking around at Phi. He still seemed wary of directing any of his comments at Jedi, even if all rank had been swept aside. Cos I'm not. And your constant yakking is getting to me somewhat, Naviodi. Juzik cut in. Sorry, Sev. My fault. Sev looked embarrassed for a moment. If you're interested... Fifty-one of the seventy crates I've clocked on this watch show up on the CSF. Database tagged as criminal. Theft is a bigger industry than legit business here. Juzik raised an eyebrow. Isn't that the sort of thing Obram's people might like to know? Isn't it the sort of stuff that would bring the boys in blue crashing in here and blowing our op? Point taken. No offense. Bardan. Delta hadn't worked with Jedi much, at least not the junior ones. 
Fai savored a moment of delight at seeing Sev's stone-cold pretense reduced to embarrassed deference. All Jedi were supposed to be humble, but Juzik actually was. He seemed to see himself as nothing special, just a man with some accidental skills that didn't make him any more important than the next person, only different. So they waited. And that was a lot harder than it looked. Whoa, Sev said. Look at this one. Fai and Juzik followed the angle of Sev's scope. CSF database has this tag as restricted. Could mean it's of interest to us, or could mean organized crime. Juzik's visor had slipped to the end of his nose. Or both. It was a medium-sized delivery transport with dull green livery caked with dust. The identity transponder was evidently fake because when the crate aligned itself with the platform at the doors to Warehouse 58, and the hatches sprang open, there were just a few boxes inside. The warehouse doors eased open far enough to let a repulsor cart edge out, and two droids began loading the small containers onto the repulsor's flatbed. Small but heavy load by the look of it, Fi said. And we've got company. Sev realigned the scope, and the data pad hummed into recording mode. Second transport backing up to it. Another delivery vehicle hovered, edging astern until it was level with the other side of the landing platform. The boxes were transferred to it. They didn't go into the warehouse at all. That's irregular, Seb said. And we don't like irregular, do we? ID transponder says a legit rental vessel. A female human in coveralls white skin, wavy ginger hair to the shoulders, medium build, short stepped out of the green transport onto the platform to be met by a male Faleen who jumped out of the rental. He was young, as far as Fi could tell, with light green skin, and his mundane pilot's rig was a little too long in the leg for him. All details were worth noting. The two turned their backs to the sky lane and appeared to be talking. Well, that's a rare sight, and I bet he's not on the CSF. Database, Sev said, checking the pad. Images flicked across the screen at a blinding speed while the system sought a match from the image the scope had grabbed. After a few moments the screen read, and no match. Foline don't venture off-world very often, and he certainly isn't here to check out the tourist sites. Let's try the woman. Fi watched. There was a match indeed, and one that came up rapidly. Fear effect, Sev said. Her name's Vinajis. And she's a government employee. I'm not going to like this, am I? Not when you hear she works in GR Logistics, no. Chikar, Fi said. She could be on legit business, of course, but then I'm such a trusting soul. Falling mail and GR clerk? Hello? Do I have to draw you a picture? Sev sighed to himself. They certainly put those Falling pheromones to good use. I bet she'd do him any favor he asked. Getting security information out of her would be even easier. The two transports closed their hatches, leaving the woman and the Falling on the platform, and lifted back into the skylane. It looked like any other delivery except that it was a transfer of cargo, which was not usual, and the two waiting on the platform oozed bad guys from every pore and scale. The two targets looked at their data pads just like warehouse staff checking a consignment. Then the Foline turned and began walking up a pedestrian ramp to the retail level, and Vinod just hung around. I'm naturally curious, Seb said. Fi, you up for a discreet trail of those two? Fai's heart was pounding. Training and instinct took over. He was back on Kamino again, stalking an armed target in the simulated urban training terrain in Topoka City. It was just the town that was simulated. The ammunition was real, deadly real. Ready. Bardan, back up behind that pillar, will you? We can't abandon this position until the next watch arrives, Sev. 
Let me call for backup. What if they'd pinged us and it's a decoy? Okay, you let us out on foot and call in Niner and Scorch to relieve you. Then you stand by via the comm link just in case. That's not standard operating procedure. This isn't standard operating terrain neither. Sev almost said Sir Fi heard the beginning of a hiss des. Delta's self-appointed hard man poked his finger hard in his right ear as if he was afraid the bead-sized link would fall out. There goes Jis. Up the ramp, too. Come on, Fi. Move it. They slipped out of the taxi's twin hatches and activated Fi's holochart of the sector to check where the ramp led and where the exits were. They stared at the mesh blue and red lines on the holochart, courtesy of the fire department's database. Fi hoped it was up to date. That takes them straight up to the retail plaza. Fi's immediate thoughts were of civilians, obstructed arcs of fire and his own limited senses being a poor substitute for his Katarn helmet's gadgetry. But I'm more than my armor. Sergeant Kell said so. He edged along the wall, staying out of sight. Can't deploy tracking remotes, not here, not in public. I might do a little shopping myself. Just keep that dumb grunt expression on your face, mongrel boy. It suits you. Sev took out his data pad and switched the screen to reflective mode, turning his back and holding the device a little out to his right. She's just going over the top of the ramp. Yeah, she's peeled off on the first level. She's following Lounge Lizard so far. Come on. Let's go around the bridge route and pick them up here. You have as bad an attitude toward ethnic diversity as you have toward the regular army. Fi said quietly, relaxing his shoulders with every intention of just being a soldier on leave in his dark red fatigues with a blaster on his belt, like any sensible Coruscanti. The next hour was unplanned, unexpected, but not untrained for Fi hoped he'd make it through alive. Coruscant Security Force Staff and Social Club, 1,300 Hours, Private Booth, Senior Officers Bar. Cal Skirata had his peripheral vision and half an ear trained on the general murmur at the bar. He felt bad about applying caution to these men. They had much the same thankless task as his boys. But there was a possibility that the leak was within their ranks. He couldn't let comradeship cloud his judgment. He hoped Obram wasn't offended by the distortion field he'd set up. The little emitter sat discreetly on the table between the glasses like a rolled-up pellet of flimsy, ready to bounce any bugging signals. If it's one of mine, I'll personally put a round through him, Obram said. Skarada didn't doubt it. You could put a fake lure in the system and see who goes for it. But even if it's one of us, then they'd still need data from the GR to complete the loop. It's one thing having the holocam images of military targets and movements. It's another knowing where they'll be to start with. Okay, then. I have to put someone inside GR Logistics. There was only one choice, Ordo. If we find a link to your people, though, I have to cut you loose. I'm sorry. I'm not exactly being kept in the loop on all this anyway, am I? If I told you where my squads were operating, and they happened to get into a bit of trouble that attracted the attention of your people, you might have to call them off. Then everyone would know we had a strike team deployed. I know. I'm just worried that your personnel will attract the attention of some of my overzealous colleagues, and one of us will be sending wreaths to next of kin. My boys don't have next of kin. Only me. Cal. I can't. I just can't. This has to be deniable. He liked Obrim. He was a kindred spirit, a pragmatic man who didn't trust easily. But if something looks like it's going to get out of hand, and I can warn you off, I will. 
Olbrim swirled the dregs of his ale in the glass. Okay. Sure you don't want one of these? I only have one at night to help me sleep. Habit from Camino. Sleep got pretty hard to come by. You'll have to tell me about that one day. I bet they didn't have any crime in Topoka City. Oh, there was crime, all right. The worst kind, if he ever met another Kaminoan, he knew what he'd do. Nothing you could have arrested anyone for, though. When's your boy Fi going to stop by for a drink? We owe him one from the siege. Brave kid. Yeah. He throws himself instinctively on a grenade, and he's a hero. If he fires instinctively and slots a civilian, though, he's a monster. And don't we know it, pal? Happens to us, too. Anyway, Fi's on a routine patrol at the moment. Skirata checked his chrono. Green watch was due to relieve Red in two hours. I'll bring him down here, don't worry. He's probably bored out of his skull at the moment. Anti-terror ops can be tedious. Sitting around, more sitting around, even more sitting around, then scramble, sheer panic, and bang. Yeah, I think that sums it up. Skirata drained his glass of juice. I just hope we get to the bang part in time. Level 4 Retail Plaza, Quadrant B85, Coruscant, 1,310 hours. Red Watch observing targets on foot. They should have called it in and let one of the other teams pick it up. But sometimes you had to run with it. Fi was now on autopilot, reacting to training he hadn't realized he'd absorbed so thoroughly, and Sev was matching him pace for pace. The shopping plaza was a mass of color, random people, and even more bewildering smells and sounds. This was life in the field without a helmet, and Fi didn't like it. Just ahead, Vinajis wandered casually, moving along one diagonal line then another, and then pausing to stare into transparent steel windows full of things Fi had no idea that people bought or wore. Sev glanced at him. He didn't even have to say it. She looks in an awful lot of shop windows. She doesn't follow a straight path. She thinks she knows how to avoid a tale, but she's learned it from the Holovids. Amateur weak link. Bardan. Sev said quietly. The Jedi's voice was a whisper in Fi's ear. I know where you are. Don't worry. Not worried. Sev glanced away from the target and Fi turned around casually toward her, looking past her but keeping her in his peripheral vision. Can't see the falling now. Moving on, Fi said. They let Jis walk on until she was almost lost in the crowd, and then started moving again. A well-planned surveillance operation would have positioned mobile and fixed teams in the area to simply watch and hand off the target to the next team along the route. But they were on their own. And they had never planned to follow a suspect. This is what Cal said we should never do, said Fi. You got a better idea? Reckon she's seen us? If she has, she hasn't reacted. Why would she? If she's what we think she is, then we're just targets to her. The plaza was busy. There was a restaurant on the left-hand side with tables and chairs in the open air. Just sat down. Sev and Fi walked on past her, and if Fi looked like an overwhelmed clone who'd spent his life cloistered in military environments, then he wasn't acting. Even Kibba's hut felt more familiar than this. It wasn't the urban environment. It was the sheer mass of civilians. They had no choice. They walked on farther. Fear effect, Seb said. She'll have doubled back or disappeared by the time we can turn around safely. Fi was looking straight ahead. He could see splashes of dark red between the multicolored shoulders of the dozens of species strolling around the plaza. 
Here comes the 41st, he said. You can always rely on the infantry. A dozen or so brothers were ambling along, gazing around them and being gazed at by shoppers who had clearly never seen clones before. No matter how many times Fi saw that reaction, he always found himself wondering what they found so strange about it, and then had to see his own world as the rest of the galaxy saw it. The 41st were level with them now. Fi smiled fraternally and got a bewildered nod or two in return. They don't recognize me. That felt strange. All his commando brothers knew him. And he could tell infantry from ship's crew by the way they walked. He walked between the men of the 41st with Sev like a marching band merging, and spun around at the back of the group to walk back toward the target. She was still sitting there. But she was looking the other way. She was staring at another group of clone troopers heading toward her from the other direction. I love being a familiar face, Fi said. His anxiety gave way to a sense of heightened awareness, the thrill of the hunt. The woman's spine straightened as if she was going to jump up, but she sat tense for a few seconds until the clones drew level with her and met the group coming from the other direction. They stopped to chat. Fi and Sev melted into the group at the rear. I'm heading around the back of the plaza, said Juzik's voice in their ears. Niner's on station now. I'll give you some aerial recon. Gotcha, Fi said quietly. It's bad personal security to cluster like this. But that didn't matter right then. The woman dithered, trying not to look at the group and failing miserably. Fi, like any clone, was exceptionally attuned to small gestures. Then she got up to walk briskly into the nearest shop. Maybe she owed Django credits. Fi shrugged and noted with a sinking heart that the shop looked to be exclusively for females. The garments on display were truly bizarre. Or we're just not her type. So, smart mouth, you going to follow her in there? I could. What, tell them you're looking for a present for your girlfriend. Don't push your luck. Is there a back way out? Sev stepped into a doorway and shielded Fi while he took a quick look at the holochart and snapped off the image quickly. No, but there's a landing platform for deliveries. Sev dropped to a whisper. Bardan, you with us yet? Juzik's voice was almost a chuckle. Fascinating, he said. I'm waiting at the delivery platform. A taxi is just what she needs right now. Sev and Fi looked at each other. They could hear Juzik, but the taxi wasn't visible even when they stood back and glanced up discreetly at the roofline. Then they heard his voice, utterly level, utterly calm, utterly worrying. Yeah? Yeah, I am, lady. Where'd you want to go? I've got a booking, but... Sev, tell me he isn't doing what I think he is. He's doing it. He's nuts. Sev lowered his voice to a whisper in the comm link. Bardan, if we lift her now, we'll blow this up. Don't overplay it. Okay, lady, but the spaceport isn't my regular run, so that'll be extra. There was the sound of someone getting into the taxi and a woman's voice. Yes, just drop me off at the domestic terminal, please. Fi wondered for a moment if ordinary people had shared thoughts like the one he knew Sev was sharing with him. They'd been trained to think the same way, the soldier's way. Where was Juzik going with this? If he dropped her off like a normal taxi, they'd lose her in the terminal anyway. He couldn't follow her in there and check where she went without blowing his cover. And if he didn't drop her off... Sev was staring past Fi. Lizard on your six, he said quietly. Fi turned very, very slowly and stopped when he caught the falling male in his peripheral vision at the point where the plaza funneled into a spiral ramp down to another level. He was searching. 
So the woman hadn't caught up with him when he expected, and he was looking for her. And that meant she had no comm link, or she'd have used it. Now he's going to be bad news. He's carrying some serious cannon. Look at the line of his jacket. Juzik's voice was a quiet descant to Fai's pulse pounding in his head. Oh, Fearfeck. That's great. Being rerouted again. This is going to cost, lady. Another detour. Bardan, are you doing what I think you're doing? Are you heading back our way? I pay good license money not to have to use automated lanes, said Juzik's voice in their ears. He really didn't sound at all like a nice Jedi temple boy now. And then I still get diverted. What do we pay our taxes for? I'll take that as a yes. The Foline moved off, pausing occasionally to look around and ambled slowly down the ramp. Fi and Sev leaned on the edge of the parapet like any tourist might to take in the view below. Fi dropped his voice. He's calling someone. The Foline had the back of his hand raised to his mouth. Oh, for a helmet comm link. Fi might have been able to pick up the frequency. Is it her? Or backup? And then we pull this in and get Niner and And then we drag another team off station. No, let's see this through. Sev sat down on a bench, looking suitably disoriented. Bardan, where are you? Let me try this shortcut, lady. Hey, who are you calling? You making a complaint about fares already? I bet she's calling Lounge Lizard. Great. Yeah, and now that our driver's got a very dodgy passenger, has he thought what we're going to do with her? Same as we did with Orgel and the Nikto, Sev said, getting up to walk across to the taxi platform at the end of the plaza. They had to get in fast when Juzik appeared and opened that hatch. Fi had visions of the potential grief that would be unleashed if a passenger was screaming her head off when the taxi hatch opened in a very public place. Land at 90 degrees, Bardan. Sev will access via the port hatch and I'll go in the other, and we'll pin her down. Yeah, I think Fi can manage to subdue a civilian, Sev said. Remind me to show you my unfunny side later, Naviodi. Skarada's going to kill us for this dash. Better get it right then, Fi said. Here he comes. Steady, Bardan. Too fast. He's a Jedi. There's no such thing as too fast. The battered taxi, its anti-surveillance gauze now showing a human driver that wasn't Juzik, dropped onto the platform scattering dust and grit. The two commandos ran to their respective sides. Juzik's voice filled their heads now. Hatches in three. Two. One. They threw themselves in. The hatches snapped shut so fast that Fi felt his pant leg snag in the seal, but he was flat on top of a squealing, struggling woman, and then she went quiet because Sev clamped his hand over her mouth. You waiting for a tip? Said Fi. The taxi lifted in a straight vertical and nearly shaved the paintwork off another cab trying to drop off passengers. It was just as well that Anaka had done something creative about the identity transponder. Fi, I don't suppose you brought any restraints. No, but this usually works. Fi freed his right arm and put his blaster to Jis's head. Ma'am, shut up and stop struggling. I have no problem shooting women. No, he didn't. Enemies were enemies. Females were soldiers, too. 
Juzik took the taxi high into what appeared to be a commuter lane and shot off in a complex loop that first took them away from Kibba's and relative safety, and then dropped down between lanes where the layers of traffic overhead gave some protection against visual surveillance. We've been tagged, Juzik said. He shut his eyes, far too long for Fai's comfort. It was the first time he'd seen the Jedi fly with his eyes closed, and the fact that the good ones could do that didn't reassure the simple animal part of him that said it shouldn't be possible. Yes, we're being followed. Fai wanted to ask how he knew but Jiz had no reason to know Juzik was a Jedi, and the less she knew, the easier it would be to process her, as Skirata put it. You can evade them, right? About as well as anyone can. Any idea who they are? None, other than they're very persistent, and if it's CSF, it's an unmarked vessel. You can sense all that information? He opened his eyes again. Yes, because there are only two or three speeders behind us, and I can see them in the mirror. Sev looked at Fi with the unspoken count of one, two, three. Sev released his grip on Jis as Fi clamped his arm tight around her neck, blaster pressed so hard into her temple that the muzzle was ringed with a little patch of white bloodless skin. He could feel her heart pounding through her back against his chest even through the thin sheet of body armor under his tunic. He wondered for a moment if it was his own frantic heartbeat. Sev reached under the rear seat for his DC-17 and took out the grenade attachment. Okay, it lacks finesse, but we're late for lunch. And if they track us, we're finished. Here? In daylight, in traffic? Juzik said. Not yet. Sev tried to aim his D's and snapped on the grenade launcher. Open the rear screen a crack. Can you hold steady? You wanted me to outrun them, Dash. Can't. We've got to drop them. Juzik looked in the rear view. In a sky lane? You haven't got a clear shot and the debris will dash. Me sniper, you pilot. Understand the difference? Juzik's grip on the steering vane tightened. Too many vessels and too much debris. Let's head for somewhere less crowded. Maybe Kalura? Fai said. Hold on tight. Juzik dropped the taxi like a stone and plummeted ten, then fifteen, then twenty levels to the lower sky lanes, slipping in between two transports and then jumping between horizontal lanes. Still there, said Sev. Three vehicles behind. Have they alerted anyone? I can't sense anything. Juzik kept shaking his head as if trying to clear it. They might not want to risk using comlinks. Who the fear feck are they? I don't know. I'm not a mind reader, and if you just shut up because I'm trying to concentrate on flying and listening and dash. His voice trailed off. Just aim. Fi pressed his blaster harder into the woman's head. She flinched and shut her eyes tight. He could feel no emotion whatsoever, just the cold clarity of his life and his comrades against her existence, and it seemed an easy equation. Move and you're dead, ma'am, okay? Move? Even Fi wasn't sure he could make an escape from a speeder moving. They're not ours. Sev said. And they're in pursuit. So they're a target. Fi dug the blaster into the woman's skin. Are they your people, ma'am? I don't know. I don't know. If they are, it's too bad, Sev said. We can't let them track us back. Juzik speeded up. Stand by. Fi noticed that he had his eyes shut again. Fearfeck. Fire! Juzik said, 
and the taxi suddenly flipped up 90 degrees and climbed in an agonizing vertical. Five brace for impact. They had to be dead. But the taxi was still climbing. They were in a vertical shaft, and a ball of blue-white flame roared beneath them. Phi was thrown against Sev, but he locked his arm tight around the woman's neck, and all three of them hit the partly open rear screen as the sound of ricocheting debris faded behind them and the service ducked. The light dimmed fast beneath them and suddenly disappeared as Juzik slammed the taxi into another right angle and they were flying horizontally along the channel again. Target down! Sev shut his eyes. That better not be CSF, Fi said. That's going to be very messy. Suddenly they were bathed in hazy sunlight. Juzik brought them out into passenger traffic and slipped into the automated lanes of private speeders again. What do we look like from the outside now? Sev asked. Juzik wiped his forehead with his palm and looked as breathless and battered as he ever had after performing the DHA Wurda. Fai could have sworn he looked just as elated too. Family of Garchian tourists with a grand driver, the Jedi said. Now let's try to explain this to you-know-who without getting our heads ripped off. He opened his comm link. Returning with a prisoner, Cal. Sev grumbled in his throat. Never use real names. Least of our worries now, Fai said. So Juzik was scared of Skirata too. It was supposed to be a quiet O's job, as he'd put it, observation duty. It had turned into kidnapping and blowing up unidentified vessels. Scared wasn't the right word, though. He'll be disappointed with us. We let him down. Fi, like anyone who came into Skirata's circle, desperately wanted Calbert to be proud of him. It was more effective motivation than fear any day. Remember he even shoves Wookiees around, said Fi. He adjusted his grip on the woman's neck to stop the tingling in his fingers. And they take it. The taxi was silent except for the occasional whimpering gulp from Jis and the rumble of the vessel's hard-pressed drive. Eventually Juzik came to a shuddering halt on the platform at the top level of Kibba's hut. Sev called on his calm link for a hand with the woman, and Aten came running out with Fixer. What have you been playing at? Skarada's going nuts in there. Aten slid into the taxi and put cuffs on Jis. Get out and we'll take her to the safe house. You've got some explaining to do. Safe house for them, maybe? Safe for her? No. But then she had picked the wrong side. She wasn't a helpless victim. So much for whining that we never get to see the enemy. The taxi lifted off, leaving Fi, Sev, and Juzik standing on the platform, exhausted by adrenaline. Thank you for flying Jedi Air. Juzik grinned and shook their hands. Have a nice afternoon. You're all insane, said Sev and stalked off.